Aliens. Book 2. DNA War. A novel by Diane Carey. The damn thing knows how to fly. Throw your coat over it, Rory. I'm no zoologist. Throw your own coat. I was caught in a cyclone with a hellhound. Caught in darkness as if we were wrapped in a red cloak. Mechanical thunder, bumping and falling, the din of conflict, we were having a visitation from the gods of panic. Clark could yell all he wanted. I was diving under the table. When I got there, the magnetologist was already taking up the space. I had to pitch myself backward behind the galley hatch. Normally I'm pretty hard to scare, but I'd never seen anything this horrifying in my whole life. Warning lights cast patches of red and yellow on the stark exposed piping and caseless electrical and magnetic conduits, and turned human faces into tribal masks. Were the strobing lights really supposed to help? The ship was panicking for its life. Everything on this container ship was weird to me, but this moment was the weirdest so far. This blood-curdling scarecrow was strafing us while the crew barked back and forth about losing altitude and crashing into the planet, not the kind of thing you want to hear when you've been asked to come along on a nice quiet ride. The thrusters screamed in our ears, fighting outside forces they were never built to fight. We were almost ready to settle into orbit when this monstrosity broke out and scared the pilot by landing in his hair. He went sideways and so did the ship. The thing with wings twisted in the air over the table and flew straight at me. Instinctively I blocked it with my arms as wide black wings flayed my head and hands. Then it got caught for a hideous moment between me and the metal galley door. In a panic, it throttled me with its wings before flapping up and out over the top of the door. I swear it turned inside out and flew backward, laws of physics be damned. I didn't want that monster anywhere near me. Around us, the ship's boxy body rattled with mechanical effort and physical battering. Every inch of the hull was under strain as we cut through the upper atmosphere. This wasn't supposed to be happening. I can almost fly a paper plane, but even a dope like me knows when the thing I'm riding on is in trouble. Good thing I'm not a genius in avionics. IDVE really be scared. Pocket, open the hangar bay hatch and let this thing fly in there. Clark called to the first mate. Pocket, where are you? He's underneath me, Gaylord, the magnetologist, reported from under the table. Then you get up and open it. I don't want that thing in my hair. Atmosphere in 40 seconds. Emergency ignition. Barry, emergency ignition. Pocket, crawl out of there right now. It's on me. Gaylord, get it off me. The bosun's shriek almost matched the creature's decibel level. I'm not helping you till I get my 600. I won that bet. You tricked me. Where did I get this reputation? Maybe from all the gambling. Not being a member of the crew, I had the luxury of ignoring their frantic dialogue during my attempt to melt into the wall. Being the captain and all, Clark was trying to direct the chaos. Theo, what's the count? He called to the first mate. Full atmosphere skim if we don't fire the planetaries in 13 seconds. Somehow Theo's aristocratic English accent gave an elegance to the panic. Barry, we're going directly to landing mode. Clark called. Blow the relief valves. On the helm station above us, Barry, the pilot, shouted, Keep that thing off me. I can't work. He was four feet above us on the control balcony, which put him right in the flight path of the hyperkinetic attacker. The scramble intensified. Forms ducked past me and scratching over me, and somebody stepped on my hand. I guessed the new jolt of movements meant they'd reached a point where they were more scared of getting sucked into the planet without engine control than they were of the weird eye in the air. Is there no one to shoot that thing? The first mate shouted. Where are the Marines? I can't do this alone. Barry called from the helm. Gaylord. 
get up there and help Barry blow that valve dash Clark's voice was drowned out suddenly by a roar of engine surge. The bursts and spasms of the ship, complicated by the screwball lunatic in the air, made their voices blend together. While the crew argued about monsters and crashing, I found the floor. I crawled along beside the galley table's bench seat, grumbling, I hate things with wings. I heard the hangar bay hatch clang open, but from down here I couldn't see much. I stretched one hand toward the deck box under the far end of the bench, the box with my travel gear inside. To the chip ring of the wild and woolly creature in the air, I forced my fingers into the box and felt around, found my holster, pulled it out, and unclipped it. The high-powered plasma pistol fell into my hand. It was the best money could buy for licensed private enforcement. A badge of honor in its way, folks said. The gel-formed grip fell perfectly into my left hand and was instantly warm, a trademark of the manufacturer, specially made for left-handers. Clark, I announced, I've got my plaws. I can shoot that thing. I forced myself not to shout. Adrenaline would wreck my aim. Don't shoot it, he called back. Holding the pistol in both hands, I rolled over onto my back and tried to follow the ugly duckling in the air. The thing had no flight pattern at all. It flapped out an erratic tracery and kept doubling back on itself. Every few seconds I caught a glimpse of two huge, shiny, ghoulish black eyes, repugnant little white teeth. It took all my training to remember how to aim at a moving object. Mostly instinct, but you know. It's not like I'd ever seen anything quite this ghoulish before, being a city boy. I'd seen other kinds of ghouls. The shadow of the first mate, Theo, crossed between me and the monster gargoyle as he made a dive to throw a blanket over it, but he missed. When the shadow cleared, I shimmied out into the middle of the deck. Oh, please let me shoot it, I begged. Clark's voice cut through the confusion. Don't shoot, Rory. I'm serious. Ah, come on. I hugged the plasma gun to my chest and put my free arm over my hair just in time to duck. The ship kicked and took a sudden surge forward, then sputtered and dropped under us, taking our stomachs with it. I recognized the sensations, riding the rapids. The Vinza was a heavy vessel, old, tested, and steady. Landing usually went like clockwork. Not today. The wingy thingy had screwed us up by scaring the wits out of our pilot before he had a chance to fire the landing engines. Now we were plunging in without steerage power. And we were still being strafed by a banshee. This is pretty damn demoralizing, I grumbled. Sometimes a switch goes off in my head telling me to put an end to whatever's being dished out at me. After the switch flips, if I don't get control, whatever happens after that is my own fault. So I forced myself to get over the shock of seeing what I was seeing, stood up straight, and fixed my eyes on the screaming Mimi in the air. My neck was sore in seconds. I shimmied out of my favorite jacket, custom made in a fudge brown leather and exactly the color of my hair. Okay, so it was custom made for the guy who'd left it at the thrift store where one of my girlfriends found it for pennies on the dollar. So what? I got no pride. I held the jacket in front of me like a bullfighter's cape and kept my eyes fixed on the flapper. Fast little freak. It flew along the lower wall supporting the pilot station, turning so its wings spread floor to rail on the wall. With its body flattened to the wall and its nose raised to show the way, its black eyes peered at me from the top of its skull in a horrifying stare. It knew I had become the one to watch, it knew. Suddenly squeamish, I took a tentative step backward. My spine bumped the edge of the open bay hatch. It felt like someone pushing a weapon into my back and goading me to move forward. The thing was coming. It veered off the corner where the pilot deck wall met the galley wall and tilted its wings just slightly to come straight at me. Around me, Clark and Gaylord, Theo, and Pocket ducked and jumped in their attempt to do their jobs while fearing for their skins. Above us, 
Barry hunched over his helm, hoping not to get snagged by the hair. Clark was a brawny guy, tall enough that his enviable auburn thatch barely cleared the headspace of his own ship. He had a semi-permanent bruise from the one straight just outside his own cabin that beamed him in the forehead every time he came out groggy. Now his height betrayed him as the brushfire beast made a spiral around his head. He lost his cool, flayed fanatically, and somehow shrunk to half his size. Little mugger, he blurted. A stripe of blood appeared on his nose, he'd been raked by a claw. The gargoyle seemed to have the claws pointed at anybody it was flying toward. My head began to swim. The creature was flying fast, but I was moving in slow motion, unable to comply with the erratic flight plan. I was three years old again, trapped in my bedroom in a new house, out of place, unfamiliar, dodging those other creatures circling my room, my bed. For the first time I wasn't sleeping in my mother's room. My first real bed. My first room. Only to find I shared it with a nest of birds. They were only stupid sparrows, but to me, at three, so I still hate things that fly. I held my ground. Would it attack? Claw my face? I raised the jacket up to my nose, held my breath, waited for the strike. The creature's body disappeared below my line of vision, which almost stopped my heart. I felt the furry body brush the jacket. I saw a stretch of black webbing. Summoning power over my disgust, I snapped my arms closed. A substantial ball of muscle writhed against my sleeves. A leathery wing formed itself to the left side of my head tight as a mask. A claw sunk into my scalp. Revulsion streaked from my scalp to my legs. I choked out my unintelligible opinion and held my face away. Against my body the monster twisted and fought, chittering its protest like a tap dancer's shoes. I dropped back against the galley wall behind the bay hatch door, trapped between the wall and the thing. I've got it. Land the ship. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. Gaylord percolated at me as he launched his large body to the ladder to the pilot balcony, where Barry battled the forces of nature. Engines that were normally almost silent now howled so loudly that we all had to shout to be heard. What the hell was I doing here? How did Clark Sparron always manage to get the better of my common sense? I was supposed to have a lot of common sense. Training. Judgment. Where was it when I needed it? Controlling his voice, Clark thundered up the short ladder to the helm balcony. Is the valve blown? Valve's blown. Barry reported. Gaylord, get Barry some electrical support. Theo, run out the wings. Wings, I. Gaylord, full flush in ten seconds, Clark called out. Theo, get those wings out. They're answering. A drumming airy SHHHHHHTK announced the deployment of the retractable wings, fins, and stabilizers. The roaring and shuddering of the ship's body began to level off. Ignition in five seconds. Clark called out. Five, four. From the helm, Barry ducked at a flash of light and squawked, Where's that thing? Steer the ship. Clark ordered. Two. One. Ignition. The vibrations under my feet grew to a steady quick pulse like a snare drummer increasing the marching pace. The mechanical whining eased down to a loud but consistent buzz. Atmospheric engines working, wings out what else could go wrong to ruin our good save? Trapped with my own disgusting problem. I sucked air through gritted teeth and held the creature tightly in my jacket, hoping it wasn't crapping on my shoes or biting through to my skin. Clark snapped out orders, keeping his voice down to the absolute volume needed to communicate without causing any more stress. The ship's terrified whine settled to an almost musical hum. The deck found a nearly level footing, still at a slight tilt, and began to feel like a deck with support under it, air. 
all that was left of our near miss was a faint high-pitched whistle from deep within the engine noise, and in a moment that too was gone. Flashing lights of warning began one by one to wink off. Stable, Theo finally reported. Altitude, 8,050. Shit, we're low. Gaylord gasped. Trimming, Barry huffed out, still shaken. The activity didn't exactly settle down, but became suddenly organized, deliberate as each crewman found his nerves and went after his own job. Altitude 5000, Theo chanted out. 4035. At the same time, Clark ordered, run out the stands and levelers. Hurry up. I felt the creature's body heat through the fabric, only a layer or two away from my own skin. Would it bite through? Was it rabid? Keep holding it, Rory, Clark called. Barry, is that landing vector still good? You still getting beacons or do we have to eyeball it? The pilot's voice was shaky, nerve-wracked. He hunched over his controls. Beacons are still in place. As if he didn't quite believe it, Barry paused and repeated, reading landing coordinates. Jesus, that was close. Cue the piloting computer and autothrusters for centerline adjustment. Let her take herself in. A hundred to one. Pocket called out. Not now, hammerhead. Clark snapped. It seemed to me that autothrust would be an automatic thing, but I'd learned that sometimes even the simplest changes had to be approved by the command officer. Autothrusters green, Barry said, finally calmer. Set your lockdowns at three, two, three, Clark went on procedurally, though from here I could see he was sweating a fountain. LDs, 323, Barry responded. Put the list sensors on auto. Listing sensors on. Secure from manual override. Shutting down MO. Secure plasma reactors and put M on standby. All hands, prepare for landing. Clark, I called. Pardon me. You're doing fine, Rory. You got him right where you want him. I want him in your shorts. If only I'd known what I had trapped against my ribs. All I knew right now was that it had teeth and wings. My two evil geniuses. For a few seconds it went suddenly still, which was almost more frightening than when it was squirming, then the squirming started again and slipped lower. I tilted my elbow downward to catch it, expecting a claw to sink into my leg. Clark artfully ignored me. Reduce speed one quarter. Cue magnetic bearings and couplers. From where he stood on the pilot balcony, he had a full view of the sky and atmosphere we were rushing through at what seemed to be too high speed. The crew didn't seem panicked anymore, so I took their cue and tried to stay calm. It was Croc. My heart hammered the animal pressed against my sternum. I couldn't hide my agitation from it any more than it could hide its quivering tension from me. It wasn't relaxing. Its struggles hadn't calmed. With every breath I took, the creature flinched and pushed outward against my arms in every possible direction. Fire verticals, Clark directed. We were coming in for our landing. This was the worst moment of landing. I'd only experienced it four times in my life and hated it every time. It was the moment between forward thrust and hovering thrust, a complete change in engineering that had to go flawlessly, or the ship could literally fall out of the sky. The ship gave us that sickening dropping sensation again, as if there weren't enough air to hold it up, but it was just an illusion. We broke to a hover as the high-volume thrusters fired, the most powerful engines in the arsenal of aerospace. Their tremendous roar drowned out Clark's staccato orders, but somehow the crew knew what he was saying and one by one delivered the goods to get the massive ship on the ground. It was a fast process, scary fast, not like docking a big ocean vessel, because there were only so much power and fuel to hold the bulky ship in the air. Less hovering, less waste of energy. I sank against the bulkhead, crammed my eyes shut, and clutched my ghastly package 
hoping to live and wishing to die. There was a sharp, loud gush. The ship dropped another five feet out from under me, and I fell to meet it. Then a hard stop. I waited for someone, Clark or Theo, to shout some order. Nothing happened, except the ship landed itself. Solid ground scratched under us. I felt the texture of the surface rumble through the ship and into my feet. Then I realized the final landing process must all be automatic, to keep the thrusters from trying to drive into solid ground or blowing the ship over on its side. Sensors could react a thousand times faster than human hands. We're down, Barry confirmed. He sounded whipped. Beside him up there, Gaylord's round, brown face peeked over the railing. Theo didn't wait around, but spun twice to skin everything around us, then disappeared into the cargo bay, probably to check on damage. He never stayed in one place for long, I'd noticed. A first mate was a jack of all trades, and Theo's face, with its goatee and tight brown eyes, popped up everywhere high and low. He had the air of English aristocracy, but he worked like a yeoman. Pocket had told me Theo even had a title, and somewhere in a state, that his father had been knighted, but his family fortune had dwindled and the estate was being used as a hotel for whatever income it could generate. Everybody had a hard luck story. At least, everybody aboard this ship seemed to. On the deck, on his knees not far from me, Pocket had both hands clawed into the metal barrier grid that supported the pilot station. He peered at me through wayward strands of straw-colored hair that had pulled out of the thick ponytail. Hundred to one, he murmured. Good job, everybody, Clark said with a sigh. Let's not do that anymore for the rest of our lives, eh? The crew rewarded him with grunts and nods. Let's hear it for Rory. Pocket panned it out. Applause broke out with a little weak cheering. Yay, Rory! Gaylord wheezed. Nice going, Theo said, and at the same time, Barry offered, touchdown, man. Yeah, good going, Clark said. You got it. I've got it, I gagged. Now, will somebody please tell me what I've got? Just stay there a second. Somehow this is your fault. Let's do the housekeeping, he went on to his crew. Where's Theo? Wasn't he here? He went into the bay. I choked. Okay, everybody, do your lockdowns and secure for motive power. Check the throttle bearings and flatline the cob coils. Tell Theo to downflow the inhibitors and assign somebody to check for crazing. I don't want any hairline breaks causing stresses when we launch. Have Gary and Mark look at the zinc discs and the loading transmission. Tell Kip to secure the galley. Gaylord, do a complete magnetological diagnostic on all systems. Barry, reset the relief valves, and Pocket, check the cargo for damage and deployability. Get somebody to lube the king posts, safety winches, and lifting gear. I'll give you till 1330 to get me reports of stability and readiness. And somebody go see how badly we shook up the Marines. Hope we didn't scare him, Pocket commented as he got to his feet. For the first time in several minutes, Clark's eyes fell on me. Pretty soon they were all looking at me and my package. Here I was, sucking air in little gulps, lips curling, both legs braced, knees bent, and my spine pressed against the hatch. I held perfectly still with my arms clamped and knees tight around the squirming package inside my coat. From my left periphery, the ship's medical intern slipped toward me. She was a short, round girl with shoulder-length blonde hair and manly features, but enormous sweet blue eyes. She always seemed to be interested in talking to me during the awake parts of the trip. Something you need to tell us, Bonnie? I asked through my teeth. She raised her hands, but didn't touch me or my jacket yet. Don't smother her, okay? Let her have some air. What is digging its way through my undershirt on its way to my chest hair? She turned pink in the face. Can I just take her? Her? 
she gathered the squirming bundle out of my arms and coiled her own arms around it. Thanks, she murmured. See ya. Bonnie. Clark snapped. Bye. She tried to push behind me toward the hatch with her bundle. Clark dropped down the short ladder and only had to make a half turn to end up blocking her way. Is that yours? Well, why do you have a steroidal mouse aboard this ship? The girl hid behind a hank of blonde hair that had fallen in her face. You always encourage us to bring creature comforts with us. Not actual creatures, you idiot. Is this where my papayas have been disappearing to? Bonnie shifted from foot to foot. Um, we ran out of apples. You know, you didn't have to panic. She was just looking for a place to land. She's hand raised by humans, and if somebody had just stuck your arm straight out like this, she'd have just landed on you perfectly. Not on me, I grumbled. We flinched as the creature jolted in Bonnie's arms and its head popped out of the folds of my jacket. A triangular head, big black eyes and a little nose, ruffled fur and little tiny black hands trying to pull it out of the jacket. Damned if it didn't look like a Pomeranian. Keeping my newly claimed distance, I asked, what is that? Haven't you ever seen a flying fox? She asked. That's no fox. Isn't it obviously a? Eh? Clark growled, a flipping giant bat. He suddenly noticed that everybody was standing around us, peering at the critter, and nobody was jumping to do all those lockups and coil things and up-downs. Hey, is this a show, he said. Get cracking. Like ripples in a pond, they dispersed. Bonnie would have gone too, except Clark blocked her way intentionally. A bat. I found my feet and put a step between me and Bonnie's bundle. What's it doing out in space with us? Good question. Clark zeroed in on Bonnie. Well? She blushed. Well, who could I get to take him while I'm in space for so long? Isn't it pretty good that he never gets out of my cabin? He never gets out, he mocked. Where'd you get that thing? Remember that cute guy who hitched from the Doyle Gray system on the last voyage? I fused his broken wrist. That greasy-haired punk who liked you. He has a lot of exotic animals, you know, that he rescued from stupid people who think they make good pets. He had this baby flying fox, and it was too young and all, and what was I supposed to do? Are you telling me you're this bat's mama? She's kinda cute, isn't she? Girl, blow this thing out the airlock. You don't really want to kill her. Did she really do anything so wrong? Does she take up that much space? Give or take the five-foot wingspan, I commented. For Fihi, Bonnie started to cry and in seconds was sobbing inconsolably. She was such a studious and competent medic, hardly making a peep most of the time, that it seemed odd to find out she was really a girl. She hugged her bat, which put its little curiously human black hand on her cheek as if to comfort her. It's not a chihuahua, Clark told her. Girl, do you have to be such a turkey? Was that creepy thing in the cryotube with you? She nodded. The fox bat squirmed again and this time flopped out an entire wing a long segmented black leathery membrane that hugged my jacket's folds as Bonnie tried to keep control. I noticed her big blue eyes, Bonnie's, not the bats ranging to meet mine whenever she wasn't obliged to be looking at her captains. Do you want your coat back? She offered tentatively, and started to pick at her bundle. I protested, uh, maybe you should just keep it. Don't worry. Butterball doesn't have fleas or anything. Fleas. My stomach churned as she disengaged the fox bat from my jacket, claw by claw and fold by fold. No, no, she's been completely decontaminated, just like everything aboard. I did it myself. You'd have to. Butterball? Gaylord and Pocket appeared on either side of Clark to have a look at the monster we'd just conquered. With Gaylord hiding behind him, Pocket screwed up his face. 
What's this? How'd it get into the salon? Bonnie shot back. I asked you not to go in my cabin, pocket. You didn't inform me your cabin was Pandora's box. We log the magnetic coil readouts before we can land. They're in your cabin. Gaylord piped up with, I had a stroke when this came flying out. She spun the glare at him. Next time, stay out. I guess you guys should ask first before you go in the infirmary, Clark supported. Who's gonna check the feeds? Gaylord asked. Clark shrugged. I'll check him. You're the captain. Pocket protested. If you do our jobs, who's gonna do your job? Rory here'll do it. Yeah. Rory. Right. Annoyed and exhausted, Pocket slipped through the main hatch to get back to doing what should have been the work of a normal landing sequence. Gaylord punished Bonnie with one more disturbed glare before he too stepped out into the main bay. I barely managed to keep my pistol down as Bonnie dropped my jacket and the fox-faced bat flipped over to hang from her arm as if she were a tree branch. It seemed content to hang from Bonnie's wrist with its bony hind claws firmly gripping the neoprene of her service tunic's protective sleeves. In the air it had spread its wings wider than the mess table was long. Now it coiled those wings around its body, just like the vampires in the stories, and stared at me and Clark with its doggy eyes. Clark glowered at it, then again at Bonnie. Take it away. Put it away. Lock it up. I don't want to see it again. From now on and for the rest of its life, you find some wicked witch to baby, sit that thing. I promise, Bonnie said. She raised her arm, straining from the knot, inconsiderable weight of the bat. She's friendly. She's not wild at all. See? She offered me a chance to, what, pet the thing? I shrank back. I hate things that fly. What? Like bluebirds and butterflies? If they fly and they bite, I hate them. But she's cute just hanging here, isn't she? Admit it. Yeah, she's adorable, Clark interrupted. I don't want to see one drop of guano on the ship, you got that? Without another word, Bonnie ducked through the aft hatch, heading toward the area where our bunks were laid out in little one-person compartments. Clark drew a long breath and took a moment to check his palm, link unit to the ship's systems. Things must be okay now despite the close call, because he squinted, nodded, and pocketed the device in his vest pocket. Then he looked at me, burying a hint of embarrassment. I slumped back to sit on the edge of the mess table. Long, quiet break in space, you said. Milk run, you said. Clam up, I said. He stepped past me to a comptech panel, one of many throughout the ship that allowed for almost total instant access to the ship's systems. He told me once before that, if necessary, one person could run the whole ship. Not maintain it, but run it for a while. He spoke into the panel. Official log access, code X1. Specialty spacefaring container vessel Venza, Plancom contract 774. Planet Rosamond 6 achieved, July 14th, 1300 hours, 10 minutes, ah, 4 seconds. Safe landing on predetermined coordinates, no incidents. Clark Sparron, Master, Authorization SP-405. Log, secure, and send. Log secure, the computer responded. Sending voyage report now. Reporting to Nebula Habitation Division, Plancom, Incorporated, Cincinnati, Ohio. Thank you and have a pleasant watch. Thanks. Clark punched a pattern on the control panel, then said, Theo, put up all the scanners and scout the landscape. We'll have a look around before we go out. On it, Theo answered from somewhere in the ship. I love getting to this moment, Clark commented. Didn't expect it to be so weird, though. No incidents, I echoed. Quit repeating what I say. 
That was the most hideous thing I've ever seen, and I'm old. You're 28, Moses. Old enough to know what I want and young enough to get it. I wiped the sweat off my cheek. At least, I hoped it was just sweat. Why wouldn't you let me shoot it? Because we don't need a hole in the ship. You were aiming at an outer wall. Now that he said it, I felt stupid for not thinking of that. Clark heaved a clearing sigh and shrugged off the morning's unsavory action. Nice way to start the day. Atmosphere scratch and a wild bat chase, all before breakfast. We get a pass for the rest of the month. Everything easy from now on. I eyed him in a way we both recognized. You don't know my mother. This isn't Maid Marian we're talking about. He waved a hand. Like it or not, tomorrow we'll be on our way back to Earth, with your mom and all her people tucked safely away in our ride-alongs. Give her a hobby. Put the bat in with her. Come with me. He led the way through the bay hatch into the ship's wide mouth hangar bay. The bay, I'd been told on my orientation tour, was an open area built to carry shipping containers of almost any configuration. The ship was thick bodied, massive, and utilitarian, with length almost proportional to its height. Folding bulkheads could be arranged to accommodate different kinds of cargo. I'd seen it done, and what a sight it was to watch a bay the size of a football field suddenly reconfigure itself at the push of a button. There was no artistry in the bay, as in some passenger parts of the ship that indulged the aesthetics. Nothing here appealed to the eye, except to the trained industrial eye which might appreciate it. I think the crew appreciated it plenty. Everything was black, gray, and white, metallic colors, except for brightly painted rotating gantry cranes which were encoded red, yellow, green, blue, or purple for quick identification. Those looked like a kid's swing set. During the two months before cryo, I'd mostly followed Pocket around the ship and helped him, just to keep busy and not give anybody the idea that I was just watching. At first I'd followed Clark around while he did his captain stuff, but I always felt like an odd sock. When I followed Pocket, there were things I could do. I'm a great stooge. Bosons always needed stooges. I could hold the ends of things, flip switches, ratchet something up, drive something, carry the other end, open hatches and close boxes, run and get things, and watch in admiration. Pocket and I seemed to be mutually useful, he was a loner who didn't like to ask for help but was glad to have it. We didn't chit-chat, yet we communicated great. I had a knack for anticipating what he needed, and I knew when to stand by. When other crewmen came past us, doing their crewy work or driving the body-hugging loaders, I would be working too, either actually doing, holding, or ratcheting, or I would be standing by four pocket. What the hell, half of success is identity, right? Wishing I could be with pocket instead, I followed Clark along the centerline bulkhead, a wall that ran the whole length of the bay. Around us the crew climbed, crawled and rappelled around the stacked cargo containers. Clark hurried through without a glance at his crew. Perhaps that was a practiced habit, to keep them concentrating on their work and not on his watching them do their work. We hurried along in the man-made pathway between stacked yellow containers, each as big as a garage and marked with the Plancom logo, the silhouette of a cowboy on his Mustang, lassoing a planet. I almost had to jog to keep up with him. He was serious about keeping to that tight schedule. His boots made a deliberate scup 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 sound on the deck coated with recycled hard rubber, all the way to the engine room, where he finally stopped. The engine room housed the magnetic field propulsion units and the plasma reaction chambers. I only remembered that because the door said, mag field prop, PR chamber crew only and I had to walk past it to get to the aft head. I wasn't crew, so I never went in there. Never? Sounded like I'd been aboard a year. Actually, I'd spent a whole two months awake and fifteen months asleep. Clark gazed up at the massive containers. These boxes make me nervous just walking by. 
the idea of malfunctions and all. Nobody's perfect and no automated system is foolproof. If the containment security system went bad, we'd all be eradicated in about 80 seconds. Plumbing for reassurance, I commented, well, sometimes you just have to put your life in somebody else's hands, right? He didn't respond. He drew a breath and sighed it out, then stepped to the nearest giant green container, gazed the 14 feet up to the top, then back to the high security lock patch. First, both his thumbs were required for a print scan. At first the small screen showed a red light of activation and warning. Any further tampering could result in a sharp electrical stun if the patch didn't recognize the person doing the decoding of its program. I sidled back, hoping I was out of range, but not far enough to let him know I was nervous. At least he'd had the guts to admit he was scared. Kinda made me ashamed. The red light turned orange, with a green chevron in the middle. Clark leaned forward and presented his left eye for a retinal identification. The light turned yellow. The green chevron remained. Clark pulled out the MRI remote and pressed it to his left temple. A brain scan completed the security code. The yellow lights went away and the green chevron began to flash, overlaid with the word caution. Caution, caution, caution. The giant loading door panels on the container began to repeal themselves, panel by panel, starting in the middle. The container was opening. Now nothing stood between the two of us and the nightmare inside. I took another step back. 2. The massive door panels clunked one under the other, like curtain blinds moving slowly apart to reveal the sunrise. I bumped backward against the container behind me and spread my arms. God almighty. There was no sunrise inside the giant container. Nothing so encouraging. We stood together, Clark a little taller and bulkier than myself, yet we were both suddenly very small. My chest tightened, my heart thudding as I looked up at a gleaming phalanx of robots. Like the Confederate line at Seminary Ridge, the mechanized regiment bristled with spines and explosive-tipped barbs, thousand-eyed sensors and all the things any human kid recognizes as do not touch. Each of dozens just in this box alone was shaped like a bullet cartridge with a round helmet. The helmet was embedded with spines, barbs, and feelers. There was no front, back, or sides, and each had six folded legs, usable in any combination. They could move in any direction. And they fired those poison-filled darts by sensors. The darts were supersonic. Once targeted, there was no getting out of the way. I'd seen smaller versions for urban warfare, but nothing this bulky and overarmed. Even standing there in repose, the machines broadcast aggression. They were scary as hell. They're something, aren't they? Clark scanned the dangerous rank. The lights of the cargo bay reflected from the gleaming bodies of the robot soldiers, fell back upon his all-too-human face and changed his eyes to metallic discs. Every one of them could kill a small town. They're loaded with sensors programmed to seek out any life form whose DNA doesn't match the planet. Those barbs are actually percussion hypodermics. Their bodies are canisters loaded with poison deadly to anything that's not native here. All you have to do is get too close and jab. If I don't do this right, we'll kill ourselves and all those geeks out there. The poison packers only have two targets, the aliens that have hijacked this planet, and us. Everything else on the planet will be spared. I dredged up my voice. How, how many? Lost it again. Clark also was subdued. There are five hundred in every container, and I've got ninety containers. His voice was laden with awe and responsibility. This was the most important thing Clark had ever done, or would ever do in his life, and it showed in his expression. His features, normally smooth, rosy, and carefree, were lined, hardened, and gray. We stood together in a profound hush. 
my whole body snapped when something moved beside me. The first mate, Theo, had come up on me from the side. The kind of person who doesn't miss much and spends his life chasing details while understanding big pictures, Theo stared up at the poison packers. Damn us all, he murmured. So that's what they look like. Only then did I realize they hadn't surveyed their cargo before this. Probably the containers had been delivered fully loaded and secure from the security company contracted by Plancom. Made sense what if there were some kind of mistake? Something as simple as a bat loose on the planet had almost caused a crash. Had imaginings of deadly errors chiseled away at the crew's consciences? Or were they just doing a job? I didn't really know them well enough to say. I knew Clark would have found some way to justify the progress, to take this super technology and put it to use he saw as good. Bonnie might worry about little animals that got in the way. Gaylord would probably hide till it was over. For me, I was just intimidated. Seemed smart at the moment. It's okay, Clark said. They're deactivated right now. I have to arm them. He tapped a warm-up code into the panel, which would start the download program, which was communicable to all the other containers. What activates them? I choked out. I do, Clark said. There's a series of fail-safes. Theo and I are the only ones who can deploy them. I know all the codes, Theo knows half. If I'm incapacitated, Theo has to activate his own series of failsafes on the eyes-only computer in my cabin, then get the deployment failsafes. It's not like pushing a button. He pushed a button and the first bank of robots began to light and flash, their whirring scanners drawing energy. I stepped back more, and realized as I did that stepped back wouldn't matter a whit to these things. They'd follow, they'd hunt, and they'd never give up. Once they're deployed and out of the containers, there's no turning back, Clark said. They can't be recalled till they completely exhaust themselves and account for every square inch of the planet. They even go underwater. Can you imagine the ocean floor haunted by these things? Good day for a swim, I managed. What happens if you're both incapacitated? It gets harder after that, Clark admitted. He shook himself free of the hypnotic effect. Okay, let's close this up for now. I don't want the whole crew standing here staring like sheep at a corn show. He activated the controls and in a few moments the accordion doors were grinding shut one after the other, until they came together in the middle of the huge container. Finally the last two doors met, clacked, locked, and fell hauntingly silent. The poison packers were locked away in their box once again, but we held in our minds the picture of their helmeted blue-gray bodies, standing there like twitching draft horses, waiting for the bell to summon them to pull their enormous load. Clark caught sight of his first mate checking the auto-diagnostics of each container, and ordered, Theo, call all hands. Theo clicked the ship-wide comm system on his personal comp tech. All hands, muster amidships. His call echoed slightly through the big bay. One by one, the crew began to appear through hatches in the deck and bulkheads, and on walkways above. There was the pilot, Barry, and the coxswain, Mark, who was also a mechanic of a fairly technical order. Gaylord, the magnetologist, and Wade, an electrical specialist. Clark, of course, and Bonnie, the medic. Soon Axel, the squirrely computer guy, appeared with Pocket, who was in charge of generally keeping the inside of the ship in order and the cargo secure. Loading and unloading, that sort of thing. And there was Theo, the first mate, who was also an engineer. Finally Kip Singleton ducked his completely hairless head through the galley hatch. He was the cook who talked to himself and who practically ran the place. He shaved his head every day because he had a paranoia about getting hair into the food. The crew liked to tease him about his eyebrows, and Pocket was taking bets about how soon it would get to Kip and the cook would shave them off. I didn't know them well and probably never would. 
We'd been 15 months in cryosleep together, which gets you stiff legs and bizarre dreams, but nobody to stand at your wedding. Mostly I hung around Clark or Pocket and sometimes Bonnie, who liked to talk to me about my least favorite subject, my famous mother. I didn't like that topic of conversation, but Bonnie was sweet and starstruck and I didn't have the heart to brush her off. Or tell her the truth about my mother. Everyone visibly stiffened when the Colonial Marine Squad joined us. There were four men and one woman, specially trained for space missions, and they cut quite a swath through the mismatched ship's crew. The soldiers wore crisp matching field uniforms with special body-hugging padding and a head-to-toe brick-red color. Red wasn't the kind of color soldiers usually wore for field work on Earth, so they looked alien in their own way. Then again, they were entering an alien environment. This was my first clue that the planet's surface out there must be red. Soon they were all here, and Bonnie was the last to arrive, sans her moonstruck mouse. The whole mission was only going to take a matter of hours, not days, then another fifteen months in cryo to get back to Earth. By the time we got back, babies would be toddlers, stocks would have surged and plunged, and the multiple murder case I'd pursued for three years would have become history, along with me. The precinct had given me the time off and counted it only as two weeks' vacation. This wasn't the kind of place where anybody in his right mind wanted to stay more than a few hours, and only if necessary. I'd seen the reports of the creatures we were here to destroy. I'd read the account, what few existed. Somehow these animals managed to take perfectly secure operations and skilled field personnel and turn them into shredded wheat in remarkably short time. Okay, this is the drill, Clark began, falling easily into captain mode. He was a long-distance hauler and the long calm ride was his nature as well as his job. We are now on the planet's surface. Nobody leaves the ship without permission, you all know that. Permission can only be given by myself or Theo. Can I have a screen? Theo tapped his hand held linked to the ship's systems, and a screen wind right down out of a slot in the structure of the walkway above us. I guess they were all over the place on a ship like this. I hunched my shoulders, ready to see a dark and ugly landscape overrun by wickedness, creatures more malignancy than life a whole new kind of black plague. The screen activated, giving us a picture of the immediate area around the ship, outside on this remote planet called Rosamond. The ship's scanners moved slowly across the land. I squinted, looking for hazards and horrors. Instead, around us was a peaceful alien landscape, with settled black pathways running between red pillars of various diameter that might be a forest, or might be a cathedral. Where was the pestilence? Where was the befoulement? Clark stepped to the screen, which was as wide as his arm was long, and gave us all a good view of whatever the Vins's visual trackers could see, based on line of sight. The scientist's camp is inside the ship's automatic protection perimeter. Here you can see it just down about a half kilometer from where we've landed. He stood to the side of the screen and pointed at a humpy little village of prefab protective living quarters, the kind that deployed themselves, drilled themselves into the ground for anchorage, and had been tested in every possible land environment on Earth, including the Gobi Desert and the Antarctic Shelf. Shaped like upside-down bowls and ribbed with hyperflexion scissor arches, they were as close to impervious to outside forces as was humanly possible to construct with current science. Once locked down, if the users were careful, no known animal could break in, including humans. There was no one walking around out there, nobody coming out of the hyperflex huts to meet us. Pretty strange, after so many months in isolation. I'd have expected a welcoming committee. Not a soul came forward. I don't see any movement, Theo commented. No aliens. No anybody, it looks like. Clark confirmed. If there were aliens, the ship's auto defense would be firing right now. So we can assume it's safe out there for an initial scouting. 
I noticed that the settlement huts were colored the same as the landscape, my anticipated brick red with black and yellow horizontal streaks. So somebody had been thinking ahead, because all the huts were prefabricated on earth. Our orders are, first, to remove and, second, to destroy, Clark went on. We stabilize our primary site, which means the ship and the immediate hundred yards in any direction. We do not have any more surprises the crew chuckled and rolled their eyes, still nerve-wracked. We probe out with our pre-assigned landing party, you know who you are, we collect these science geeks, Rory counts heads, and we secure them inside the Vinza. Rory has mug shots and ID coatings for all these people and it'll be up to us to help him account for them. The whole operation shouldn't take more than maybe 10 hours. Then we deploy the automated platoon of poison packers and we fly back home while they do their job for the next 11 and a half months, but that's somebody else's problem, which makes me real happy. Question, Gaylord interrupted. Are there 42 or 52 of these people? I'm getting conflicting reports. Rory, why don't you answer that? I straightened up. I hadn't expected any questions directed at me. There are 52 of them, if they're all still alive. They're all science-oriented, specialists and interns, students, all handpicked by my mother for this mission. They shouldn't give us any resistance. How can we evac 52 people and all their gear in 10 hours? Because we're not taking their gear, I said. We're just taking them and the clothes they're wearing and any babies they might have had while they were here. Which, if they're smart, will be none. Will they go for this? Bonnie asked. They'll have to, Clark said. After the planet's sterilized, their gear and all their data will be retrieved in a calm manner, on a clean planet which will be under perfect control. What if they don't want to leave their stuff here? Nobody asked them. Silence fell, at least for a few long moments. Finally, Theo broke the tension. How much do we know about these bug things? Clark shrugged. Big, ugly, gooey, fast, mean, aggressive, and sneaky. Lawyers, I grumbled. An unexpected ripple of laughter made me suddenly self conscious. I was a stranger here. Their reaction surprised me, made me uneasy. I froze in place, not wanting to blow it. I didn't need them to like me. I needed them to accept me for the duration. We're not sticking around to get fleeced, Clark went on. The whole evac deploy shouldn't extend past midnight. This seems real simple and it should be. We're going down in daylight just after dawn which is the safest time. Have all of you done your homework on these aliens we're going to be scrupulously avoiding? Everybody nodded. I watched them, their twitches, their eye movements, the sulky postures. They hadn't all reviewed the tapes like they were supposed to. Everyone one of their faces looked like a mug shot. We have the Marines to take care of us, Clark went on, and Rory to help corral his mother, who runs this camp down here. You've all heard of Jocasta Malvo. Real powerful scientist, hobnobs in high circles. Once she complies, they'll all fall into place. After that, we deploy the poison packers and split. Colonel Matt Cormick, you got anything to add? The Marine commander, a cylinder with no hair and powder blue eyes like an Alaskan dog, stepped forward. His voice was fairly high for a man and had a surprising gentility about it, but that was the only soft thing about him and I didn't buy it for a cover. Contamination resistance is number one, he said. This ship and the surrounding area remains under heavy guard and 12-point automatic surveillance the whole time. The ship's auto-defense will protect us if we don't make any mistakes. Nothing sneaks aboard. One egg can destroy a ship. It's happened before. That's why we're evacuating and leaving the robotic poison packers to hunt down every last one of these bastards. Do we know what they eat? Bonnie asked. I mean, do they eat us? There's no record that they eat humans, Clark said. 
We don't know what they consume. Maybe nothing. Um. Everyone waited, but Bonnie suddenly got shy. Go ahead, girl, Clark said. Speak up. She flushed in the cheeks, but met the challenge. Creatures that big and active have to consume something. They're too thin and bony to store much. Sounds fragile, Gaylord commented. I wouldn't bet on that, Mac Cormick warned. Making assumptions like that is what got a whole squad of colonial marines slaughtered. I looked at the thick-necked, strong, bull-like man and at his other seven human tanks, trying to imagine what could get past them. I was suddenly glad none of them had been in the galley when the fox bat broke free, given that shoot through the ship thing and all. I could only guess that was why they weren't allowed to carry projectile weapons while the ship was in space. Not that they weren't armed anyway, with nerve neutralizers and shockers and just plain blades. Suddenly I felt foolish for pulling my plasma pistol out of storage and forgetting why it was put away in the first place. I'd lost my cool. In hindsight, I was embarrassed about that. Matt Cormick unclipped an unassuming blue cylinder from his belt and held it up. This is a canister of base. Anybody who's ever worked in a kitchen knows that dumping baking soda on acid will neutralize the acid. These animals have been known to spit or spray acid if their bodies get ruptured. Everybody in the landing party will carry a canister of base. If any acid gets on you or the person next to you, spray this on him. It'll cut the effect till we can get medical treatment. Miss Bardolph here has been trained for treating acid burns. Bonnie didn't look anywhere near as confident in her skills as Matt Cormick wanted us to believe. Her wide blue eyes batted around uneasily at us as if she were hoping nobody quizzed her. Before those thoughts solidified too much, Clark asked, Colonel, would you please give us a test firing of the auto protection system? Yes, sir. Matt Cormick did a sharp right turn to a fancy ass control station with about a thousand little touch plates, stations of which I happened to know there were only six on the entire ship. Executed in a bright, polished, yellow metallic, these gold cores were total system access, and those who knew the right things could do almost anything from them. If the helm area or any other critical area ended up contaminated or depressurized, the ship could even be launched, steered, landed, loaded, and unloaded from any of the gold cores. Now Matt Cormick used the system to cause a deep rumbling in the body of the ship. Energy flowed from the otherwise recumbent magnetic reaction chambers and popped out some kind of deployment array high over our heads, on the outer shell of the Vinza. On the screen, the view of the landscape and the camp huts turned a sharp, disturbing blue-green. An electronic buzz sent us all grabbing for our ears, then ended in a hard snap. Then the blue-green color faded back to the natural golden crunch of the planet. That's a field of bubble pellets carrying charged waves, Mac Cormick said. It won't kill humans, but you'll be plenty bruised after that kind of punch. If you get caught in a volley, move toward the ship. The charges are most powerful at the widest perimeter. It won't kill humans? Bonnie asked. But it's DNA coded to cook anything that isn't human over the weight of five pounds, the colonel said. Hopefully we won't be here long enough to charbroil any native herds of cattle or whatever lives here. Bonnie looked worried. Five pounds, you mean ordinary innocent animals can just wander in and get killed? Yes, ma'am, that's right. We had to set the weight limit to account for certain growth levels of the creatures we're avoiding. We won't be here long enough to do much damage. As long as we don't dump anything that attracts the local fauna. We're not going to be down there long enough for any engagements, Clark said before anybody got the same thoughts Bonnie was having. We'll go down in broad daylight. We're going to keep as tightly to our schedule as possible. We'll be gone before dusk, and the alien infestation will be neutralized before any other human being ever sets foot back on the planet. These critters adapt fast, so I've got the latest formulation of the pesticide aboard, loaded onto the PPs, 
programmed to go after any species that's not DNA matched to the planet, leaving every other species alone. Dead aliens, healthy planet. He glanced around, making eye contact with each of the crew, then nodded. Deploy, y'all. As the crew moved away from Clark, I moved toward him and in a moment we were as good as alone in the middle of the bay and its cargo of enormous rectangular green containers. My mother's not going to go along with this, I said. His expression didn't change, but his eyes got a little twinkle of trouble. Then we'd better not tell her we used her research to come up with the current formulation. Yeah, let's not tell her that, I agreed. Plancom should have sent synthetics in to do this research instead of a bunch of overeducated dweebs. I shook my head. Mother's the dweeb queen. Dweebs flocked to her. Plancom couldn't get the rights without giving my mother and her team the chance to study here. They wanted to go. She's influential. She wouldn't make the mission happen unless she and her little parade of sycophants were approved for infiltration. I got a chill and squeezed my shoulders. What's wrong? Clark asked. I looked him square in the eyes. You keep talking about how easy this is going to be. Well, that's my job. A captain's supposed to be able to sound confident even if his shorts are on fire. Know anything about this planet? What kind of terrain is out there past what we can see? In this region, rocky, semi-desert part of the year, fairly dry, hot, some plant growth. Livable, breathable, could be better and hopefully will be some day. He paused, musing. This planet is one in about eight million, Rory. A livable, breathable planet with two oceans, that won't even need much terraforming, hell, another decade of atmospheric modification, and humans can move right in. We can actually live on it now, if we don't run marathons. We won't even have to destroy any indigenous species. You know how rare that is in the reachable galaxy? I really don't. Translation, I really don't care. Get out of Milwaukee once in a while, he said. A planet the right size, the right distance from a sun, with an atmosphere and a moon, hell, it's worth hundreds of trillions just in the arable land. That's not even starting with the mineral rights, the oceanographic advantages, the value in alien botanicals and native fauna for medical advancement, it makes you dizzy, all the things we can do with a place like this. Hell, we found a living planet that won't be hurt at all if we live on it. We can have a second Earth up and running, and not in a hundred years after fortunes are spent on it, either. I'm talking ten, twelve years, if this crew does its job right this week. We got paradise here, except for this infestation we're here to stamp out. We come, we kill, we claim. How does this hunter-killer, poison-packer part stay inside the Alien Species Act? I asked. My mother and fifteen senators hammered that out. It's even got a subsection called the Malvo Amendment. It sure doesn't allow for killing off entire species just to get a claim on a planet. Indigenous species, he corrected. Read the fine print. These things aren't from here. They're aliens. So are we. He smiled and nodded. Guess so. You never heard of a range war? Has anybody ever found out where they come from? What they're doing here? Nobody knows. They're cosmic hitchhikers. I don't like mysteries. Maybe that's what drove me to get into law enforcement. We tried to do our homework, me included, but there wasn't much homework to be done. Not much was known about these animals we were here to exterminate. Of course, that was why my mother and her team were doing their dangerous work, to find out the things nobody knew about these aliens. Clark shifted on his feet. If this works out, it'll be my last mission. I'm subcontracted for an estimated percentage of the mineral rights in advance. And they estimated high. The crew gets huge bonuses, and I get that, plus a cut of the profits. If it goes lower, 
I keep my percentage. If it goes higher, I get further dividends. Pal, if this planet works out, I'm set for life. Hey, how often do you get to be a hero and get rich? I can quit peddling bulk for a living, finally make good on that plantation. You and your plantation. Hey, we can do a lot worse than sit in the beautiful southwestern desert and grow guayuli and sunflowers, then leave the land to our kids. I broke out a little laugh. What is this we shit? We don't have kids. You need some. A nice chubby wife, and kids. Kids I can't handle a bat. Kids. I watched him for a moment, and tipped my head critically. I don't see you in a Panama hat, sucking on a big cigar and watching your fields grow. Well, you're gonna, bud. Get used to it. What is it you want to grow? Wahoo? Guayuli, he said, getting the E on the end. Naturally hypoallergenic latex. Medical applications, space industry, military, transportation, colonization, and you've always wanted to quit schlepping bad guys and come live with Nancy and me on our rubber farm and help me raise my kids. This is your dream, repeat after me. I, Rory Malvo, dream of rippling fields of latex plants. And you, Clark Sparron, are hallucinating. He smiled. Caught up in his mental picture, I smiled too. No more Milwaukee to Chicago crime corridor. No more dirty streets, crime scenes, and outlines of dead guys. Was I ready to say goodbye to my whole identity? Clark thought I was. Of course, Clark thought I should never have said hello. He liked being in control. Nobody could control the streets. I thought about these alien animals which would be the hair in our pudding on this trip. How long have they been on this planet? Sometime between the first scouting androids, about eight years ago, and three years ago when the PlanCom returned to stake its claim. Sixty-two advanced scouts and settlers were killed before they figured out these were the same monsters we've run into before on one of the mining space lanes. That's when your mom was brought in to analyze the situation and decided she wanted a stab at research. She's had her chance, and now we're calling it quits and taking over. We think we know all we need to know about them for our purposes. We're not zoologists, you know. Why was I still sweating? I wiped my face with the leather jacket, then remembered it had just had a bat wrapped in it. I needed a few more seconds to get past that. Clark glanced around to make sure we were out of earshot, or at least interest, of the crew, who were bustling around us the whole time. I want you to deal with your mother for us. Don't waste a lot of time discussing her opinion. Discussions give people the wrong idea. No sense opening a carton we know is sour. Just tell her what's happening and strongly advise her to comply without a fuss. She hates being told what's happening unless she's doing the telling. He rubbed his shoulder where the bat had driven him into the wall. Maybe try to appeal to her motherly qualities. She has no motherly qualities. He grimaced. You serious? She protected her cubs until I was old enough to pour my own milk. After that, raising myself and my sister were my job. Mother became famous and I became screwed. Jeez. Sorry. Nah. There has to be some way to get to her. Annoyed at the load he was putting on my shoulders, and at myself for allowing him to convince me to come in the first place, I tried to turn away. He caught my sleeve. He fell quiet for a moment of thought. How about the leadership instinct? Her people will panic or get scared or confused, you know, crushed, if she doesn't deliver a positive experience dash. She's not a Girl Scout, Clark. Tough nut to crack, huh? Accent on nut. Yikes. Okay, go do like we taught you to suit up and we'll go ahead out there. This won't take long. There's only one ending. The conversation was over. He was already working his palm tech to do captain things. 
I was already out of his thoughts, his attention fixed on whatever the little screen was telling him as he cradled it in the palm of his hand and did a thousand things at once. We'd known each other for almost fifteen years and I knew the posture. He'd done both of us favors by asking me to come along. He needed a legal officer, and I needed a break. I'd just wrapped up a murder investigation, the revenge murder of a fellow officer, his wife, three kids, and their two dogs. I'd jumped from street cop to plainclothes detective just to pursue the violent snake who'd slaughtered them slowly, starting with the dogs. For three years I chased the bastard across two continents. The idea was to bring him to justice. Instead, I cut his arms off and let him bleed to death. Oops. The department covered it up. The official story was that the guy's arms were sliced off when he tried to escape across a farm co-op and got caught in a shredder. Nobody had any problem keeping that secret. I'd always been a loner, but the whole department stuck up for me anyway. Go figure. I'd have let me hang for it. Clark took me out of the media storm by bringing me along on this mission. The PD was glad of it, they'd shoved me out the door. The idea was, I guess, that by the time we came back from forty-odd months in space, I'd be yesterday's news. Whether I wanted to be here or not, I had to be, for the good of everybody else. I watched Clark, standing there in his blue flight suit with the lapel pin of a cloisonné bluebird which his wife had made for him in art class. He kind of looked like a big blue bird with a red crest. I appreciated him for his ability to live a utilitarian life of routine and practicality while still hanging on to universal visions. I couldn't do it. My visions never went past my shoes. This might not go the way you want it to, I warned. He looked at me. It will. I stepped closer, to make sure none of the bustling crew around us could hear. You can have this plan at any time you want, but you and your crew don't get your big bonuses without my official certification that's it's clear of human life. If we can't account for every one of those researchers, dead or alive, then I don't sign off on the deployment of your poison platoon. I'm not here to do you a favor. If I don't certify, you don't collect. I felt like a ghoul, silhouetted from behind by the brighter lights of the loading area, which now was bustling with active crew as Gaylord and Theo directed their preparation for what would come over the next few hours. Clark squinted in mental discomfort and clearly some disappointment. Maybe he had expected me to bend to the occasion in his favor. If you want rules bent, ask a friend. Okay. Sherlock, he accepted. In the hangar bay light, his blue eyes matched the bluebird pin. As long as you understand that I'll do anything I have to do to save this planet for humanity. Several bad seconds passed. For this brief period, we didn't understand each other at all. I started to turn away while he was still looking at me. After a few steps, though, I turned again and asked. What did my mother say when Plancom first told her about the evacuation? As if I'd asked him something complicated, he shifted to his other foot. Finally he pressed his lips flat and kind of shrugged. Oh, not much. 3. Moonset A strange word for morning. In the mist-veiled sky, a single green moon was too large for poetry. This planet's idea of daylight was grim. The greenish-yellow sun shone with an angry glaze, offering no comfort the way Earth's sun did. The environment was almost urban. There were so many tall blood-red pillars ranging to the horizon that we might as well have been in a city center with skyscrapers so close together that sunlight couldn't shine in unless the sun were directly overhead. Gauzy white top growth coiled and draped from pillar to pillar, high up at the tops creating a rainforest effect and a world of patchy permanent shadows beneath. It looked something like the decorations I'd seen in a church during a wedding, as if human hands had carefully placed them, then forgotten them to become shredded and stale with time. Corners, passages, holes, gullies, caves with no visible ends, it was a gory red world, redder than a barn, 
redder than the Grand Canyon, but not the color of blood. Not that kind of red. This landscape of towers, all diameters imaginable from pencil thin to big as buildings, were a strange glossy red. When my space dizziness faded a little and I could blink a clear field of vision, I realized that the columns were not stone at all in the usual sense. In fact, they were translucent enough to see through all but the biggest ones. They were like rubies or art glass. The planet was the ultimate in rose colored glasses. White veils and red glass towers. No signs of anything alive. Where are they? Pocket asked. They're not answering any hails. They could be hunkered down. Or maybe their comms quit working. They should have still heard the ship land, for Christ's sake. Yeah. While Clark and Gaylord spoke to each other in front of me, I couldn't find it in myself to speak up in this cathedral of red columns. The environment seemed almost holy in its imposing size and oddness. We were only about ten feet from the ship and had paused to take some readings and put out some feelers. Despite knowing that the ship would protect us within a certain perimeter, I couldn't settle my stomach. Imagine being on a whole different planet than Earth. I was the living inheritor of a stunning scientific advancement. My nerves danced with appreciation. Rory, you coming? Clark's imposing form was flanked on one side by Matt Cormick and on the other by a compact bundle of muscle named Sergeant Barus. I noted that Clark's red hair disappeared into the red stone pillar behind him, making him appear to have a face without a head on top. I felt the path floor with my shoe sole. It was spongy moisture underneath, but not on top. I stooped down and brought up a handful of the planet. Rory, what's up? Clark appeared over me. We can't move ahead without you. I offered him the sample. Look at this stuff. Gravel. So what? It's not gravel. It's billions of little skeletons. He leaned closer to study the remains of some kind of small creature, desiccated to its elements, broken by time and, by trampling? What had trampled them? It's the consistency of tree bark mulch, I said, but it's all skeletons. Skulch, he dubbed. Yucky. Dead's dead, I commented. He looked around. The surface of the land, everywhere we looked, was frosted with the remains of uncountable trillions of these tiny dead creatures. Well, don't take it personally. Earth beach sand is basically the same thing, you know little broken up shells and all. I stood up and dropped the handful, then brushed my hand clean. Yeah, let's keep telling ourselves that. He laughed, but not very convincingly. I reached out and touched one of the glass pillars. It was so narrow that my fingernails touched the heel of my hand, yet the pillar reached up to the same height as those with the girths of office buildings, and I could see a reflection of myself in its polished face. Too bad I wasn't more to reflect. I was the average of averages. Nothing special. Lost in a crowd of two. There was not and never had been anything the slightest bit interesting or striking about me. I had an everyman face and a shadow of a beard I'd never really been able to grow into anything but a shadow. For a while, I'd tried to have a mustache, just to set myself apart but it came in wimpy and I gave up when my fellow officers started calling me Fuzz. If anybody was going to call me Fuzz, it would be me, and for the right reasons, dang it. Oh, well, I guess everybody can't be Clark Gable. Or Clark Sparron, for that matter. Besides, being the average guy, somebody who could get lost in a crowd of three, had helped me quite a bit during my undercover days. Fifty-odd feet in the air, the skinny, glossy wand reached as high as the others and provided a support for the hat of Goss. I felt as if I were trapped at the bottom of a pencil box. The sun didn't shine very well down into the pillared landscape, but was always at some angle, creating a constant prism effect of banded light. There were no corners. Everything was curvy and round 
bending down or upward, dipping and swirling in every direction. No angles, except the bands of sunlight stabbing through and being refracted. What a place. It's a plancom kind of place. Dust bowls, glaciers, deserts, moons, you name it, we'll tame it. But you're right, it could be a paradise. Ain't I, though? You okay? Got legs? I got rags with iron balls on the ends. Welcome to space travel, he said, and helped me to my feet. Hope I don't have to run. Run, where? From here I saw about a dozen holes in the bottoms of the thicker glass columns, like cave mouths except that they opened up on other mouths. Then, up against the biggest of the columns were pathways shaped like half-tubes, like endless water slides rolling senselessly as the eye could follow through the forest of glass. What carves a landscape like this? I asked. Water, Clark said. Lots of it, about twelve million years ago. Pretty much gone now, except for some subterranean flows. They can only be accessed with sophisticated drilling and plumbing, and the flows have to be purified for human consumption. Plancom subcontracting the job out to a cousin of mine. Bottling our nerves. We came down the Vinza's ramp and the ramp dutifully closed behind us as soon as the last foot was off. They weren't kidding about security. I followed the two lead marines and Clark in that order, and the stocky Polynesian magnetologist, Gaylord, then the bosun, Pocket, right in front of me like usual. Gaylord didn't seem outwardly smart, but he had to be. He was responsible for all the zillion jobs done by magnets aboard the Vinza including those pertaining to her complex propulsion system. In front of me bobbed Pocket's ropey blonde ponytail. Pocket was detail-oriented and in a constant state of reorganization, and give or take compulsive gambling, was bright and in charge of his universe. He was also in charge of the details of this evacuation. Didn't seem like a bad job, all in all, being a bosun. If I'd had the brains, maybe I'd have liked his job. I like jobs that have beginnings, middles, and ends. As we passed between two very large columns that were very close together, we had to squeeze a single file through a quite claustrophobic passage. When I came out, Sergeant Barus stood escort for the first half of the line. He dipped his shoulder to make eye contact with the rear guard, a movement which caused me to bend sideways out of his way. My right foot skidded off balance and I started to slide down a drop-off. At the point of almost no return, Bruce caught my arm and put me back in place as if I were a doll falling off a shelf. I laced my hand into his field vest and clung gratefully for a few seconds. Only when I regained balance did I look down into the grate and discover that I couldn't see a bottom. Go down and get my stomach. Don't want to lose you, he said. Looks like some kind of a sinkhole. Thanks. No problem. Payback for when you found my lucky bandana. He tilted his weapon so I could see the yellow cowboy bandana with white swirls, which he had snugly tied around his wrist. That was great how you helped me to think my way back to it. It had to be somewhere, I said. All we had to do was eliminate everywhere else in the universe. Neat trick. You answered my prayer. I thought that was God's job. He grinned and fell in beside me as we moved after the others, more cautiously now. Behind me came Axel and Mark, the computer specialist and one of the mechanics. Axel was a misplaced 40-year-old egghead with an overbite, who could dismantle half the ship and put it back together without losing a single microbolt, but had trouble using a fork at dinner. Mark was a tousled-haired kid who'd run away from home and joined the space fleet. He delighted in sending communiques home to his parents and crowing about not having to live with them anymore. Despite a punky, immature attitude, he had a mechanical aptitude that earned him a place on this fairly exclusive ship. At first, I'd rolled my eyes at them, but after watching them work for a while, I quit doing that. Between them, the odd couple knew more technical wizardry than most hundred other people put together. 
After them came Bonnie with her medical pack and two more Marines, Private Carmichael and Corporal Edney. Carmichael seemed out of place to me. He looked as if he'd just entered high school and was wearing the Marine uniform and sensor helmet for Halloween. Even next to Edney, a steroidal female bodybuilder, Carmichael seemed frail. Still, he was a Marine in this elite unit, so there had to be something about him that was qualified for combat. Their sensor helmets were more caps than helmets, very scaled down and easier to wear than a full-sized helmet. They weren't hard hats, but made of strong webbing, only slightly bulkier than baseball caps, with a sun-shading brim over the eyes, and embedded with nanotechnology for communication, warning, and surveillance. I had one myself back home, most cops did, but not as fancy as the ones these commandos wore. In fact, these Marines' caps were new issue, colored in the red-black stripes of the landscape around here, as were their uniforms. As they walked ahead of us, weapons poised, they melted into the panorama of columns and caves. The rest of the crew would stay inside the Venza, guarded at all times by the other Marines, also bristling with weapons. I envied them. I'd hoped for some nice bright sunlight and maybe a fresh cool breeze, but here I was with indirect light, no breeze at all, dry heat, and the smell of stale bananas. Not a bit of green. Not a leaf, not a spore. I looked up at the hanging white gauze at the fading green banded moon. What's the moon got to do with it, Clark? I asked. A pace ahead of me, Clark scanned the interior of a suspicious tunnel. With what? You said something about a planet with a moon. How rare it is. Didn't know you were listening. Having a moon stabilizes the rotation of a planet. If there's no moon, a planet wobbles on its axis and the weather goes not so. Tides, storms, polar changes, real wreck. Life would have a hell of a time surviving. We've tried to put colonies on some of those, but it makes for a miserable existence. All kinds of limitations on agriculture, livability, you name it. It's so hard to live that no progress can be made, so there's no point trying. He pointed up at the sky. Gotta have that moon going for you. Gaylord, how close did we get to our mark? The location of the original drop, off was 40 meters north, just through those thicker spires, Gaylord said. Good landing, considering. Nice job, Barry, Clark spoke into his wrist comm. You put us on the dot. Stand by. Standing by. Oh, great red leader. Clark held up a hand. Everybody except the Marine Vanguard froze in place, including me, instinctively. Freeze I can do. The Marines in front fanned out, their enormous weapons first, clearing the way. Their boots made a crush-crush noise on the slippery footing of dead critters. Sparin, Venza. Any sign of them? Theo radioed. Not so much as a food canister, Clark reported. We can see the huts, but there's no movement. Try them again on the big comm. I've been trying. No response continent, wide. Dead air. No beacons? Locators? Auto feeds? Just yours. As I moved up behind Clark, he knew I was there. Why don't we just go up and knock? I asked. We will, but I just want to do this slowly and carefully, is all. Why aren't they answering? Maybe they moved, he said. Over the mountains or someplace else. I didn't fall for it. They should still be able to hear us. He raised his comm unit and spoke into it again. Attention, Malvo research team. This is Captain Clark Sparin. Any Body picking this up? The comm emitted a soft buzz, but no voices. There was a sense of a signal's going out, reaching down through these many slides, into the empty distance. They're dead, Gaylord murmured very quietly. This is bad. 
fear glowed from his dark eyes and gave a pasty grayness to his bronze island complexion. He glanced at me, then purposefully averted his eyes. Clark digested that comment. Jury's still out. I don't know whether he was speaking for my benefit or not. Gaylord had just proclaimed the likely death of the only relatives I had. I think it bothered him more than it bothered me. Clark stepped away. I reached out, caught his sleeve, and pulled. Tell the truth, I demanded. When was the last time anybody contacted this outpost? When's the last time anybody heard my mother's voice? He licked his lips. Been a while. How long? This isn't the time for this, Rory. We're here. They're not. We have to find them. We have to confirm their status and evac anybody who's not Dash. My face heated up and so did my tone. Is that why we're really here? To confirm they're dead? Nobody said anything like that. It's the not saying, Clark. Would I have brought you here if I thought they were dead? I could have taken anybody with a badge to be the legal officer. I asked for you, remember? I had no good answer. During the pause, he pulled away and crunched down the path of skeletal mulch, and I followed. The marines and crew fell into formation again around us. The marines carried some kind of new weapon I hadn't seen before, compact personal firing units with carefully balanced power packs. These things weren't exactly guns in the conventional sense. I was hoping to see a demonstration eventually. From here, at the top of a sloping path between the forest of red columns of all imaginable diameters, we could see the humpy bowl-shaped huts which to all but humanize the designers hoped, blended fluidly into the environment. Actually, except for the shape, they did. They were the only round things in sight, which was all that set them apart. The color pattern, though, went against the bowl shape and actually mimicked the horizontal stripes of black and yellow on the natural columns. Somebody had done a pretty good job. I don't see anybody, Bonnie said, her voice very tentative. They're not answering hails, Pocket confirmed. I've been broadcasting right along. Gaylord somehow made his large body smaller as we carefully moved down the slope. Maybe their comms are down. Pocket made an unforgiving huff. They still should have heard the ship land. I'm for blowing this berg. If we can't find them electronically, we can't find them. I'm for that, Mark echoed. We should split. We can't be Superman for everybody. Mark always wanted to do the least work he could get away with. He had a roadhouse singing voice and entertained the crew with his folk songs, but that was the only thing he was enthusiastic about. Everything else, he did exactly what he had to do and not a lick more. He was out here with us because Clark wanted to make him perform. We still have to account for them, Clark said. Or satisfy Rory that they're no longer alive. This place is creepy, Bonnie said, voicing what we were all feeling. It's only the silence that's creepy, I suggested. Don't worry, ma'am, Matt Cormick said to her. We're still well inside the ship's protection grid. Despite his assurances, I sensed that nobody felt secure. I wasn't that sure what we were facing. Clark and the Marines hadn't exactly been forthcoming about details, and I suspected that was because there wasn't much positive and they didn't want to be negative. Confidence was a tool. I, for one, believe in full disclosure. Sure is hot. Gaylord wiped the sweat out of his eyes. Pocket kept his eyes fixed on his handheld scanners. Hundred four in the shade. I'll take bets on how cold it gets in the caves. No, you won't, Clark warned. We felt a silence again as we entered the camp of half round huts each big enough to house up to five people in fair comfort. For a moment we paused at the outskirts, just looking. The marines scouted and pocket scanned, but there was no sign of anything living. No movement, no readings. 
The camp was in permanent shadows, overcast by the gauze hanging above. Four of the nine huts carried veils of fallen gauze, which was dissolving slowly as if melting over the shapes of the huts. To say there was no sign of life might be inaccurate, now I could see the evidence of bad housekeeping, if nothing more. Scattered clothing items, long abandoned, evidence of a fire long gone cold, and a pile of food containers. As we cautiously entered the closet thing to a common center to the camp, I spotted four, no, five large lumps of the fallen gauze from above lying on the ground. What attracted me was that they were all shaped like bread dough, and seemingly tidy loaves. Look at the doors, Pocket pointed out. They all look the same. Every hut's sliding door was open about seven or eight inches, and obviously locked from the outside with clamps fixed to the scissor arches. I don't like that, Clark said. Big enough to look through, but not enough to enter or exit. Stay back, everyone, Matt Cormick ordered. Baruz, recon that hut. Sergeant Baruz thumped forward, leaving fat, booty footprints in the sculch. I admired him for his forwardness. He didn't peek inside, he didn't hesitate. He strode up aggressively, shoved his weapon's muzzle into the eight-inch opening, and clicked on the light beam to illuminate the inside. He watched the little screen that saved him from having to actually stick his face in there. As if it would fit. Sir, I got bodies, Baruz reported. No life signs. No heat signatures. All cold. What kind of bodies? Seem to be human, sir, by the skull shapes. How many? Matt Cormick asked. At least six. Oh, God, Bonnie murmured. Clark glanced at me. Let's get it open. Barus let his weapon pivot down on his harness, a smart device that let a soldier work with his hands without putting his weapon on the ground or handing it over to someone else. Jaws, he requested. Pocket pulled a portable hydraulic device from his backpack, took a shallow breath, and did his duty by stepping through to Barus. Together they fitted the device, with its two pliers-like jaws into the unwelcoming opening in the door panel turned the device on, and stepped back. The jaws hummed for two seconds, then began to separate. The squall of protesting metal soon had us wincing, but not for long. Five seconds, and the locks cracked. The doors were free. Bruce moved in and slammed the panels aside. The Marines went in first, Bruce and Edney together. It didn't take long. When they came back out, Baruz fought to control his expression and simply said. It's clear. For bodies, all human, all dead, sir. Clark looked a little sick, but he said, I'll have a look. I pushed between the others and caught his arm. I'll do it. But they could be, he began, you're. I'm a homicide detective. I've seen bodies before. Yeah, but they. He stopped trying. I'm real sorry about this. I didn't think it'd be this way. Didn't you? Steeled with my own sense of reality, I forced myself to act as if I had no hesitation. Tears of empathy ran down Bonnie's face as I passed her. Her face carried all the pain I was burying. Or should have been. I should have been feeling something, shouldn't I? Much easier to keep moving. I didn't even pause at the door, but stepped all the way inside the hut. Burris held his weapon so that the light source bounced off the far wall and cast a band of light on the contents of the prefab house. No, not a house, in its last use by humans, the hut had been something else. My skin shrank as I entered the dim circular space. There was a stench but in this dry heat the smell of decomposition was naturally diminished. Still, I recognized the odor of dead human flesh. There was no other scent like it. This hut would never be livable again. Along the rim of the inner wall lay two human corpses directly in front of me, shrouded in a milky spun, cotton material. 
I steeled myself and started toward them. Something bumped my forehead. I jolted back and looked up, my hands pressed back against the wall of the hut. I'd been bumped by a naked human foot. In the middle of the hut, suspended from a construction ring, hung a dead woman dangling by the neck. She had no clothing except panties and bra. Her face was mummified, like the rest of her, yet there was still a clear expression of desperate sadness in the set of the jaw, even though the jaw was twisted askew by the rope. No, it wasn't a rope, it was the braided shreds of her clothing. I reach up and stopped her from swinging. She'd swung enough for one millennium. Sorry, I whispered. The nearest body on the ground was wrapped loosely in that odd grayish shroud, like the forms outside. I knelt beside it and scooped the gray stuff away. It pulled like cotton candy, with only a pause for resistance, and it was slightly sticky and clung to my hand. It pulled against the partly decomposed body of a mutilated man. His skull and chest were large, bones bulky and obviously masculine. And there was a hole in the chest the size of a bowling ball. My heart started to thump. The sternum was completely gone, along with about half his rib cage. On second look, some of the ribs were still here, but broken outward and hanging on only by filaments. I knew an explosion when I saw one. Something was in, and it came out on its own terms. A tiny movement in my periphery made me blink and look at my own arm. The white gray stuff was crawling out my sleeve. What? Instinctively I drew back. The gauze fibers snapped and recoiled. Embedded in the fibers were dark stringy items that I had mistaken for more fibers. They weren't. They were long ropey weevils with definite heads and tails if I looked closely. That was what made the gray haze and what was otherwise white fibers material. They moved very slowly, but they moved. I paused to think. After a few seconds, I went ahead and kept picking at the cotton, cord, weevils and all. Rory? Clark called. You okay in there? Come on in, but be prepared. Once he got past his initial reaction, I said, they're all the same. Chests exploded. Except this woman up hanging here. I think she hanged herself to avoid what happened to the others. What are they doing in here? He asked. It's the same out there. Two other huts have bodies. They couldn't get out, and nobody else could get in. Is it possible they locked themselves in? This was too weird. Had they locked themselves in or locked something else out? The locks were attached from the outside. Were they bait? Was this punishment? Prison? Had the scientists gone crazy and had some kind of feud? How many bodies are in the other huts? Four in one and three in the other. I gazed up at him. You know what happened to them, don't you? Yeah. But there are also five outside the huts, wrapped in that gauzy stuff. It's not gauze. It's this planet's idea of maggots. Jesus. I moved to the next two bodies in the hut. They huddled together like the victims of Pompeii, braced against the side of the hut, one in the arms of the other, shrouded with thick gauze and only a few thin black weevils. Both had their chests bombed out. The one had held the other until his own time came. They had accepted their fates, unlike the woman hanging above. These were both men. Their faces still had flesh enough to see their features. They were broad-browed and handsome, with strands of straight raven black hair. They each wore bright orange t-shirts that looked to me like sports team shirts. The torn fronts had white letters, but there was no way to read them now. Brothers? Was I witness here to a family tragedy? Wait a minute I stood up and looked at the woman who had hanged herself. How'd she get up there? Clark looked around. Nothing to climb on. I turned the woman's body like a bell. Her shrunken arms hung stiff, but her chest was unbroken and there were no weevils on her. 
they probably couldn't reach her up there. Her body had simply dried up. Do you think Bonnie could tell me how long this woman's been hanging here? Probably. She must have worked on cadavers before. Bonnie! Brace yourself and come here. There was a crunch of footsteps. Bonnie came in and made a terrible gasp at the sight. She clapped both hands to her mouth. Oh God, God what, what happened to them? What happened to them? SHH. Clark grabbed her by both arms. Steady up. You know what happened. Oh God, why, why are they in here like this? Who put them in here? Clark drew her to the middle of the hut. Can you tell us how long this woman's been dead? I held the hanging woman still while Bonnie fought to compose herself, tears running down her face now. It's okay, I reassured. Her troubles are over. Let's get her down. Grizzly work, for sure. We cut the woman down and had to be careful in handling her, she was ready to fall apart. This wasn't Clark's kind of work. He seemed very uneasy at the disrespect we had to show this woman as we lowered her stiffened corpse to the floor of the hut. Okay, Bonnie, I began. I'm sorry to tell you this, but I need you to cut her open. Cut her open? Oh, you mean. She made a motion on her own chest. I nodded. I need to know what's in there. She grimaced in misery and opened her pack to expose a small surgical set. While she worked, I crunched to the fourth body, this one very much alone, both arms and both legs twisted backward in the agony of a final throw. This one was a man, judging by its size and big hands, and seemed to be the most decayed. I pulled back the white gauze, which confirmed my guess by being completely free of black weevils. They had obviously finished with this one long ago and they were gone. Maybe they moved to other bodies, or maybe they went on their lives' way. Bonnie's sniffs tapered off as she involved herself in her work. I tried to hover back from the work area, trying not to make her self-conscious as she did the ugly work I had asked of her. Then, a silver flicker winked in Baru's muzzle light, a flicker on the hanged woman's hand. It almost called to me. Moving slowly, not to disturb Bonnie, I turned the dead woman's bony hand over. The flicker was a brushed, satin platinum ring, very expensive, with a large marquee diamond and swirly black etchings around the band, a wedding ring. The bride's ring. The hand fell apart, leaving the ring in my palm. Thanks, I responded quietly. I'll take care of it. I put the ring in my breast pocket before anyone else could see. As if she understood, the woman's contorted arm went slack and sank to the hut floor. So she was finally resting. Tears still ran from Bonnie's eyes, but she was sternly doing her work. About a year, she said. I peeked at what she was doing. What about? It's there, she said, and pointed inside the woman's now-open chest cavity, at a shriveled and dried mass shaped like a carrot. She killed herself before it matured. Geez. Clark murmured. Bonnie looked up at him. There's something else, she was pregnant. The depths of sorrow that must have been played out in this hut now communicated themselves to us as if they were fresh and immediate. Bonnie started to cry unable to hold it in anymore. She didn't want to give birth to that thing before giving birth to her own child. Two things growing inside her, so sad. Somewhat coldly, I said, even sadder that she was here in the first place. How'd she get up there? Clark asked again. I looked at the ceiling. There's only one way, I said. Somebody in here helped her. Driven by sheer nerves, we took only 19 minutes to catalog the other bodies. The crew and marines let me investigate first, before their boots and reactions disturbed any evidence. Bonnie followed me around, taking DNA samples for later, that is, after she got over her introduction to the black maggoty things. 
I looked for other details. A man with a pocket full of pictures of antique cars. Another man with military dog tags and cloisonne teeth a fad from about 12 years ago. A woman with a diabetic maintenance armband. She wore a flight suit with a name tag, Sergeant Lorna Claver. All but two of them had something in common they wore wristbands or anklets of white and red macrame cord, with black beads. Somebody had a hobby. In fact, the two who didn't have these macrame bands were the two who had been dead the longest. Every detail spoke to me. They were my best friends. All these dead people were my best friends. Live people, they come and go. Finally, the last body, this one outside of the hut, lying in a cocoon. I pulled away at the wormy gauze to bear the mummy inside. Their stories would be much different in a moist environment. This is the most recent one, I said as Bonnie knelt beside me. How recent, do you think? Not very, probably months, not weeks. It's a man. He walked with a limp from a leg injury. He also ate a lot of canned sliced carrots. How do you know that? Because he threw up right over there. Oh, yes, he did didn't he? Bonnie's shoulders involuntarily hunched. I admire that you can do this, put your hands into dead things and not be flustered. I'm a homicide detective. I have to be callous or I couldn't even sleep. I'd always be lying there thinking, gee, I could be out there helping somebody. There's always somebody to help. You run out of strength, you run out of pity, you never run out of helpless people. Bonnie looked at me and studied my face until I wished she would turn away. I didn't like the spotlight. I really do admire you, she said. You must be a lot like your mother. Strong, alert, perceptive, always seeing details other people miss. It's the training, I said sharply. She retreated a little and went back to looking at the decayed body in its cotton bedroll. This was always my worst thing in medical school, and we always had clean, controlled environments. I guess maybe I went into the wrong field. Just because death bothers you? I like doctors who are bothered by death. Me, I look at dead guys all the time. If it's dead, it can't hurt you. She looked up at the tops of the Cathedral of Pillars. This must be the pupil stage of these. Weevils. I supplied, so she didn't have to say maggots. Or maybe the adult stage, she went on, avoiding the word altogether. The gauze in the sky must have some kind of microbes or eggs in it, waiting for their time. It's pure white up there, but down here it turns grayish because the parasites grow, and they're black. They must reproduce up there, on the tops of the columns. When the gauze falls, it turns into a natural protective cocoon and the young feed on whatever it falls on. If it falls on something dead. Or alive and they kill it. We know they feed on dead things, I said. Things that feed on dead flesh don't eat live tissue. On our planet, she pointed out. You're good at analyzing. Did your mom teach you? I might have picked up a thing or two around the mansion. She squeezed her shoulders with a rush of excitement. It must have been just so stimulating to grow up with Jocasta Malvo as your guiding force. She's so brilliant, she's made so many discoveries, and she's articulate enough to explain them to the public in all those books and articles and vids. I just love her way of describing strange wonders. It's true poetry. Aha! Uh -huh. Glad you enjoy it. Why didn't you become a researcher like your mom and your sister? I wasn't born with the silver spoon of science in my mouth. Behind us, the Marines kept changing position, checking out the location and keeping their eyes on the outskirts of the camp. I took a message from their posture. I'd seen SWAT teams and Rangers, Special Forces, and Colonial Security teams, but there was something different today. These Marines were twitchy and scared. I'd seen Clark's info video of the animals we were avoiding, 
the things they did to humans and other animals, implanting the bodies of others with their young, then the young burst out, in damned little time, I noted. In just a few hours, the implanted seed managed to gain weight and develop into a head and tail with teeth, possessing the power of a shotgun. With that power, it would break out. In those huts, we had the result. Dead humans with bombed-out chest cavities. And of course I'd seen the shadowy security recordings of the adult animals. The pictures weren't good legs, arms, claws, whip, like tails, and flashes of a head shaped like a zucchini. There was a record, or was it just a theory, that humans did better against them if we weren't surprised by them, and if we faced them down properly, with the proper weapons. They could be killed, we knew that. Beside me, Bonnie was beginning to shiver. The air was hot, so she was shaking with fear, not cold. To distract her, I asked, what about you? What are you doing out here among all these hard, boiled assholes? Shouldn't you be working in a quiet little petting zoo? Petting something? She smiled, softening her otherwise boyish features. My education was privately funded by Plancom. They put me through medical school. When I'm done in January, I'm indentured to the company 15 years. It's working out great for me. At the end of it, I'll be a fully-fledged family physician and I'll be able to open a private practice and already have the whole company as my patients. Save a bat, save the planet, huh? Why not? Your mother would agree. Butterball's a beautiful little showpiece for the success of intervention. From what I saw on the ship, Butterball can take care of herself, I said. I hate things that fly. Oh, you don't mean that. Yeah? Fly at me some time. You'll put your hand in decaying flesh, but you don't like birds and butterflies? I don't like flying shit that bites. You can't keep your eye on M. She sniffed and wiped her nose with the back of her hand, because her fingers and palm were caked with the remains of those who should never have been here in the first place. I'd insulted her in some way, I could tell. Looking pale and unhappy, Clark came up to us and broke our need for further talk. Well? Any conclusions before we stop pretending it's going the way we expected? I spared Bonnie the burden of going first. All the bodies in the huts had their chests burst, except for the one woman. The bodies outside were killed by other means. One had some kind of segmented garrote around his neck. He was strangled. Two were speared through the body. By what? I don't know yet. No sign of weapons. I don't know if the researchers went crazy and killed each other, or those aliens you're avoiding speared them. What about the other three? I glanced at the rest of the team over there, the twitchy marines and the spook ship's crewmen who were waiting unhappily in the dim midst of this death ring. I lowered my voice. They were pretty much ripped apart. One of them's in three pieces. How long ago? Clark asked, burying a shudder. Different times, Bonnie spoke up. In this arid environment, Protected by the cocoons, the black parasites may have the luxury of taking their time. I'll have to let the medical computer analyze the tissue before we'll know for sure. I don't think we need to know, Clark said. This doesn't look good for sticking around. They didn't last very long, did they? Rory, I hope you agree with me when I say that. I shrugged. There's a lot of violence here. He leaned closer. Are any of them, ah? Uh, my mother or my sister? No. I've got three women here. One wore a wedding ring. One had dark red hair, and the third is too tall. I'm sorry to drag you into this. Quit apologizing. It's just business. Okay. You're lying, but okay. Captain. Over here. The call came from Mac Cormick. We nodded up into a group, mostly because nobody wanted to be alone and Clark led the way down the hill and just out of the camp, 
into a grotto of red glass and dark black crispy mulch. On a quick look, I figured the sudden change from sand, colored skeletal mulch to this black stuff meant a lot of those black parasites tended to die in this area. At least, that was the uneducated conclusion. Actually, the black crunch could have come from any other source. What did I know about it? Stop. Pocket called. We piled into each other as we skid to a stop. We're about to leave the ship's protection grid. He showed us the screen on his palm tech. Not the brightest idea, right? Should we do that? Bonnie asked. Clark looked bewildered and didn't have an answer. He hadn't expected to leave the grid at all, never mind so soon. At the bottom of the slope, Mac Cormick appeared. Come on down. It's safe. Be careful of the slope. It's slippery as hell. The slope was indeed slippery, made of what must be millions of years of collected many skeletons crushed to a fine consistency and creating a dune-like slide. We helped each other down, but Carmichael stayed at the top when Matt Cormick signaled him to do so. I got the idea from the way he looked down here that he was perfectly happy staying up there. I only went halfway down myself, and was content to stay just far down enough to see what was going on. At the bottom was a dimly lit grotto of mulch and glass that was like walking into the neck of a bottle and coming out inside. In front of us, Colonel Mac Cormick, Sergeant Baruse, and Corporal Edney stood around a nest of oval pods the size of beach balls. There were more than a dozen, each with its meaty top popped like a zit triangular petals folded back and dried up. The marines had their weapons pointed at the empty pods, and they were visibly nervous. Oh, crap! Clark blurted. He threw his arms out at his sides and stopped us all in our tracks Bonnie and I bunched up behind him. Oh, crap, crap, he boiled over. It's safe, Mac Cormick assured. They're all expended. All hatched. They must have been the ones that got a grip on those people in the huts. You know what I mean. What are they doing here? Bonnie asked, breathing in little gulps. Aren't they supposed to be in some secluded incubation chamber? Isn't that what the reports say? This isn't like any of the reports. Why are they out here by themselves? Her confusion came out in fear. Information she had depended on was already falling apart, and we weren't an hour into the mission. It looks like there must have been an attack, Clark guessed. Several of the researchers got pinched by the hatched stage of those creatures. The fingery, ugly, you know, those. The researchers might have all died defending themselves. Oh, boy, here it came. Did I have to tell them? Yes. They wouldn't have defended themselves, I said. Clark gawked at me for shooting down his theory. They wouldn't have had weapons, I confirmed when I saw his expression. Excuse me? Colonel Matt Cormick stepped closer, his square face screwed up in military complaint. No weapons. My mother wouldn't allow it. You don't come into the wolf's territory, then shoot the wolf when it attacks you. You don't swim with sharks, then get mad when one bites you. If you're stupid enough to get killed, too bad. No defense? Matt Cormick contributed. Edney hissed, now, that's stupid. I congratulated her with a glower. Welcome to how Jocasta Malvo thinks. She may not have allowed them to harm these these animals. Why in the devil not? Matt Cormick asked. He wasn't being rhetorical. He wanted clarification. Because my mother has a little religious colony going here, I supplied, complete with martyrs. I've seen it before. At the crest of the slope, Private Carmichael, his voice much more timid than his weapon-bristling appearance, asked, Every living thing fights for its life, right? I snapped him a harsh look. Not brainwashed sacrificial lambs young enough to think that after you die, you wake back up and then you're famous. 
Anybody who came on this trip because you wanted my mother's autograph should have gotten it a year ago in some nice bookstore. If she got herself killed, that's fine. I'm just sorry she took my sister and all those innocent starry-eyed chumps with her. In the stultified second after my words obviously stunned everybody into a whole new scare, I felt bad that I'd had to tell them the unvarnished truth. Not enough to coddle them, though. Besides, I added, notice that there aren't any dead aliens lying around. The researchers didn't fight. There was no way to ignore the fact that something else happened than we had first assumed. Nobody reviled my declarations more than I did. Nobody wanted to turn around and get out of here more. I'd believed Clark's descriptions of an easy mission, quick on, quick off, drinks all around. I'd actually believed my mother might be the only problem and that we could handle her. I'd made the mistake of concentrating on that and letting somebody else worry about other things. Screw this shit to the wall. Colonel Matt Cormick shook his head in frustration and clumsy attempts to sound in control. I gotta take a piss. He crunched around to the other side of the nearest pillar, while the rest of us waited and had nothing to do but avoid meeting each other's eyes. True to Marine practice, Corporal Edney marched to the best place to keep an eye on us and also on Matt Cormick. Nobody was to be left alone, not even for an instant. Line of sight was to be scrupulously respected. Sparin, Vinza. Theo's voice came fairly clear over the speaker, so crisply that it was startling. Clark cleared his throat to find his voice. Yeah, Sparin here. What's up, Theo? I don't know. Something's going on outside. The guards are gone. Everyone turned to Clark, holding breaths. He brought the calm up to his lips and turned away from us, trying to have a private conversation. Gone? Like. Like gone. I can't see him, I can't raise him. You want me to go out there and look around? Negative. Stay inside the ship. Nobody goes out. They're probably just looking around the perimeter. Why aren't they answering? It's not like they can walk out of range. Clark crunched around and gave up trying to hide what was going on back at the ship. Matt Cormick. Yes, sir. Matt Cormick appeared from the other side of the pillar, putting his pants back together after nature's call. Donahue and Brand aren't at their post at the ramp. They're not answering hails. Matt Cormick's face flushed. His brows came down as he hit his own comm unit. Donahue, Brand, signaling immediately. This is Matt Cormick. Speak up. What happened to them? I asked. Nothing can happen to them, he assured. They're in the ship's protection sphere and they're well armed. Would they have left the protection sphere? No. Not without orders. Because this is such a controlled environment? Mind your own business, detective, will ya? I ignored him and demanded. Has any of this protection equipment ever actually been tested on an alien planet? Clark's expression as he glanced at Matt Cormick and the Marines as he glanced back gave me my answer. Let's get back. That was all Pocket, Axel, and Mark needed. The three of them scrambled back up the grades so fast that they lay a spray of black sculch on the rest of us. Clark shouted, Stay together. Hold your horses. Hey! As his three crewmen passed Carmichael at the top of the slope, Clark leaned forward to scratch his way up the grade, grasping Bonnie by the arm as he went and drawing her with him. Come on! Come on, let's stay together! Rory, come on! Let's move! Matt Cormick snapped to his Marines. Moving on the slope was like climbing around inside a bowl of cereal. Every step pushed more sculch downward. For every step, we slid too. That was when Barus slipped. His left foot went straight out sideways and he went down on his right knee. His weapon slammed into a pillar, splattering bits of hard material. 
the bits flew into my eyes, causing me to stumble for a crucial instant. Baruz twisted to recover, but the slippery grade shifted under him and he went over backward, his weapon flailing above his head. I made a wild reach for him, caught the tie on the bandana on his wrist, and received a yank that almost pulled my shoulder out of joint. I couldn't hold him. The bandana slipped out of my grip. Baruz pitched backward and head first, his back arched and his knees bent. For just an instant I thought he'd be all right because all he had to fall on was expended egg pods and the sculchy mulch on the grotto floor. He landed on his back with his head bumping down inside an egg pod, which collapsed under his weight with a disgusting splush. We all scratched to a stop and stared down. Baruz looked shocked, but blinked and lay there for a moment as if gathering himself to get up. In that pause, Edney uttered an aggravated, shit, jackass. Baruz grinned, embarrassed. Edney reached out to pull him up. As soon as his hand clasped hers, everything changed. Baruz's expression changed to blinks of bewilderment, then he began to twitch, his whole body from the spine, as if he were being given electrical shocks. Get him out of there! Clark shouted. Before anyone could move, Baruz began belching horrible broken yelps of agony and surprise. The back of his sensor cap was smoking, billowing with green stenchy tendrils, and suddenly liquid began to splash from behind his ears and neck. The screams became high-pitched with panic. Edney recoiled for crucial seconds, then found her courage and met Matt Cormick at their comrades' sides. They pulled Baruz to his feet. He was stiff as stone, his eyes wild, hands splayed and wagging aimlessly. Edney yanked off Baruz's sensor cap, and that in itself was a mistake. She stared at her own hand as it began to sizzle. Her glove dissolved in an instant, and her skin was next. She shrieked and fell backward into Clark. Acid. I gasped. I clawed for the blue cylinder on my belt and skidded toward Edney. I fell to my knees twice, which caused me to hold back after what I'd just seen happen to Baruz. Damning myself for hesitating, I tried to get to her. Heaving out short breaths, she stared at her hand as it fried like an egg. Matt Cormick grabbed for his own and tried to spray it on the back of Baruz's head, but he fumbled and lost precious seconds. Baruz made one long howl of agony that seemed endless, stretching out until the last breath left his lungs. He dropped to a sitting position on the sculch, with Matt Cormick holding one arm, the other dropping flat at his side, palm up. The screaming stopped and changed to a prolonged wheeze. Matt Cormick held him with one hand and sprayed the neutralizer base with the other, coating the back of Baruz's head until the canister hissed dry, empty. The wheezing of Baruz and the gasping of Edney. I pushed Edney up against the pillar and grasped her by the wrist, pushing her hand flat against the red glass. She gritted her teeth, lips peeling back, and hissed out her pain as I sprayed her hand with the base. The bubbling flesh began to settle down in a final thread of steam. Only then did I turn to look at the nightmare playing out beside us. Baru's head was haloed in stinking smoke. His legs were twisted unnaturally under him. He pitched over sideways away from Mac Cormick, to land once again on his back, eyes glazed. What a stink. Matt Cormick clung to him with both hands. Help me get him up, he shouted. Clark and I were the closest. I pushed Edney, still in terrible pain, toward Bonnie. At the top of the slope, Pocket, Axel, and Mark had come back to look down at us, their faces pasted with confusion. Private Carmichael was on his way down the slope to help Bonnie with Edney. To this audience the next horror played out. As Clark and I helped Matt Cormick take Baruch's arms and lift him again to a sitting position, the poor young man went instantly from alive to dead. When we picked him up, the back of his head stayed on the ground. His brain tumbled out, rolled down his back, and slumped into the puddle of white neutralizer. And there it lay. Clark stumbled backward, petrified. 
Matt Cormick stared at the empty brain case of his comrade, and down at the disembodied brain lying in a vomitous gout of bubbles. Me, I just crouched there holding the dead man's other arm, once again gripping his bandana-wrapped wrist. Baru's body stiffened in place. He never did go limp. I'd heard of that. Corpses on battlefields, still holding their guns up, still aiming. Above me, I heard Edney's pained gasps and Bonnie's sobs as she tried to hold it in, but couldn't. I had to force myself not to pick up the brain and stuff it back into Baru's head to wake him up. Only minutes ago he'd saved my life from the same kind of misstep. I hadn't caught him. I hadn't caught him. What good was I here? What good could I possibly do here? I couldn't save the life of a man standing next to me. What was I doing here? What if that had been Clark? Instantly I felt terrible for comparing a man I knew well to one I'd just met. Baruz was a simple guy, easy to make happy. And apparently just as easy to make dead. Bring him, Matt Cormack rasped. He threw Baruz's weepon over his shoulder, beside his own weapon. Help me bring him, help me carry him. It'd be better to leave him I began. We're taking him. I'm not leaving him here. Matt Cormick was either falling apart or exhibiting exactly what we all needed. Since I didn't have the people sense to know which was which, I just clammed up and helped him carry Baruz to the middle of the grade, where Pocket and Mark solemnly met us and took his legs. We struggled to the top of the grainy slope. As we reached the top, Clark appeared beside us carrying Baru's brain in the Marine's discarded and half-dissolved cap. Clark's features were sallow and drawn as he met my eyes. A man deserves to be buried whole. I looked at Baru's face as we held him suspended between us. The back of his head still dripped. His eyes peered up at me imploringly. Matt Cormick's face worked and twitched with emotion as if he had a mouthful of glue. He was enraged and mourning, fighting for acceptance, for control, so he could continue to lead. I knew that look. It was the cold bottle of a cop's life, trying to get the job done without breaking down, to find answers without giving up the inner information that would chisel away our objectivity. Clark started walking off his torment, leading in his own way. Carmichael moved to one side, Axel to the other, and Clark passed through them heading back the way we had come, to walk through that sad camp to our ship, and then to leave this planet. It was all in their posture. We'd come too late, and botched the simple plan. I would go with them, all the time wishing I'd never come to this pest hole. I was done too. Matt Cormick, Pocket, and Mark and I carried Barus. Carmichael bravely led the vanguard, though his steps were mechanical and halting. Axel waited until we passed, then helped Bonnie with the wounded Corporal Edney. We were halfway between the grotto and the camp when Pocket Scanner started flashing red on its screen and beeping in broad tones. We all stopped while Pocket held Baru's foot with one hand and picked up the scanner on its shoulder strap with the other. He looked at the screen, then looked up at the tightly packed columns and unwelcoming channels in the landscape behind us. Ah. Uh, Guys. He murmured. At once he dropped Baru's leg, clasped the scanner in both hands, and stared up at the long trench like gully extending onward past the grotto's mouth and around a bend. Something's coming. A lot of somethings. People? Clark asked. Not unless they've shrunken to the size of squids. How many? Sixty, seventy, seventy five. Mother Mary. Drop him. I shouted to Matt Cormick and Axel. No. Matt Cormick kicked at me as I let go of Baru's arm and his body crunched to the ground. You pick him back up. Pick him up. The argument was already history. At the end of the visible corridor appeared a single creature. It looked like a scorpion with extra long legs, or a human hand gone mutant. No eyes, no head, yet it was taking a beat on us from fifty yards away. 
Behind it whipped a long segmented tail, waving in the air, snapping back, forth, back, forth in a manner of threat. Matt Cormick dropped Baruse and grabbed for his weapon, somehow managing to disentangle it from Baruse, which was also strapped to him. He cleared the muzzle, aimed, and fired without pausing. The spidery ghoul exploded into uncountable pieces. Bits of it bounced off two pillars on the sides of the corridor, and I swore it squealed as it died. Not enough. Pocket warned. Nowhere near enough. There they are. As we stood stupefied in that one instant that everybody hates, when you can't move and you know you should, suddenly dozens of the craven creatures showed themselves at the gully's bend. They came around the pillars, on the pillars, crawling around the glass pillar the way squirrels do around trees, and they jumped from column to column, crossing wide spaces in instants, closer and closer by the leap. They crowded along the gully floor, their fingery appendages clicking staccato on the sculch. Behind them came a second wave, fundamental as scorpions, tails high and snapping, racing toward us on their spindles. Facehuggers! Clark shouted. Think with your legs. 4. Baru's mutilated body struck the path floor. His empty skull made a pock on the sculch. In an instant everyone was running. I drew my plasma pistol and fired on the run. A bolt of compact plasma streaked back and splattered two scorpions, but the others closed in and skittered over the exploded remains without the slightest disruption. Run, run! Pocket called out with each of his own pounding paces. Run, 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 run! Impossible! A glance over my shoulder told me we might as well have been trying to run underwater. The hyperkinetic facehugger platoon covered the yards between us like brush fire. Marines! Matt Cormick saw the same thing. He skidded around to face the hair-raising sight. Despite every instinct of self-preservation instilled in humanity since the dawn of time, he and Carmichael scraped the stops on either side of me. Even Edney, wounded as she was, shook off the support from Bonnie and Clark and ordered, Keep going. Clark pushed Bonnie, Axel, and Mark in front of him. Faster. Formation. Matt Cormick bellowed. Corporal Edney cranked around, using her acid-burned right hand to support her weapon, and brought it to her shoulder to be fired by her left hand. I saw the pain reaming her face and admired her tremendously. The three marines came to meet each other and adjusted their stance to put all of us behind them and themselves in a perfect line, ten feet abreast of each other. I didn't understand why until an instant later, when the chittering fingers of the facehuggers became maddeningly close, rushing along the ground and jumping from pillar to pillar, covering ground shockingly fast. The whipping assault was almost upon us. I couldn't shoot over my shoulder, or I'd hit one of the marines, so I stopped and braced to take aim. I never got the chance to fire. Ready! Matt Cormick shouted. With the courage of training and of spirit, the marines set their weapons on their targets and somehow waited for their commander's order. Volley! Matt Cormick called. The marines engaged their enormous guns. Foam crack! Three arched waves of electrical energy in a blinding neon orange blew from the Marines' weapons and shocked the flank of facehuggers. The wave actually rolled back a few feet. They were frying in place. Volley! Matt Cormick shouted again. Foam crack! Volley! Double! Foam crack crack! With each volley the blinding orange energy wave drove the facehuggers back another fifty feet, buying us time to run. We made it back to the middle of the camp, jumping over the swaddled corpses and zagging between the huts toward the ship. The chittering sound faded back, then began to surge behind us again. After the third volley, the marines broke formation and ran with us until they too were at the camp, where they again stopped and formed up, facing the nightmare. Matt Cormick's voice was the steadying force in the chaos. 
Flames. Fire at will. They uniformly clacked their weapons to another setting and opened up with streams of gas-fed flame, broiling the rolling ranks of creatures including the ones that were jumping from pillar to pillar. The creatures fell on each other, shrieking and raving, and began to tangle up and lose ground. Cease fire. Retreat and recharge. I stuffed my plows back into my vest pocket and skidded against a pillar. Matt Cormick. I called. Weapon. As the Marines caught up, the colonel instinctively tossed me Baru's heavy weapon. It rolled once in the air and with a long reach I caught it. The weight, despite excellent balance, almost took me down. Like theirs, it was a military-issue combination explosive-tipped percussion rifle, flamethrower, an electrical field dispersal cannon and a dozen other exclusive features for sensing and accuracy. I hoped on the soul of my favorite person on Earth, if I had one, that I could figure it out in time. The others were ahead of us now, gaining at least some ground. We turned again to stand our ground, this time with me and Baru's weapon added to the rank. Volley. Matt Cormick's command energized us all. I pulled the trigger. Out came a shuddering bolt of flame instead of the energy wave, while the others all managed to actually work the weapon properly and get the shocker component. I stopped, lowered the weapon into a thin band of sunlight, and found the control pad so I could reset it for the shock wave. Volley. This time I got it right. Foam crack. The mad alien squall blew into a wide roll of acid and flesh. Volley. Again we fired, each time driving the creatures back, but they weren't stopping. Unaffected by fear or thought, they simply replenished their dead with more from behind, but we were managing to slow them down and gain ground. Every volley force decimated the front line of the aliens and tangled those behind it as they stumbled into each other's fingers and tails. Their physical momentum caused them to knot up with each other's bodies and their long bones to snap in such numbers that we could actually hear the crackle. Retreat. Matt Cormick ordered at the right instant, just when I would have done the same thing, just as the alien scorpions rolled backward, stumbling into knots, following their advance. The four of us scratched into a full run. We could see the ship the ramp, Theo at the top of the ramp waving us in. My legs burned with the effort of running on the unforgiving sculch that brushed away under every step. Somebody hit me, something tripped me, what happened? I was on the ground. What happened? Something rammed into my chest, drove me down, left me gasping, aching. The marine weapon was still in my arms. I clung to it and tried to get to my knees. Why was I down? What had hit me? I couldn't think, had Matt Cormick kicked me in the stomach? Keep moving. Get up. It was Axel. Geeky and clumsy as he was, he'd come back for me. He nodded his fists into my vests and twisted me to my feet. I looked back just as I gained footing. The alien wave of lariat tails and spindle fingers were coiled in bundles on the ground between the camp and the ship. They squealed and tumbled trying to find their feet. Some staggered, then stumbled. Their bodies spat tendrils of smoke and tissue. Ahead of me, Pocket and Mark were staggering to their own feet. Had they tripped? Then it happened again, the big gut punch. This time I saw the flash of green energy. The ship's protection system. At least now I knew what was knocking us down and I could fight it. This time I stumbled back into a pillar the diameter of my wrist and it shattered with the impact. Fragments of glass, broken into pieces the size of pop cans, collapsed onto my head and shoulders and on Axel as he ducked beside me. This is so unfair, he complained. Colonel Matt Cormick reached us and pushed Axel out of the raining shards. Carmichael, volley. The two of them formed up and fired another volley. They were running on sheer training and determination. I knew they'd been punched hard just the same as I, and everybody. 
Between me and the ship, Pocket and Bonnie were dragging themselves and Edney up the ramp. I planted my feet under me in the detritus of the fallen pillar and tried to take aim, but never got the chance. Two facehuggers blew past me, racing toward the ramp. Maybe they didn't sense me there in my cloud of rubble, I don't know, but one of them launched itself into the air and slammed into Axel's face. I saw his face, his eyes, and gaping mouth at the last instant. He saw the thing shoot itself directly at him, saw it close on his face, the reaching fingers and whipping tail crowding out the landscape. He made a gushing noise of insult just before it hit him. Spinning, I aimed my weapon at it, but what could I do? His head was in there. Axel clawed at the creature as it snaked its lariat tail around his throat and took an anchorage. Stumbling, now blind, the sorry little man grasped at the bony limbs clamped around his head. I took the weight of the marine weapon in my left hand and coiled my right arm around Axel's waist. He wasn't limp, he was still staggering. I steered him toward the ramp just as another deployment of the ship's weapon turned the air green around me. This time it didn't knock me down. I felt the tingle on my flesh and grimaced at the burning sensation but I was apparently close enough to the ship that it let me come in while still striking the non-human animals with its hard charge. The charge must be heavier farther out, like the ocean ripple that would eventually build into a tidal wave. I dragged Axel as he began to lose the power of his own legs. I wrapped both arms around him, trapping him and the marine weapon inside, and could barely close my arms around both. We shuffled toward the ship in a weird kind of sidestep dance. The scent of the scorpion-like animal clasping his face turned my stomach. Its knuckles brushed my cheek as I tried to bend away, and there was a squishing noise as it tightened its tail and its fingers around his head. So tight was the grip the pink flesh of Axel's neck and his scalp swelled up between the fingers. He went even more limp just as my foot touched the ramp and another hammering of energy blasted from the ship's spine above us, blanketing the curving rank of facehuggers with another paralyzing strike. They curled into frying masses, and finally those who hadn't yet come into range gave up, rolled into tumbleweed, and unrolled running in the other direction. Finally, finally we had turned them back. Axel collapsed in my arms and went completely limp, unconscious, without the slightest muscle tone. I lost my grip on him halfway up the ramp, but by then Matt Cormick and Carmichael were there to take over. I turned and fired one more orange volley at the retreating scarecrows and crawled up the ramp. Theo cupped my elbow and pivoted me all the way inside, then hit the ramp controls and the ground disappeared beneath me. The huge metal ramp clacked shut and locked itself with a musical chon. The landing party gasped and rolled in agony around me, still hammered by the protection bolt and just plain horrification. I fell to my knees beside Axel, then recoiled at the nearness of the facehugger still clinging to him. Bonnie and the others, even the marines drew back, away from the awful sight. Axel lay on his back, arms straight out, limp. The thing on his face was very much alive, tightening its noose around his throat and tensing its fingers around his head, as if it knew we were here and would challenge its catch. Panting hard, Matt Cormick pushed himself off the ramp gears he was leaning on. He swung his weapon around from behind his leg and put the muzzle squarely on the spine of the facehugger. No! I shouted, but the weapon discharged a percussion blast that exploded on contact. The facehugger and Axel's head were blown to soup. In all my years of homicide investigations, I never saw that much blood. It sprayed out in a flat red streak along the entire walkway back to the bay hatch and took with it the green acidic fluid and tissue that an instant ago had been a victorious little cockfighter. God! Bonnie screamed. Clark belched Jesus, Matt Cormick. Jesus! That was slaughter. It was mercy. Matt Cormick spat back firmly. This is the standard procedure. We will terminate anybody who gets wrapped by one of these things. There's no cure. No other course. 
You can't do this on my ship. Clark protested. Matt Cormick lowered his voice very deliberately. I'll do it anywhere and everywhere, Captain. He lowered his weapon and wiped his face on his sleeve. Anywhere and everywhere. Clark trembled as if Matt Cormick had actually physically slapped the sense into him. We all stared at the remains of Axel's detonated head and the stringy remains of the creature that had doomed him. Torn tubular parts of it were still moving, still searching, probing along the cold metal deck. In that red streak of blood and skull fragments and brain tissue lay huge volumes of information about the ship's computers and all its intertwined systems, and the memories of a reliable shipmate who didn't say much, but could do much. The loss was alarming on many levels. I stared at the gory remains of yet another person who had saved my life today, whose life I then had failed to save. Twice in one day. Clark shook his head, paced away, then paced back and almost fell over when he spun too quickly. Theo, he choked. Scope, will ya? Theo, whose calm English voice I kind of wanted to hear right now, said nothing. He engaged a viewer just as the ship belched another bolt of its protective green broadband. We watched as a few determined Scorpio wigglers broiled in place while the last of those at the edge of the defense perimeter disappeared in retreat. Matt Cormick grabbed Theo by the collar. Where are Donahue and Brand? Did they report back? Are they in the ship? Theo braced against the Marine's big fist. No. No answer. God damn it. The commander threw Theo backward catching him on the ramp railing. God damn it. This, 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 this is awful, Clark mourned. It's clear we've got to get out of here. We're in over our heads. Those people must have had tragic ends, either they were implanted with the things that break out of the chests, or they were dragged away. He shook his head again trying to think, to compose himself. I don't want to add to the body count. Let's secure and prepare for launch as soon as we can deploy the poison packers. Let's just, just get out of here. Let's just go. Wait a minute, wait. I stood up and braced myself to stay standing. The researchers are still out there. Maybe as many as forty people. Aren't you watching? Pocket demanded. We barely got back to the ship, Clark countered to me. You said yourself they wouldn't have defended themselves and didn't have weaponry. We've got Marines, for God's sake, and we, we waved his hand at the twitching corpses of Axel and the creature. They didn't die in that camp, I said. They could still be alive. Add it up, detective. Matt Cormick's anger came out in a string of spittle down his chin. They're not even answering the hails. If you were stuck in this nightmare, wouldn't you rush to a possible rescue? You don't know my mother. Clark flapped his arms. Nobody is the pathological nut you're describing. Everybody is, I corrected. You're here. I'm here. And somewhere out there, they're here. My mother can cultivate a martyr from raw material in about two weeks flat. I don't know how she spots M. Perfume, maybe. He leveled a finger at my chest. They're here because they were dragged away by those. They weren't dragged away. They went on their own power. How can you be sure of that kind of statement? The huts are empty. The camp is empty. Because they're dead. They got dragged away by aliens. Did the aliens also drag away all their equipment? Sudden silence broke between us. In their minds they saw pictures of what I was describing. I saw in all their faces, in Pocket's squinty eyes, in Bonnie's sorrow, in Gaylord's fear, in Clark's desperation, the Marines' desire to go home heroes that I had struck them hard. The survivors went somewhere, I pushed, probably too hard. I should have kept my mouth shut. Clark pressed his lips tightly together, so tightly that his whole face screwed into a grimace. They went somewhere and died. You don't know that. 
They're not answering, Rory. You don't know my mother. This, again. You said yourself they probably didn't even defend themselves. They just let themselves get killed. But they might have found a way to survive. They were all survivors by specialty. They spent all their time in jungles and deserts and arctic shelves and in wildernesses where nobody in his right mind goes on purpose. You were too confident about being able to pull these people out quickly. You came unprepared. That's not a fair assessment at all. Yes, it is. You're not the expert here, Rory. You need to declare these people legally dead and let us get on with our mission to secure this planet for the good of humanity. I don't care about humanity. I care about this. I pulled out the wedding ring I'd hidden in my pocket. I held it up for him, and everyone, to see. Jewelry? Matt Cormick scoffed. A wedding ring. I took it off the woman who hanged herself to keep from what was about to happen to her. If you don't know what that is, you're an idiot. I wish to hell I could ignore all this, but this ring is burning a hole in my pocket. I care about one person at a time. I don't ignore clues. Clue? Pocket challenged. What clue? Like where's the dead woman's husband? Bonnie dared say, back on earth, I hope. Where we'd like to be, Gaylord said. Except for one thing, I said. She was pregnant. Bonnie blinked. Oh, that's right, oh, dear. He's here, but he's dead somewhere, Pocket insisted. His ponytail bounced in emphasis. I looked at him. Maybe. But I want more reason to believe that. I want to find the second encampment. That's the condition. If we find a second installation and it looks like this one, then I'll sign off on all human life. But not without one more try. You get paid for accomplishing something, not for dumping and running. Without my okay, all you get is your standard fairy pay. No big payoffs. You go home poor. I raised my voice enough for the whole crew to hear, all the people who had planned on this all-or-nothing get-rich-quick scheme. All of outer space was a get-rich-quick scheme, much to the disappointment of the adventurers and dreamers. Space had turned out to be an exclusive and expensive Old West Dust Bowl, and, lo, there wasn't gold in every stream. This was only my second time in space. Most people stayed on Earth. Some worlds were being terraformed, but it would take decades, if not centuries before those worlds would support flowering populations of any but the hardiest. The jury was still out on how successful the attempts would be. I knew that was why Clark was so charged up about being the one who landed the big fish, the golden planet we could move into without retooling. And these people around me were the sad hopefuls of space. The do-gooders like Bonnie, the workaday guys with one bright chance like Clark, the compulsive gamblers with big debts like Pocket, the guys who couldn't use their skills anywhere else, like Gaylord. When it was your only shot, a long shot was a good shot. They were the crab fishermen of the space age, those who could go out for a few months and make a fortune if things went well. If things didn't go well, then at least their families would collect if they died. The contract was also life insurance. But they only got the big bonus if the mission succeeded in its primary goals. Success, or at least its cruelest definition, this time depended on me. Damn it. I let the silence work for a few seconds as they contemplated our situation in all its prismatics. If only it could be somebody other than me doing the talking. If only somebody else would take over my thoughts so I could just go hide. And there was the other angle. None of them really wanted to abandon other people in this contaminated pit. I saw that behind their terror. I saw it as they blinked down at the hideous mess that used to be their weird little computer genius. How long had they worked with Axel? Who took care of him when he was sick, and who played cribbage with him during the long, boring, hours in space. 
Who among them had shared jokes with him and found a way to make the awkward fellow laugh and be at ease? Who had he helped when they needed a favor? And there he was, smeared to hell. To some of them he might be saying, get out of here while you can. To others, like me, he said, don't let this happen to anybody else. I turned to Clark as if we were alone. You want me to sign off so you can release those automated killers to exterminate everything that's not native to this planet? There's no goddamn way, Clark. I can't keep you from leaving, but you're not releasing those robots. If you do, friend or no friend, I'll file charges against you when we get back. I'm not just here for a family reunion, you know. I've been hired. I'm the company cop. Plancom doesn't want human lives on their consciences. It's a good company made up of a lot of hard-working people with families. They deserve not to have blood on their hands. I respect that. I like it, for a change in my life. It's why I took a job I didn't want or need. Personally, I wouldn't risk the clippings off my fingernails for my mother or my sister. I'm here for other reasons. I'm legally responsible. I'm gonna tell them you released the robots and if those researchers weren't dead, they sure are now. It's murder. That's the charge. Pocket rewarded me with a disappointed glower. He ended his part of the discussion by pulling a tarp out of a locker and spreading it over Axel. Gaylord was slow to move, but took the edges of the tarp and helped. Private Carmichael took Edney's arm and he and Bonnie disappeared into the ship, headed for the infirmary. Mark followed them. After a moment, Pocket and Gaylord also stiffly moved away. They, unlike my big mouth, couldn't find any words for this moment. Matt Cormick remained a few moments longer, looking from me to Clark, me, then Clark again. I knew he was thinking about his own missing men out there. His face limbed with bitterness, he snatched Baru's big weapon from where it hung on my shoulder, and he too thumped into the depths of the ship. Clark alone remained to scour me with resentment. He stepped past me, on his way to the next few minutes and whatever they would bring. Guess you don't care if it's our murder. What are you doing? Going out after my men. Find my live ones and retrieve my dead one. Matt Cormick hadn't taken long to decide his next course of action. In fact, I think he knew what he was going to do before he even left the ramp. Nobody wanted to lay eyes on me right now, so I was avoiding everyone. Hard to do on a ship, especially when I knew something had to happen, and fast if there was to be any hope for the two missing Marines. I found the colonel in the mess area, where the guests' lockers and weapons racks were kept. He was loading up. Grenades, shock sticks, flamethrowers, bloodhound sensor helmet, the works. I'd been aboard with this guy for weeks before the cryo sleep, in a period after, and far as I could tell he had no personality at all. He spoke in a series of short descriptions or orders. Otherwise his dialogue consisted of single syllables whenever possible. He never socialized with the crew. But neither did I, so, hmm. He packed armor onto his body with angry slaps and tugs, taking out his frustrations on preparation. I didn't close in on him, in fact stayed as far away as the narrow cabin would allow. He didn't look as if he could take much proximity right now. He also didn't radiate any desire for condolences, even though I was pretty sure he could have used them. Don't you think we should send out some remote drones first? I asked. Scout the area? We don't have the right kind of board. We didn't expect to have to search. Hindsight is so you can see what an ass you've been, I said. If we lose you, we're screwed to the wall. Edney's wounded and Carmichael's a kid. He's a Marine. Don't underestimate him. I saw him stop from a full run and turn into the face of those things. He stood his ground and still managed to wait for the order to fire. I won't be underestimating him. He's supposed to stand his ground. 
what we're supposed to do and what we do when we feel the fire on our faces are two different things. He snapped on a very serious-looking cartridge belt with some kind of armaments I hadn't seen before. You did it too. Only after I saw him do it. And you. Even Edney, wounded. Go away, detective. I don't want to talk to you. Yeah, I know. Who's going out with you? You volunteering? I'd rather not. Good question. What was I probing for, exactly? Yeah? He slammed the locker shut and thumped around to face me, peering at me from inside the perfectly fitted helmet. Well, you'd better. You're the one who wants to do the snooping around. If you don't go out there, you'll never know for sure. Seems to me, after that performance at the ramp, you better have the guts to find out. A clunking sound behind me almost scared the skin off my neck. It was Carmichael, in full combat gear. Ready, sir. He had a little boy voice and little boy eyes peeking out from that helmet. Made me sick. You're taking this boy out there? Matt Cormick's eyes turned to angry slits. He's a Marine. My eyes shifted between him and Carmichael. I would have said more, except what choice did he have? Baruse was dead, Edney was in the infirmary, and Donahue and Bran were missing. Missing? How could they just be missing? The ship's defensive shock weapon worked, we knew that. No living creature with DNA other than human DNA could get inside the perimeter. All the Marines would have had to do was run back up the ramp. Theo was standing right there to open it and close it after them. Constant presence in the ship was mandatory. I thought back to Theo's call to the landing party. He had said something was going on, the marines were missing, but he said nothing about the ship's defense lighting off or any other outward sign of trouble. He'd have mentioned that, wouldn't he? I know I'm going out, I told him. I'll do my own dirty work. I need some protective gear. Can I have? My gesture toward his red body armor suit was less than decisive. He just stared at me as if I'd asked to wear his personal jock strap. Got any spare issue? I requested. Inwardly smoldering, well, actually outwardly too, he bit his lower lip to bottle his fury and kicked the locker. When he was done abusing it, he opened it and pulled out a red padded combat suit. Put this on. Take Baru's HPB. You already know how to use it, what the hell? I fumbled some, but finally found the way to get into the suit. I had to take off everything but my underwear first, it was body tight and form fitted, almost like an exoskeleton, lightweight, but strong. Strong enough against acid? They should have sent synthetics or robotics into this situation, urban environment, canyons, grottos, like a hollowed, out hive. Whose bright idea was it to send human researchers? Nah, never mind. I just answered my own question. How are we going to avoid another stampede by those scorpion things? I don't know. He buckled and belted, snapped and booted himself into additional protective and assault gear. Maybe by going out right now, after they've been stung, I guess. I don't know. How far will we go? Wherever it takes to get to that second disaster you want to confirm. You set up the rules, not me. Hope you like M in action, pal. Don't know what I'll like, I said. Not here to like anything. One of the marines stomped into the locker area, and only when he cast a mighty large shadow did I realize it couldn't be Edney or Carmichael. It was Clark dressed up in one of those protective suits. He said nothing to me, but that didn't stop me from whirling around and catching him by the elbow. What are you doing? I asked. Why are you wearing that? What do you think? His voice was raspy and worn. You're not going out there again. What do you think, Rory? I have to go. I have to earn my big bonus, remember? Pal? 
I didn't mean anything like that. Doesn't matter what you meant, does it? Why don't you let the Marines and me handle this? We'll go out after the other Marines and I'll dash. Why you? You're just along for the ride. Come on. I'm the legal officer. I'm also a cop. It's my job to take risks for somebody else. This isn't Milwaukee or Chicago, he said. You're not a cop here. Believe me, don't I wish. Well, then take a nap or something. Aware of Matt Cormick over there putting things on himself and checking his suit, I didn't want to embarrass Clark or diminish his authority. Still, I didn't have time to train him in urban warfare, either. It's a bad idea for you to go, Clark, I said, flat out. You're a real catalog of bad ideas today, aren't you? The ship needs you, I pointed out. We can't lose the captain. We can't lose anybody else, he insisted. I'm not stupid. I made sure everything can happen without me. Theo, Gaylord, Barry, and Mark are all capable of launching and getting the ship back to Earth. If a ship can't function without its captain, the captain isn't very good. Knowing I was bound to lose this round, I pressed anyway. Why don't you just let me do what I know how to do? If you go out there with us, I'm going to be concentrating on protecting you, whether either of us likes it or not. I don't want to concentrate on you. I only have these two eyes. So don't go out. He knew what I was talking about. The details didn't need saying and the point didn't need repeating. I'd bullied him, I'd guilted him, I'd shamed him, and now he was paying me back. Fine, I said. I turned back to the locker, yanked off my jacket, and tried to figure out the red body armor. Clark kept going out into the bay. Matt Cormick snapped a buckle very loudly. He was shaking his head in annoyance and disgust. No time like the present. I dropped my trousers and pulled on the tougher, tighter pants of the marine suit. Colonel, how are you at taking advice? Like what? He grunted. The retrieval. Give it up. His narrowed eyes scraped me. What? Leave Burroughs where he is. He belongs to this planet now. If you lose more people trying to retrieve a body, you'll never forgive yourself, any more than they'll ever forgive me now. His glare was utterly cheerless. The blue eyes were pure ice. Other than a slight twitching of his compressed lips, his thoughts were completely masked. When he spoke, I think he surprised us both. Me, anyway. Yeah, all right. It was a big step, agreeing to leave the fallen behind. Some of us, field officers, soldiers, cops we just didn't like giving the bad guys the satisfaction. And we wanted something to bury. For the mothers, you know. For the kids, so they could see that we care. I admired him for giving it up. Sentimentality is hard to abandon when it's all you have. Here he was, in a situation he was supposed to be controlling, and he'd already had one of his troops killed, two missing, and one wounded. He'd kicked the locker, but he wanted to kick himself. Or me. We dressed in silence. Then he checked my weapon, checked his, and I followed him into the bay. The land of glass was waiting. We circled the ship. Its big boxy body was completely out of place in this world of rose glass. It was dull, black, marked with logos and graffiti, painted with murals and silly pictures by crewmen who had victoriously returned to Earth. It was their reward. Their mark. And in space, it wasn't like anyone was actually seeing the ship. Kinda sad, really. As I circled the big dazzle painted body, I sort of wanted other people to see it and witness the graffiti of her many crews over the years. Big old ship, dependable and purposeful. She'd kept us alive in the universe's most hostile environment, space, only to have our lives suddenly at immediate risk down here. 
I thought back to the moment of landing and what a relief it had seemed to be to touch solid ground again. I followed Matt Cormick, with Clark behind me and young Carmichael once again bringing up the rear guard. We moved in a curve around the ship and spiraled outward, moving between the glass pillars, trying to keep our eyes on each other, which quickly became very difficult in the bands of prismatic light and shadows. I tried to keep track of them by the sounds of their footsteps on the sculch. Soon that, too, was almost impossible. Only a ten-minute search proved that the two missing marines, Donahue and Brand, were not in the inner areas of the ship's protection grid. We had no choice but to spiral outward toward the limits. Back at the ship, Theo once again stood waiting at the switch, ready to drop the ramp that had been tightly closed behind us. We'd heard of instances when these alien creatures had sneaked aboard ships. That wasn't going to happen to us. Soon I was as good as alone in the glass forest. The red pillars with their gauzy hats laughed at daylight. I might as well have been in a basement with one lost light bulb trying to show my way. I turned one of the many non-corners and felt even more isolated. With the marine weapon pulled tight to my body, I tried to calm myself by running through the process for shifting it from projectile shot to flamethrowing to energy burst. That didn't last long. What invaded my mind instead was the vision of those spider-scorpion things rushing on their extended fingers toward us in a wide, flat stampede. I hadn't come here to die. Who had? My stomach was inside out, all my muscles twitching with strain of tension. Better be careful if one of our team came around the wrong way at me, I'd easily have sheared his head off before even noticing that I'd fired the HPB. I slid my shoulder along the trunk of one of the larger glass pillars, wider than an old oak tree on earth. The glass radiated heat against me just from the way it caught the sun's light. No that couldn't be right, this one wasn't in any direct light. I twisted to look up. The sun wasn't touching this pillar at all. Could the glass somehow be holding heat? Maybe it wasn't glass at all? Daring to take one hand off the HPB. I pressed my palm to the ruby pillar. Heat, there was heat inside. More than in the air. So they did hold heat somehow. They weren't ordinary glass. As I felt the glass, I took another step. The long darker striations deep inside the pillar suddenly came together into a single form through the prism effect. I froze. There was someone on the other side of this pillar. Something? The red glass cast a distorted form through itself. Elongated and thin as if seen in a funhouse mirror, the shape was taller than I was. My heart came up into my throat. Above the stumpy shoulders, there seemed to be a head. Round like a human, not elongated like a zucchini. But was I seeing from the correct angle? If the head turned, would it elongate? Was it a trick of reflection? My hands turned suddenly cold and trembled all the way to the elbow. I wanted to call out, to see if the being answered with Clark's voice or one of the Marines. Years of experience in city streets held me silent. Calling out to your partner could get one of you killed. Never give away your advantage. Especially if all you have is the one. In an instant of dread, I realized I was leaning back on the glass column, putting my weight against it. Bad, if I had to move. And my boots were in the crunchy grom litter. I tried to shift my weight forward, to stop leaning, without moving my feet. The trillions of broken up skeletons was to the enemy's advantage. My own boots would give me away, and I couldn't think of any way around that. The dark form wasn't moving, or was it? The light kept changing, the shape flickering. Think. My lungs hurt. Jackass. I was holding my breath. It was the worst thing I could be doing. Now there was no way to avoid a noisy draw through my nose or mouth to start breathing again. I formed my lips into an O and very slowly drew as silent a breath as possible. Let it out, take another, my lungs started working again 
but it took half my concentration. The dark, thin form on the other side shifted in flickers of interacting light and shadow. Stay in sight, Carmichael. Mac Cormick's voice from over a hill nearly cracked my brain in half. They were somewhere up the grade. Where's Malvo? I didn't speak up. I hope they didn't call out or come down here looking. Mac Cormick was being smart. He kept his voice down, barely enough to hear. Captain Sparron, your location? Over here. Clark's voice was nowhere near the others, but seemed closer to me. That terrorized me. He could be walking into a trap. Adding to the terror was another simple fact. The form on the other side of my pillar wasn't any of them. Detective Malvo, sound off. Matt Cormick kept his voice down, but if I answered we'd both be compromised. Petrified, I had to either move or get the shadow to move. If I didn't act, Clark or one of the Marines could come stomping down here into a trap. Slowly I unstuck my left hand from the weapon and scooted my butt down the glass pillar, down more, bending my legs without shifting my feet. With my clammy hand I scooped up a handful of the sculch. I took three short breaths. One, two, three, and threw the sculch at the next pillar, across the body of the dark form. When the broken skeleton bits rattled against the glass, drawing attention away from me and across the path, I jumped out under cover of the rattle and took aim. The dark form didn't move. I fell back against the other pillar, shouldered my weapon, and choked, oh, Christ. Christ. In front of me was the wretched sight of Marine Private Donahue, propped up against the pillar, pinned to it by the throat. Embedded in the poor man's neck was a gray-brown spike, driven through his throat and into the glass pillar. The young man's wide face was paste white, eyes beseeching the sky for help. One hand hung on the spike. His last few seconds had played out trying to pull the offender out. The spike was sharply pointed, then grew wider into a series of leathery spinal segments. It sloped down to a disembodied wound of its own. It had been cut off nine or ten segments down. It was a tail. Ah, no. Clark came around the pillar at the same time Mac Cormick and Carmichael showed up. Carmichael took one glance and wheeled away, nauseated. Ah, this is despicable. Clark shook his head and said, ah, for more times before he ran out of energy. Mac Cormick grasped the atrocious tail section with both hands, put his foot against the pillar, and yanked the spike free. Donahue's body jerked almost as if he felt the change, and he collapsed to the ground. With a heave of anger, Mac Cormick sent the tail section spinning off down a gully. We heard a faint crunch as it landed somewhere out of sight. Looks like he got a shot off. Sucking air through his teeth, Matt Cormick checked the weapon fallen at Donahue's feet. Must have cut this off just as it hit him. Can we get out of here now? Clark moaned. What about Brand? I asked. We can't keep collecting corpses, Rory, please. Clark, I wish you'd go back to the ship. Let's all go back. Please. No, Matt Cormick said. We keep searching, a little longer. The poor man was shattered. The image of the heartless soldier wasn't being honored here. He didn't have much personality, but he sure felt his losses. Everybody stay together from now on. The colonel didn't really seem to know what else to do, or what more to do. He fell back on his training, as I did. He turned away from the body of Donahue, to keep his eye on Carmichael, over there, shattered. Why didn't the protection blast go off? I asked. If he was killed while we were still down at the camp or the pod nest, why didn't it light off when he was attacked? Matt Cormick looked anguished. Guess we're just at the edge. It might be the landscape and all the reflections, Clark suggested unhappily. The ship might not be able to read, ah, hell, we're in over our heads. Give me that comm unit. 
Quaking with fury, I snatched the link out of his hand before he even had a chance to extend it to me. I thumbed the wide band and shouted into the link, much louder than was safe. Mother, this is Rory. This isn't right for you to do to us. We came to help. Speak up. Truth be told, I didn't expect to hear anything. I was ready not to. If nothing had come, I would have given Clark the confirmation he wanted. We were seconds from that. The comm unit began to hum and its indicator light panel flickered, signs that a signal was being broadcast and being received. Another crackle, and then we heard a human voice. My mother's voice. The angel of doom and the angel of salvation, all rolled into one phantom. Turn due north of your position. Come two hundred meters down the flume, then take the west fork another sixty meters. Hurry. They're moving toward you. Five. You know how, every once in a while in your life, you get the feeling that life really is alive and it has a sick sense of humor? When I accepted this job, the general mission statement was straightforward and seemed to solve a bunch of problems. I had to get away from a few things for the good of the department, let things cool off. Clark needed a legal officer for the mission because somebody had to sign off on the condition of the research team before the poison packers could legally be released to cleanse the planet of all alien DNA, and Clark personally wanted my help dealing with my mother and my sister, who were not the two most compliant women in history. My presence on the Vinza seemed to be a good thing all around, and when I agreed to come along, the mission didn't seem as if it would disturb my life much. We'd be in cryo a large portion of the time, then a quick in and out, and more sleep to get back home. By the time I came out of the months-long hideaway, the storms of my actions would have blown over. Not that there was so much to disturb. No girlfriend, a job, but not a career, taking every day as it came. The best part of my life had been the three bitter, frustrating years tracking the murderer of my fellow officer and finally catching the guy. Of course, that was when my real troubles had begun. Everybody was on my side except the law. What could I do? Fight that which I'd spent my life defending. I didn't want to fight. I was guilty and I liked it. Some things need doing. I tried to be remorseful, but it was like trying to make yourself throw up when you just don't need to. So I didn't bother. I said I was guilty. I wanted to take the lumps, but the department wanted to stick up for me. For that, the air had to be cleared and the lightning rod was better gone for a while. Here I was, wandering in alien land, lost as a baby chick. I'd come around a pillar and between two more, and now I couldn't find Clark or the Marines. We'd heard my mother's warning and followed it, moving down the flume but Matt Cormack had done his job and made us move with controlled retreat instead of rushing panic. We'd spaced ourselves out, with the Marines going first to sweep the area in case we ran into anything dangerous, then Clark after, then me in the rear guard. After two turns, I realized I was in trouble. I'd lost the sight of others in front of me. And I heard something. A constant crunching noise. I crept down a gritty slope, hoping not to fall or skid out of control. The sculch was dangerously slippery on anything but flat ground, as poor Barus had found out the hard way. Somehow I had ended up alone, which was the main thing we had been trying to avoid. I assumed it was my fault. I'd sneaked off after another shadow in the red glass. Go to your right, Rory. Five feet. There's a hiding place. Where are you? I asked, keeping my voice down. You turned down the wrong path. You have to hide. Get down on the ground. There's a slab you can crawl under. And don't speak anymore. The comm unit buzzed slightly. How could she know what was happening? They'd planted observation devices, obviously, but I didn't see anything mounted anywhere. That told me something, that the researchers had some idea the aliens might recognize a camera unit. There was indeed a slap, and I'd almost missed it. 
I dropped to the ground, discovering a flat dugout under the slab which didn't fit the rest of the path's floor. It had been dug by humans and formed perfectly to fit my entire length. I shimmied in, weapon and all, making sure to pull the weapon all the way inside with me and leave no clue. What about my footprints and the scratchings as I crawled in? I had to hope for the best. The crunching noise was louder now, and steadier. I stayed still and flat. I had to force myself not to shift or readjust, to press my toes into the sculch, keep my arms right where they were, despite the sharp ground pressing into me. My heart pounded downward into the planet. At my eye level, only four or five inches over the ground, there was a separation under the glass slab, through which I could see the path I'd just come down. The path crossed my hiding place and went off to my right, on down to unknown destinations. To the left was the way back to the abandoned camp and the ship. They seemed a thousand miles away right now. Too far to do any good, like Earth. I heard sounds loud enough now that I knew the source was within a few feet of me. Not footsteps, but the constant crunching noise, steady, but somehow varied. Many of the same type of sound. I recognized it after a few seconds, tires on gravel. Did the researchers have vehicles here? The crunching noise came around the pillars and up the path. Black forms rolled past. Each roll left a residue of mucus behind to pull up in strings behind it. The silvery strings stretched longer and longer, until the next roller came along and snapped them. I caught a glimpse of shiny armor and quivering lips not quite closed over silver teeth. Aliens, big ones. Adults. They moved only inches from my hiding place. I tried to keep my sanity by counting them. Three, seven, ten, twelve, I couldn't keep up. Couldn't concentrate past the slamming of my heart as it tried to dig underground and hide. They made a noise, these aliens, a noise other than the crunching sounds as they rolled. They made a soft hiss, uneven, overlapping. Respiration? Exertion? Or some kind of warning system to foolish beings who might be in their path? Like tank treads the aliens' flexible bodies rolled past me. Through my four-inch tall slit I saw their long, armored tails curled around in the shape of pneumatic tires, and how their zucchini heads fit into the slots of that bodily curve. I wished I could roll away too. Then a black foot came down only inches from my face, heavily cabled with long brown Dracula claws and a spike out behind the heel. It ground into the sculch, then moved on, sucking bits of skeletal gravel, then dropping them to bounce into my eyes. The one walking wasn't dragging his tail, the lower curve of which swished up close and bumped the glass stone which cloaked me. Dinosaurs. You're not very observant, are you, Rory? Not as much as you, I guess. Ma'am. Ma'am. Look at the difference. There was a time during early television and movies when dinosaurs were portrayed dragging their tails on the ground behind them. The hordes accepted the vision without question. That's what hordes do. Then, one day, an astute scientist looked at fossilized dinosaur tracks, I believe brontosaurs, and he asked the question any four-year-old should have been able to see clearly, where's the mark made by the tail? Since that moment, all images of dragging tails were wiped out. Dinosaurs were never again portrayed as sweeping great thick tails along the ground. We realized the tails were for balance and were never dragged. On that single day, all of science changed. All the perceptions of an entire ancient species changed in that one moment. Science always bends. Remember to bend. Yes, ma'am. During this brief expedition into the crazed fear reaction of a human mind, the last of the aliens rolled by and suddenly I was alone. Where were they on the move? What did beings like that travel after? Was there migration going on? Had they run out of food in one area and were looking for more somewhere else? Were they moving for food or for breeding purposes? 
where did this put them on the evolutionary line? I wished I were a scientist and could think of answers. Being alone was a hundred times worse. For a terrible moment I wished the aliens would come back so I would at least know where they were. If I stood up, tried to move on, would I run flush into them? Would I turn the curve of a pillar and run into Clark's corpse the way I had run into Donahue's? Would my mother speak to me again over the comm unit? Or would she change her mind and abandon me to my own devices? I honestly couldn't predict. In the worst case, I'd be alone out here. Clark and the Marines would be gone, discovered, dead. I tried to mentally pace my way back to the ship, the shortest way, and horribly realized I didn't really know the way. I'd followed Matt Cormick and forgotten to read the street signs. I thought I remembered the way back, two bends, a long stretch of downward slope, a bend to the right, or was it two bends, one left, then right? And weren't there tracks around at least three columns the sizes of buildings? God, I couldn't remember. If I went down the wrong track, made the wrong turn. Thinking of myself again. What about Clark and the Marines? If they were only a few yards away, also hiding, would I be leaving them behind? Even worse, if I skulked away, they might do what we were doing, waste time looking for me. I felt like a fool, like a jerk, taken in by a sense of honor that had never paid off once in my life. I'd had a chance to get the ship and its crew out of this mess and blown the gift of escape. There were too many ways to die down here, for sure. But there were survivors too. I'd heard my mother's voice. They were here somewhere, cloaked. Somehow I didn't feel all that vindicated. The silence almost drove me to screaming. I bit my lip to keep from calling out and running madly away in any direction until I dropped of exhaustion, to be covered by gauze and eaten by weevils. I physically fought to get a grip on myself and only partly succeeded. Five minutes passed, or was it twenty? Eight or thirty? I had no idea how long I lay there in paralyzing terror. Seconds, maybe. Panic isn't a good judge of time. No matter how I played with time, the aliens didn't come back. They were headed in some direction for their own purposes, not just roaming around looking for me. Still, I had no way to know their behavior. Maybe they had rear guards. Maybe I'd still be caught. Finally I found the nerve to shimmy backward out of my flat hiding place. When my head cleared, I almost dove back in, but managed to force myself to my feet. Maybe heroes get scared. I don't know. Don't care. Where are you? I hissed, caught between wanting to yell out and wanting not to make a sound at all. Answer me, somebody speak up, please, this isn't funny. No answer. I didn't dare raise my voice. I looked for footprints, but the black sculch revealed nothing but the telltale scratching of the aliens as they had rolled past. SSSSST. At the sound, which came from behind me, I spun and brandished my weapon, only to find there was nothing at which I could fire. Nothing but glass and sculch. But I knew I'd heard something. I knew. The prospect of being stalked shot through me like electricity and that pounding heart darn near stopped. The wall of pillars, almost a solid wall before me, rippled and shimmered with such vigor that I was sure my vision was leaving me. The planet's cape before me turned flat, turned two-dimensional, and began to separate from itself, coming apart as if it were being unzipping from the top. My eyes were blinded by a sudden blue light, completely uncharacteristic for the land and sky here, obviously artificial and harsh. I wanted to stumble back, but my legs froze and now I couldn't even see. I made another mistake, took one hand off my weapon to shield my eyes from the blue light. In that shameful instant the weapon flew out of my grip and I was defenseless. Forces grabbed me from both sides, both arms and I was propelled forward into a sudden coolness. The sheet of sweat on my face turned abruptly chilly and I fell forward, knocked flat by the forces at my sides. 
Twisting over onto my back, I lashed out with both feet and nearly panicked when my weapon was yanked out of my hands. It's okay, Rory. Rory, stop. Stop. Knock it off. Clark's voice. He sounded okay, in some control. My eyes cramped at the blue light and the sudden dimness around me. Somebody hauled me to my feet. Clark leaned on me from the right, and total strangers from the left. I shook them off. We're secure, Rory, Clark told me. We're in a blind of some kind, hidden. We're completely masked. Did you see those things that went by? I shook my head, as if that would help my eyesight. They weren't five feet away. I saw them. Big suckers, aren't they? Where are the Marines? We have them in our south blind, down the hill, one of the strangers said. Hi. I'm Neil, the camp director. I blinked and focused on a bald head, bushy blonde eyebrows, and thin lips. Camp director? What is this thing? I asked. What are we inside of? It's a specialty cloaking hideaway, Neil said. Our secondary campsite. The drapings of the camp are made up of thousands of micro-projectors that broadcast constant video of the landscape. It also masks sound and light. It's a good thing you moved close enough for us to pull you in. We don't want to give our position away. Who's we? I asked. I pushed Clark aside to look, as well as I could manage, at the people who had until now been mysteriously absent. The researchers of the Malvo Special Observation Expedition Team. And there they were, seven, eight of them, standing before me. Like toddlers or gorillas, they gawked at me without the slightest social restriction. The rangy gaggle of researchers were all dressed in worn khakis, torn red rags in the shape of ponchos or some kind of neon blue jumpsuit that I didn't recognize as field gear. How anybody could skulk around on a red glass planet in a blazing blue suit, I had no idea. Several of them wore those bracelets and anklets made of the glass beaded macrame I'd seen on the body in the hut. And here they were, bearded, scruffy, beaded, hair grown out, no combs in sight, faces pale from lack of exposure. Like missionaries living in a remote jungle tribe, they'd gone native. And right in the middle of them, as if standing a post, was my sister. For a second, I didn't recognize her. Her hair was twice as long as the last time I'd seen her, and braided in three long strands, one hanging over each shoulder, and, as she turned to glance deep into a man-made corridor to her left, another braid down her back. Rebecca of Scary Brook Farm. Gracie, I said. Hey. She scoured me with cold eyes. You're out of your mind to come here. You too. Where's ma'am? She's on her way from the south entrance, with your clunky asshole clubfoot trigger happy military hitmen whose lives we just had to save at our own expense. I sighed in relief. They're not dead? How many? Two. And they should be, along with you and your klutzy pal, here. She gestured at Clark, who dipped his head in embarrassment. Only two. There were three Marines out, Matt Cormick, Carmichael, and Brand. Where are they? Right here, sir. Private Carmichael's voice drew my attention to a man-sized opening in the blind's back wall. This whole room, which seemed like a central gathering area, was maybe twenty feet by twenty, probably made to fit a natural opening in the cave formation. My mother was always good at making use of existing land features. There were three tunnel openings, leading off who knows where. The place didn't seem all that secure, shielded from the dangerous outside by basically a high-tech curtain, but then survivalists learned to be comfortable with flimsy cloaks. Carmichael came out first, grinning with fascination at our surroundings, then Matt Cormick, and right beside Matt Cormick's big overdressed bulk was the diminutive and yet dominating form of my mother, the elegant and attention-commanding luminary Jocasta Malvo. 
she was smaller than I remembered. Growing up with her, she'd always seemed about six feet ten. One day as a teenager I overtook her and discovered that she just acted tall. Walked tall. Made people believe she was tall. She had golden hair done like an old-time movie star, shoulder length and off the brow. She was one of those people whose bone structure and complexion, the set of her lips and brows were classic enough that she could step out of a sauna, half melted, and look stunning. Everyone in the room became very still, as if royalty had entered, and she played off that. Being the center of attention was her best thing. Her glamorous and gracile elegance came out in a magical charisma that made people want to be near her and yes her and somehow chip a word of approval from her. Even unadorned in this wilderness environment, she was striking. Face to face with her, I was suddenly eight years old again. You wanted him, Gracie said to her. Here he is. Now how do we get rid of him? Our mother never took her eyes off me. Her expression was complex, a combination of nostalgia and dismay. She spoke in that scholarly and slightly removed Quebec accent that was almost not there at all, but just present enough to punctuate her words with a Frances patina. Graciela, she lubricated, be more welcoming to your only brother. Gracie shrugged. Yes, ma'am. Our mother created a special zone for herself as she moved forward through the gaggle of researchers, to approach, but not too close, me. Rory, she began. Are you well, dear? Ma'am, I greeted flatly. Why didn't you answer our hails when we first arrived? She tipped her head. Anger at first sight. We've lost people already. They'd still be alive if you'd spoken up. We don't run the wide-range transceivers unless we have to. We've been in seclusion for months. Why waste the energy? And nobody heard or felt the ship land? Actually, no. We were napping. I sensed Clark and the two Marines as they measured every nuance and decided I couldn't win. She'd have an answer for everything. Well, roll everybody out of bed and give me a head count, I said, because we're leaving now. We have to launch soon, Mrs. Malvo, Clark instructed without embellishment. Every additional minute on this PLA net is risky. The sooner, the better, she agreed. But you won't be making any actions outside the blind yet. The Xenos are on the move. You have to wait until after sunset when they go underground for the ambient radiation during the cool night. Then, we'll be happy to accommodate your hurry. Your appearance here has compromised our work. How's that? Your clumsy arrival has risked our carefully constructed veil of secrecy and stir up the local population of animal life. We've been in ideal seclusion for many months, Captain. Time and great care have been taken to retreat into the environment so efficiently that the Xenos have forgotten we're here at all. Unable to find us, they ultimately went back to their natural behavior and we've been able to study them interacting with each other instead of. How many of your team were killed, I interrupted, before those creatures ultimately went back to nature? My mother's sophisticated eyes narrowed slightly, as if scolding me. The look was too familiar. Your ship's landing and your crass actions have tipped them off to our presence here. You've disrupted months of exacting behavior on our parts. We've learned to completely disguise our presence. I want to know, and right now, how many out of the original 52 are still alive? Tell me now, ma'am. This isn't a visit. She paused. You'll interpret the information negatively. You're avoiding the inevitable. It's my responsibility to avoid misunderstanding of our work here. There are always casualties. How many are dead? Ma'am, Gracie uttered. I couldn't tell whether she meant to encourage or to warn. Nine, my mother said. We've lost nine. The same nine we found at the camp? That nine? Her cheeks flushed, but only a little. 
I thought I might have caught her in a lie, and watched the others as a barometer. Nobody else flinched. I scanned them quickly, looking for bad poker faces. Nine, she said. How did they die? We saw what happened to the bodies inside the huts. How did they get caught so quickly? And what happened to the ones outside? They made mistakes, she told me openly. This environment takes getting used to. What kinds of mistakes? We need to know right now, so we don't make them. My direct questions bothered everybody, I could tell. This wasn't the socially approved norm, where you walk in and take a while to get to know what's going on and gradually inquire about a few things at a time. Her followers were shocked by my grilling of this iconic woman whom they so completely respected and whom they asked for permission to ask a question before asking it. My mother kept her cool, though I could sense the seething fury below the surface, only by experience. Our chemist, Amelia Forbish, went out without her scent masking. Donald Kent and Richard Hochleitner went out after her without checking the area first for stalkers. Several weeks later, Samantha North tried to make an impression upon us by setting up more video feeds than she had been assigned. She was always too bold. Nico Refinado went out alone after we made a policy of a buddy system. He never respected them enough. He made mistakes. Then he made one too many. It goes on like that. I will give you all the information you need for your records. You have no cause to cross-examine before there has been an examination. She was good. I couldn't think of a response. It's hard to grill a person who is seeming to cooperate. The arrival of your ship has compromised our work, she went on. Hiding will be much harder now that you've tipped them off. We made hiding an art. A way of life. If you'd kept away, we could have gone on for years. Now we have to deal with this setback. Unfortunately, we do have something of yours. She turned to a very large bearded gentleman with a decidedly Bigfoot countenance, Zaviro, show them. Bigfoot glanced at Clark, at me, then Matt Cormick and Carmichael. You sure they won't get mad? Well, of course they'll get mad, dear, Mom said soothingly, but logically. Go ahead. They won't be mad at you. Could this prehistoric locks actually be a scientist of some kind? Or was he just a bouncer? Just don't want anybody to be mad. Zaviro stomped to a storage area with several tote able containers with the same footprint, many covered with black tarps. He pulled back one of the tarps with a swish, like a magician's assistant making a dramatic reveal. There, on top of a group of unevenly stacked containers, lay Marine Private Brand, dumped there on his side. His eyes were closed and his mouth slightly open, as if he were sleeping. He wasn't. Around his throat was a long, segmented, whip-like cord, very familiar since we just had a few hundred of them whipping at us during the crawler stampede. At the end of the garrote hung a dead face hugger, its fingers hopelessly broken in several places so that they splayed out in every unlikely direction. Clark moaned. Another one. How did this happen? Matt Cormick demanded, boiling with rage. Did this thing kill him? We think they killed each other, my mother explained. He must have been a very good soldier to break all its limbs while it was strangling him. You should be proud. Matt Cormick grimaced in bitter dismay. He seemed tragically helpless. I stepped closer, but Zaviro suddenly moved to block me from getting too close to the body. He seemed to want to protect the dead man from disrespect or disturbance. Where was he found? Inside or outside the ship's protection grid? We know nothing about your ship's blasters, my mother denied. He was found at the bottom of a gradient. He seems to have fallen while fighting for his life. He almost tumbled right into one of our holographic projectors. It would have been a disaster for the rest of us if he had. He could have compromised our entire southern blind system. Gracie, it's time for dinner. 
Oliver, make sure we have enough for our guests and that they have a chance to clean up. I'm sorry there's neither water nor is there hot food, but we can offer cleansing methods and sustenance. We eat only indigenous plant fibers and curds. We take protein supplements, but there's no cooking because of the chance of compromising our scent masks. Clearly disturbed and out of his element, Clark fell back on his responsibility as the flight captain of this mission. I felt for him as he cleared his throat and forced himself to speak. Mrs. Malvo, I have a court order. Please, she said sharply. No discussions yet. We must eat dinner. You must understand, Captain, that we keep our sanity through our human social rights. We eat, we pray, we retain our humanity. You cannot go back to your ship until there is quiet in the countryside. Until then, please try to relax and mourn your loss. He will be disposed of in our way, appropriately, and in a sanitary manner that attracts no attention. Oliver is our chef and will be serving dinner in 45 minutes. A little spooked at my mother's ability to speak so fluidly of dead people and dinner in the same breath, Clark shifted on his feet. Well, I'll have to notify my chief mate about what's going on. You may not make any communication, my mother told him. The Xenos have methods of wave detection. We must not take that risk. Our lives depend upon silence. Your crew and the ship will not venture out on their own, correct? They're not supposed to. Clark eyed me. I made a little warning scowl. I knew he expected me to ask her about the people in the huts, why they were locked inside. I didn't want to play that hand yet. There was too much emotion involved, the image of watching each other go through the abomination of being used as an incubator for the ulcerous little alien larvae, or whatever they were, watching your friend's bodies blown open and the pests scurrying out to freedom. It was a wonder they hadn't all hanged themselves. Then, fine. They'll wait. She made some nods and motions to her staff which I couldn't interpret. Some people stayed while others disappeared through the three passages that linked this chamber to whatever else they'd built. I felt like I was inside a stomach. The dim place, lit by blue and white lanterns, was particularly unwelcoming. They seemed to settle down, but weren't comfortable with our presence. One by one they found some way to occupy themselves with whatever they did here to pass time, or work, or whatever. Matt Cormick and Carmichael stood side by side, looking at their dead comrade. Brand lay there on his side, guarded by Zaviro, in death with his assailant, looking horrendously like a child curled up with a favorite toy. One more for your count, Clark rasped at me. Hope you're keeping track. The chef, Oliver, and two or three others began to set up a dining table made out of boxes and panels. I found it a little jocasta-esque that they had a chef and not just a cook. She had an odd talent for glorifying the menial. I think it was a way to elevate people in their own eyes, make them think she thought they were more valued by her than they actually were. They obviously did this every night, like a ritual. There wasn't much chit-chat, but that might have been because we were here. Matt Cormick and Carmichael settled down in desolation and waited out whatever would come next. I watched all this for a few minutes, and decided to work the room. I started with a sad sack character with a bad left eye. His right eye did the looking, and his left one kind of went off on its own, but that wasn't what had drawn me to him. He was dressed in the red rags with some kind of glittering dust on them, which I assumed was some kind of crude camouflage not exactly the height of technology. Probably one of the first things they developed, and now it had become fashion. Or just comfort, like a bathrobe. The sad man just stood there uneasily as I approached him, and I flashed back to my days as a super skiway cop. Like somebody who didn't know why he'd been stopped, he seemed both guilty and bewildered. Hi, I said, as friendly as possible. I'm Rory Malvo. What's your name? He hesitated, moving his mouth some, as if he weren't sure it was okay to speak to strangers. 
Diego, Bacteriology and Virology. Funny last name. When he didn't smile or even react, I ignored my own joke and let him off the hook. Sorry about your wife. He blinked, first surprised, then perplexed, and soon looked the way you'd expect him to look. I pulled the wedding ring from my belt pack. You probably want this. He stared at the ring, but didn't take it. I had to reach out, nudge him, and place the ring in his hand. He simply stood there, looking down at it. Amelia dreamed of having an adventure for a honeymoon, he admitted. Starting our lives by doing something like, something, historic. You did, I told him. You had the guts to live your dream. One shoulder went up, then sank again. She died of dreams. Most dreams are dangerous, I said. You're not the first. He gazed at the ring until finally his fingers closed over it. Thanks for bringing it to me. I thought about going for it. I couldn't make myself go in there. Now you don't have to. I left him with his memories and went around a tall set of packed shelves to the next person. This aging bibliophile looked as if she lived in books and didn't know how not to. She was thin and flat, like a cutout. I could have broken her by tripping those spindly legs. Yet, here she was, chosen for some reason of value to my mother's discerning eye, and she'd actually come all the way out here. I wondered whether she or any of them really comprehended the kind of life they'd been offered, and were living out here. Had she talked to them about heroism and groundbreaking glory? About being the pioneers of science? No doubt. Something told me my mother had left out the unglamorous bits, like having to bury your own excrement and peeing into special containers for repurification later, then having to drink it. Then again, maybe she'd been completely honest and they were just jerks. Hi, there. What's your name? I asked. She was afraid to answer, so she didn't. Probably hadn't spoken to anyone she didn't know for years. Go ahead, tell me, I prodded. I have to check you off the list. I'll get in trouble if I don't. Help me out, huh? I'm Yuki, tech and data specialist. Anybody sensing a pattern? They each gave me a name, only one, and a specialty. Those are nice bracelets and the other beaded things there, I bridged. How long have you been making those, Yuki? Beading? I was eleven and a half. My aunt and uncle were hucksters. They had booths. Carnivals, shows, festivals. When I was bored my aunt showed me how to string beads. I guess I was talented guided by spirits, just had a touch. Because my hands always picked the right things, glass and stone, hemp. How did you know it was me who made them? Your fingers are stained pink with the glass dust. That's really good. She smiled, showing little white pointy teeth. Observant. You're really good. Have you been making much progress in this outpost? With the beating? Actually with the aliens. The Xenos? What do you do concerning them? I mean, you're not here to make bracelets, are you? No, she laughed a little birdie laugh. No, no. I mostly catalog the new data. Dates and information, numbers, microdata analysis, complex applications. I process it all with programming, do comparisons, log results. Crunch numbers. Keeping you busy, huh? Oh, yes, very. So do you get out much? Go outside? Oh, never. Never. I never go out. Really? Why not? I'd get killed. They won't let me go out. Protecting you, huh? Sure. The other tech specialist is gone. Gone. Long time ago. I see, so they need you. I'm very important. Bet you are. 
I might want to talk to you later. Would that be okay? Talk about what? Maybe you could show me some of what you do here. Oh. I don't know if I should do that. Well, we'll see. Okay? I left her, more disturbed than before. The idea that my mother would bring somebody like this woman out of the relative safety of Earth and lock her up in this bizarre clinic. I felt all my buttons pushing themselves. By the time I came around to a chubby, large-eyed black man whose age was indeterminate because of his porky face and body, which tended to distort a good judgment of age, he was already expecting to be next. He was slightly overweight, but I could tell he had been more overweight before and now had sallow, hanging jowls and wide but sallow eyes. He was tapping information into a computer module, but mostly he was watching me. I sat down next to him on a makeshift bench. Hi. I'm Rory. You're Jocasta's son, he said. He had a very friendly tone. When I first heard of you, I thought it would be stimulating to be your son. You probably are, more than I am. What's your name? Ethan. Crowd and Traffic Dynamics. Hey, that's great. I'm a cop, so I'm always grateful for good traffic management. What do you do here? I'm a traffic control technician. I analyze and predict crowd flow. Large numbers of individual components and how they move stadiums, highways, airways, pedestrians, traffic, crowds. Why would you be here, though? There's no traffic, is there? No crowds? I count things. I keep track of things. Like those scorpion finger runner aliens? How, do you know about? We were almost overrun by a stampede of them. He pushed back in his chair, both hands fixed on the edge of the table. You were? How many? Not sure, hundreds. How wide was the channel? I guess about 25 feet, why? He tapped his keyboard furiously, using nine fingers, because his middle finger on the right hand was missing at the knuckle. The stump had no bandage and was pink, but not red, so the wound wasn't recent. On the screen was a display of a 25-foot-wide simulated canal. He must have had hundreds of such visuals programmed in. And without my telling him specifically where we had been when the crawlers assaulted us, he still pulled up a display of the right place. At least, it looked the same. Might have been my memory playing tricks, but I didn't usually get things like that wrong. He tapped more, and suddenly the simulation was peppered with hundreds of little pencil drawings of the crawlers, once more racing at me. When the crawlers in front came through, the program automatically filled and more behind them. Did it look like this? he asked. It sure did. He looked at me with some emotion stirring. I've never seen them do that before. How many are there in your simulation? If it looked like this, about 700 to fill the passage and bottle up at that point. You can see on the simulation that they're not slowing down and bottlenecking but actually climbing up the walls and pillars to keep the same pace constantly flowing. They're working together, even though only one or two of them had a chance of implantation. Is that a sophisticated behavior, do you think? Very sophisticated. I'm going to write a paper on it. Do they always behave that way? I actually don't know. I've never seen them do this before. I looked at him. This is the first stampede? The very first. Really? Listen, thanks for telling me this, and I'd love to see more of your research when we get the chance. He shrugged and seemed proud. If Jocasta clears it. Oh, of course. No problem. He shrugged, jogged his shoulders, nodded. You are her son. I guess I can show you some things. I'd love to see what you do. Actually, I got the idea he was dying to show me his work. Isolated as they were, these people never got to show off. 
and there was that little added factor which I didn't fail to pick up, being Jocasta's son just might work to my advantage. Ethan was having trouble saying no to me, and had quickly decided to say yes. One by one I made my way through them. Oliver, the chef. Tad, stealth tech. Sushil, microbiology. Neil, the camp director. Rusty, a chemist with a Cromwell haircut. Paul, the meteorologist and planetary geologist. Dixie, biology. It went like that. One person, one specialty, not much conversation. They either didn't want to chit-chat, or didn't remember how to. Or something else. Zaviro, it turned out, was some kind of entomologist savant. Bugs. He couldn't spell his own name, but he was an encyclopedia on insects and arachnids, larvae and worms and their behavior, kind of like weevils and scorpions, right? The people I talked to were all in the nearest chambers, which apparently was two layers outside of the larger chamber where I'd been pulled in, and separated tunnel from tunnel by very exacting methods of lockdown. Not a sound would penetrate into the outer world, not a flicker of light, not a scent. Survival depended on very specific behavior, and generally the researchers didn't tend to move about any more than absolutely necessary. They'd perfected the method of sitting around without being fidgety. Rusty, the round-haired chemist, told me that they practiced yoga in order to gain calmness and resist shuffling about. Except for the immediate chance of death, this was like a weird spa or a zen retreat. He was among the friendly ones, anxious to be around us, but hesitant to talk much. My mother had given us 45 minutes before dinner, slightly bizarre behavior given the day's activities so far, but okay, maybe they had to normalize quickly in order to not go nuts here. I was determined to use every possible minute. I zeroed in on a sprightly oriental girl, or maybe Filipino, about 20 years old, with a china doll haircut and the figure of a boy. You're Chantal. Yes, hi. Zoology, right? and veterinary medicine. She forced a smile, then dropped it. I'm so sorry about your soldier friends. It's such a tragedy. Yeah, our captain's pretty shook up. So you're a veterinarian? Will be some day. I'm here to learn. What kinds of things are you learning? It's just amazing. We've been anatomically analyzing the xenos and studying them physiologically. I do most of the measurements and weights. How do you study them without exposing yourselves to them? Oh, we have specimens. You meant you've captured some of them? Alive? Well, we get parts sometimes. You want to see our collection? I'd love to. I started to follow her, then noticed that Tad, the stealth technologist who until now had pointedly ignored me, was also following me into the passage. I paused. Got a problem? Half hidden in long stringy brown bangs, Tad's eyes worked at being expressionless. No problem. Just going along. I thought he might be there to protect Chantal, playing the role of a big brother or a bodyguard. What the hell, didn't bother me any. I wasn't about to touch her. Chantal led the way through a bizarre maze of prefab tubular tunnels. They branched off from each other into a sophisticated anthill complex, some going upward, others down and others into curves. Sophisticated, yet still rough and spare. I was right about their following the natural cage structure. I had to be. There was no other way to set up something so complicated by digging all the tunnels themselves in a hostile area. This wasn't an engineering crew. They didn't have the expertise, the time, or the kind of environment where building would go unnoticed by the other residents, if you get my drift. The tunnels were oval-shaped, sectioned with ribs and connected by tough, flexible, and ultra-thin viflex. Fancy new stuff just developed a couple of years ago for space and inhospitable environs. 
The whole tunnel, all fifty or so yards of it by the time we came to another chamber, packed in vacuum-sealed envelopes could probably fold up into about a square foot. These on-site living and work areas, impervious to weather extremes, moisture-proof, and easily rearranged, could be shipped in a single standard shipping container and still house hundreds of people. This team had probably packed their entire living complex into one duffel bag. Didn't do much for claustrophobia, though, I'd have to say. By the time Chantal led me out of the tunnel, I was glad to be out, and glad to not have Tad pacing me from two feet behind, either. I'd had enough bad experiences in alleys that they weren't my favorite places. And then we came all the way out, and I wished I were back in. I snatched at my plasma pistol. Before me was a full-sized adult xenomorph. Arms flared, jaws open, it towered over us more than seven feet tall, its sausage-shaped skull turned sideways so the full profile showed itself. Long arms were down at its sides, slightly flared, its grassle feet spread for balance. Don't worry, Chantal said. It's stuffed. I'm also the taxidermist. She smiled in a pixie-ish way. I'm really proud of it. I've never done anything as big as this. Zat right. Overwhelmed by cold creeps, I slowly moved to the right, away from Tad, who paused there and stood like a castle guard. Not interested in him anymore, I circled the quite shocking presence towering in the middle of the chamber. As if the alien were the pivot at the center of an old-time vinyl music record and I were the edge, I moved around it, keeping as far to the circular wall as the limits of the chamber allowed. I wanted nothing to do with being near the monster. Yet, there it was, free for the touching, the looking, from its raptor claws to its coiled cable-like tail. In fact, the whole creature was a construction of exterior cables and armor. Its rib cage was on the outside too, as were two huge shoulder fins which looked like they might have evolved to protect the sides of that long, long head. Its back was mounted with several snorkel-like extensions that didn't look as if they were for breathing, but hardly seemed as if they would be for anything else. Does it swim? I asked. It could if it wanted to, Chantal said, gazing with adoration at her trophy. There's not much fatty tissue, so it might actually have trouble staying afloat. That is, unless its native planet has heavily salinated water that helps with buoyancy. I don't see any eyes. The visual mechanisms are inside its helmet. It doesn't have eyes as we know them, but it does sense visually. How well does it see? Compared to us? We're not sure yet, she said. All other visually oriented beings from fish to higher predators have binocular vision. These have a kind of band that goes from where its ears would be if it were us, around the nose area and back again. At least, so far that's what we think they see with. I gripped my plasma pistol as if it were a security blanket and gazed up at the monumental iron black creature. Well, that's, that's just, huge. The creature's enormously long skull was actually translucent on the top and I could see right through to a complex row of arched inner segments that didn't look like brain tissue, but like more skull. Ultimately the laws of circles worked to bring me all the way around to where the creature's mouth was turned to meet me. The pointed lower jaw was dropped to show a set of piranha teeth the length of my fingers, and showing inside them was some kind of square contraption. Is that a, tongue? I asked. That's not a tongue, Tad said, almost as if you were warning me. It's a second set of jaws. Really? What do you suppose it would need a thing like that for? We don't know. Seem to be a pattern here. Considering they'd been here a long time and doing all this studying, I'd heard more we don't knows than answers. How does it survive on this planet? I asked. Chantal seemed briefly confused. Survive? What do you mean? I thought about Bonnie. What do they eat? They have to consume, right, because they're energetic? The young have to gain mass in ratio to their growth somehow, 
and they use human bodies for reproduction, we were told, so if there aren't enough humans, then what do they do? That's how they spread, isn't it? With those face-hugger things they're young? Those aren't actually the young, Chantal eagerly explained. She seemed happy to be able to teach. They're the, more like sperm. They aren't the seed, but they carry the seed. They're receptacles for seed. I laughed, mostly to let off the tension of being so close to, that. Are you saying they're fruit? She smiled. Yes, I guess so. Once they implant the seeds, they die off. It's their only purpose. So they carry life, I said, but they don't live a life. She nodded, this time in silent thoughtfulness about what I had just said. So they'll use other animals, I went on, trying not to push her. Not just humans. Yes, they use the indigenous population of hosts. They impregnate a creature large enough to incubate one of their young. The smallest we've ever recorded was 28 pounds. That's just a rumor, Tad quickly said. It's not confirmed. Other animals? I asked for clarification. Oh, yes. Chantal bubbled. This planet is loaded with life forms. Haven't you seen them yet? We've seen the weevily things, but we haven't run into anything except the, ah, uh, I made a crawly motion with my hand. That's because the Xenos are on the move. Some of the native life has learned about them and clustered in the valley. We've noted a buffalo-sized animal moving in herds, and several types of homeothermic life and flightless birds, as well as a possible pre-mammal up to 28 pounds. We're not sure they're pre-mammals, Tad corrected. We haven't done much analysis. We've spent most of our time perfecting hiding techniques. We want to do the zoological research over the next year. Since you have this stuffed one, I began. Does this mean you were able to dissect one? Chantal tried again to speak. We did what we see, eh? We can't dissect them. Tad cut her off again and took over the explanation. This one died in an unusual circumstance. It was impaled on a glass spike when it fell off a cliff. Its body drained of the acid blood and its internal cavities were excavated by the blackies long afterward. We managed to clean and retrieve the exoskeleton. Chantal pieced it together with some other parts we had lying around. His eyes flipped to Chantal and he added, We just got lucky. Chantal stared back at him for longer than was necessary. I pieced it together. Pretty soon she'd just be repeating whatever he said. I wished I could talk to her alone. Then you didn't have much chance to really have a look at its internal organs? We have trouble with that, Tad said. Their blood, once it's exposed to the outside elements, turns acidic. There's hardly any implement we can use to touch it that doesn't dissolve. It's just one of the things we haven't figured out yet. Still, I prodded. You've been here a long time. Don't they eventually die of natural causes? Sooner or later you find roadkill, don't you? Chantal opened her mouth to speak, but Tad cut her off again. We haven't found the secret Xeno burial ground yet. I pretended not to notice the discomfort between them. Well, it'll be in the same place as the lost hangers and safety pins. After several minutes I was finally able to take my eyes off the astonishing presence of the stuffed alien, and my skin crawled when I did. I still had the idea it would come back to life. I had to force myself to look around the chamber. The whole room wasn't much taller than the alien trophy, and only about ten by ten feet, shaped in a pentagon, with five interlocked prefab walls. It was also a museum of alienhood. Much of the wall area was devoted to racks of file boxes, probably full of specimens of things I'd seen and things I hadn't yet. This was a scientific archive. I recognized it because we'd had three rooms like this in our house while I was growing up. We only had six rooms, and three of them were this. 
except in our house we didn't have parts of deadly creatures mounted on the walls. Almost as astonishing as the giant stuffed creature was the extended disembodied tail of another of its kind, cut off at a point that must have been very close to the body. The tail hung suspended near the low ceiling, extending all the way across one wall segment and halfway across the next. Its blunt end was mangled, but its serrated tip still intact and quite horrifying. Mounted on other parts of the wall were three alien hands, a foot, and an impressive collection of claws. There were also four siphon tubes, the snorkel things on their backs, the back part of a head, and two long squared off. I reacted with a flinch when I realized those were two sets of the inner jaws, somehow cleaved from inside the throats of two aliens. We don't want to examine dead ones, Tad said bluntly, determined to get me off that track, ironic considering the macabre collection. Before our expedition here, human experience with Xenos has been limited to the way they interact with humans. On this planet, we've been able to observe how they interact with other life forms. Where did you get all this stuff? I asked. Roadkill, Tad said. Was he making a joke? I decided to leave that one alone and go after the other angle. Do they do something different with other life forms than they do with us? No, Chantal perked up. They have the same kind of reproductive imperative. Chantal, Tad warned. This isn't your field of expertise. Sorry. I glanced from one to the other. So this is like spending years and millions of dollars to do a study to tell us that girls are different from boys. Anybody with kids can tell you that. Moving as far away as the chamber allowed from the alien trophy, I tried to steer the conversation my way. Well, this is all damned impressive, I have to say. Chantal, maybe you know this. I was going to ask my mother, but I forgot. What happened to the people in the huts back at that camp? Why were they inside there? We couldn't figure out whether they were hiding and just got caught by the face things, or, you know, what they would have been doing inside with the door panels just open a few inches. Were they in there for protection? Or maybe they were hiding from those things. I mean, who wouldn't hide? First they scare you to death. Then they finish the job. I gestured up at the enormous stuffed adult alien and implied I was making some kind of joke to see if there were any takers. Chantal blinked, but that was all the body language Tad's glower allowed her. We, we. She doesn't know, Tad said. It's not her area. I dropped the routine and turned to face him. Is it yours? Tad bristled. Jocasta warned us about you. She said you don't understand scientific research at all and that we shouldn't even address the issue with you. Yeah? What issues would those be? I moved closer to him. Intimidation is an art form. In about two hours, I said slowly, I've seen some pretty horrible deaths, as deaths go. This planet is a slaughter field. And no matter how many heads I count, the number comes up short. That's my kind of scientific research. I admit it's simple, but in it the questions can be almost as important as the answers. You're the stealth specialist, aren't you? I sure am. You'll have to give me a tour of the technology you use to hide. I'd really like to see that. I guess the only way not to be their target is if they don't know you're here. He paused for a spell, measuring me, measuring Chantal and the intrusion on their private territory that I represented. I don't think you'll be around long enough for tours, he said. Probably a big mistake, but I cut to the chase and cornered my sister next. I listened around, then followed her voice when I heard it, and tracked her through one of the shorter corridors to a cramped chamber where she was giving instructions to Neil. Odd because I thought Neil was the camp director and Gracie would be taking orders, not giving them. Then, being a Malvo carried some weight here for her too. My sister was an odd combination of a follower and a leader. 
she was a prime follower of a leader, willing to keep everybody around her in line behind the leader. She had the spark of science in her mind and her talents, but had always been overshadowed by her mother, always assumed to have gotten the degree or the job or whatever because she was Jocasta Malvoa's daughter. All her life, and all mine, we had been known not as Rory and Graciela Malvo, but as Jocasta Malvoa's son or Jocasta Malvoa's daughter. We each coped in our own way, Gracie by embracing the role, and I by rejecting it. I didn't fit into my mother's world of research, awards, expeditions, more awards, discoveries, and even more awards. In fact, I'd always found it kind of distasteful. Gracie always said it was because I was never the one getting the awards and I was bitter. On some level she was probably right. But on my own level, I'd always found the spectacle gauche and pretentious, especially the way our mother enjoyed the glow of the spotlight. I always had the idea she was making history so she could get another fix of that glow. Maybe I was wrong. There certainly wasn't much of a glow way out here in the hindquarters of space. And she'd have to go a long way back to get it. Gracie, I began. Can I have a word? She glowered at me, then nodded to Neil to leave us alone. He seemed glad to do it, and disappeared down a corridor I hadn't even seen a short one that went off upward and that he actually had to climb to use. When the scrapings of Neil's escape faded away and I thought we were probably alone, although I had no idea what kind of surveillance they used or how paranoid my mother was, I tried to modify my tone to be non-confrontational, although I did cut to the subject without any frills. You've lost weight, I mentioned. It's hard to stay fat on rations. Or is it from running? We don't run. We hide. Yeah, that's what I hear. What are those things, Gracie? What kind of environment creates beasts like that? A complex one, that's what. So what? You don't care. We don't know where they come from, do we? No. Clark says they hitchhike around from place to place. Apparently our own spaceships have given them a couple of free rides. I don't know, Rory. They're here. That's all that counts. I leaned against a thick case of processed, flash-dried foodstuffs. Not very curious, for a scientist. Come on, tell me something. She poured herself a tin cup full of iced coffee iced, so there was no aroma and tapped artificial sweetener into it. They're somewhere between instinct and intellect. Where? I asked. Like dogs or like dolphins? We don't know where they are on the line. We know they communicate, and we know they learn. And we know they forget. After five months of perfect hiding, they finally forgot about us and stopped looking. They went back to their genetic imperatives. But it took five months. That's a lot longer than any animal on Earth. They're smart. And this genetic imperative is to spread out? And continue sucking up the life forms on this planet? The planet will adjust. How many people have you lost? The question set her even more on edge than she was, but she tried to control her answer. We lost some right away, before we learned to cope. You mean... When you found out that Camp of Huts wasn't going to protect you from those monsters? Her green eyes flashed at me the way they had when we were children and she felt slighted by being the younger child. Yes, then, all right? Things don't always go right. This is a wilderness compound. We had a few accidents and then we got control. Just like you and the people you brought here today. You should all have known better than to come into an unstable environment without specialists. Maybe, I allowed. I didn't want to waste time arguing the wrong points. Where'd you find these people? They applied, she said. You know that. So did thousands of others. I folded my arms and fought off a shiver. They kept it too cool in here. Probably as a precaution to avoid putting off heat signatures. 
I mean, people like Yuki and Ethan and Zaviro. Do you really think they had a perception of the brutality of this environment? I wasn't in the screening process. You're talking to the wrong person. I know. I should be talking to ma'am, but I don't think I could get an honest assessment out of her. Actually, we don't have to talk to you at all. It's not your business to assess us or our expedition. I'm the only one who can, I stated bluntly. Most people get goggled at around ma'am. She casts some kind of superstar spell on them. I'm just wondering whether she didn't take advantage of that to surround herself with people she could control. As scientists go, they're all pretty young. Nobody old enough that ma'am couldn't be his mother. It's how she keeps authority, isn't it? She also has 20 years more experience than anybody here. That's good, isn't it? She snapped. Unless you're the inexperienced one. She spoke through set teeth. These are qualified professional scientists and interns with specialties of use to this mission. They willingly came. They knew what they were getting into. I moved closer to her and leaned in such a way that she couldn't avoid looking directly at me. Did you? She took a gulp of her iced coffee and made a throaty sound of disgust. When she swallowed, taking her time to do it, she shook her head in frustration. Nobody wants you here. Maybe, but that's not my problem. What is your problem, Rory? Because, damn. Maybe that I've only counted thirteen people here, I pointed out. Ma'am says you've lost nine. Where are the other thirty people, Gracie? They're out, she said instantly. On remote expeditions. When's the last time you heard from them? I don't know, few weeks. You don't know? Gracie started moving around the little room, picking up bundles of the neon blue suit I'd seen some of the researchers wearing. If I counted right, there were at least enough for everybody. She gathered them into a bundle in her arms, which got bigger with each suit she rolled into it. Why should I know? It's not my job. We'd go crazy if we tried to watch over each other too much. I don't buy it. This is a dangerous environment where people live intimate lives. They get to know everything about each other and every bit of information is absorbed voraciously. When did you become a psychologist? She snatched up another blue suit from a hook on the side of a shelf unit. You're lying and I want to know the truth, I said. Where, precisely, are the other thirty people? She pushed me away and made room for herself to slip toward the tunnel. Get away from us, Rory. Go away. Go home. Go, get fried or get laid or dig a hole or live your own life, but get off our backs. She dumped the pile of blue suits into a sterilizer unit and cranked the controls to turn on the microwaves that would do the sterilizing. It's time for dinner. And you'd better be respectful. We don't discuss business at dinner. Dinner was happening, near as I could figure, around what would normally be lunch for the rest of the universe. I didn't question it. I had other questions, and maybe they called it this because it was the main meal of the day and they wanted to normalize at least one parcel of each day. Why they couldn't do it in the evening, I had no guesses. In the twenty-foot-wide chamber which was apparently the central clearinghouse, the same chamber where I'd been pulled into the blind, they had set up a makeshift table made up of wall components on a trestle of long, narrow containers. They'd moved some shelves, making the chamber more like twenty by twenty-five, to make room for the extra people, and the table just got longer the more containers and components used. There were containers all over the place, each with markings and scratches and handles. Used for toting and storage, they were also used for furniture. Another interesting feature, the projector curtain which had saved my life and which separated us flimsily from the dangerous outside world, was no longer transparent. While I had been able to see through it to the landscape before, it was now on some kind of rest mode, looking pretty much like a big metallic bathroom shower curtain with little squared cells in the fabric. 
those must be the projectors. They could project an image on the outside, and project back into this area whatever was on the outside. Very fancy, as one-way mirrors go. Darkened as it was now, it created a neo-designer sensation to the basement-like chamber and made things feel more intimate, probably in deference to dinner. The campers had lit a line of electrical votives along the center of the table, simulating candlelight. Real candles would have created a scent. They'd managed to create a little living environment here despite strict restrictions on behavior, sound, and function. I looked at the fabric-like wall of special sheeting that masked the hideaway. It looked almost like a clear curtain from this side, except for a faint bluish tint, but I knew it wasn't see-through at all. We could look out, but no one could look in. I found it disconcerting to be standing here in front of what appeared to be a big open garage door, and I had to discipline myself to the idea that I wasn't visible from out there. Nope, couldn't relax yet. The curtain had no lockdown, but just hung there, slightly weighted at the bottom. Anything could walk through, if it knew where to walk. I stayed away from the long table as the campers went about their routine of setting up dinner. They didn't speak, except to point out what was needed, and set out sealable storage containers of various types of, I guess it was food. From here, most of the food appeared processed, dried, or distilled to an essence. Other than the colors, green, tan, reddish, I couldn't identify the food. They were all native edibles, to make sure that all bodily discharges didn't smell different from the environment. These things were no surprise. My mother had always embraced survivalism and guerrilla tactics, one of which was to eat only indigenous food, so body odor and discharges all smelled natural to an area. Soldiers had long practiced the trick to mask their presence. Of course, that meant the whole crew of the Vinza and the Marines and me smelled all wrong. I probably should have thought of this and told Clark well ahead of time. But then, we hadn't expected to take up residence. Still, I should have warned him. I'd been too casual, too much of an outsider. I should have embraced the mission and done everything in my power to warn him to inform him, make him understand what he was really dealing with. Should I speak up now? Be seen whispering to him in a corner? Or would that do more harm than good? We were already getting suspicious looks and touchy glances and cold shoulders. Hi. Neil, the camp director, and I would have liked to know what kind of directing he did, came around a stack of drum containers. Can I show you around? Okay. Maybe I'm too suspicious, but I wondered if he'd been sent by my mother to keep his eye on us. Would he show us everything or was there a tacit list of things he was allowed to show us? Yeah, yeah, paranoid. Maybe. I'd lived with Jocasta Malvo a lot longer than any of these folks had. Sure, Clark took up the offer. We're just standing around. What I'd like to know, I asked is how you knew where we were when you gave us directions to come down the flume. Oh, that's easy. Neil seemed relieved by the question. I couldn't interpret that. Not yet, anyway. The displays are right over here. He led us through a maze of stacked containers, stacked higher than I was tall. Inside a quartered-off cubby which could be seen from the dinner area but not from the projector curtain, was a seating area of three inflatable chairs arranged around a shimmering scaffold of viewing monitors. I counted 26 monitors, each the size of a lady's evening bag, each showing a different location on the landscape out there. The quality of the pictures wasn't very good, often tending to flicker or become grainy. The equipment might not be holding up to the environment, but that was just a guess. One screen showed the nose section of the Venza where she sat in her parking place. Another showed one of her stabilizer wings and part of her tail section. A third showed the camp huts where we'd found the dead people. So they'd been able to see us all along. A shiver ran across my shoulders, knowing that they had seen us and not spoken up. Rather than make trouble about it now, I kept my mouth shut. 
A glance from Clark made me wonder if he wasn't thinking the same thing. Other screens showed various locations I didn't recognize, pathways, entrances to caves, views from inside caves out onto the red land, views from halfway up pillars that looked down upon tracts of land. Some showed different kinds of terrain than I'd seen so far, more lush areas with brushy yellow grasses, high red and blue ferns, and stick structures that looked like trees in winter, except they were white, not brown. There was an unrestricted quality to these places, like children's drawings of places they'd never seen. How are you getting these pictures? We've been gradually installing video equipment throughout the terrain, one or two at a time. They're curious, but after a while they start to ignore the new installations. I made a sound of admiration. Must be dangerous to secure cameras in some of those places. Oh, it's dangerous. We lost six people just setting up the cameras. Six, huh? I might have pursued that, but something else caught my eye and stiffened my limbs. On four or five of the monitors, there were adult aliens moving along through a slight mist rising to their shoulders. They moved mostly in shadow, and in single file. Some rolled, some walked. Wow, look at him, Clark murmured. How close are they? I asked. Neil sighed. They're still in the vicinity, but moving way. That's the tribe that walked past you while you were under the slab. It's a good thing you hit the ground when you did. If they'd seen you, I bet they'd have found our opening here. Usually they don't pass this close. Are they migrating or what? Clark asked. Hunting? We're not sure why they're moving around so much. Usually they don't move much during the day. Lately they've been, hey, who's that? We followed his gaze to the upper right corner of screens. Two screens in the top corner showed movement. Humans, three of them, dressed in standard gear except for the single marine. It was Edney. With her was Pocket, the bosun, loaded down with a medical backpack, and leading the way was the last person in the universe that I had wanted to come out of that ship again. Bonnie. While we stood there frozen in shock that they had dared to leave the ship again and were outside the protective area, our horrors were confirmed as we saw, as we hid here in our protective nest, a single face hugger crawl up around the trunk of a pillar. After it, came two more. Then two more. The spider-legged fingers moved one at a time, a sight somehow even more ghastly than when they moved quickly. I grabbed Clark by the sleeve. They're being stalked. Six. Get out of my way. I shoved Neil aside, drew my plasma pistol, and veered through the stacked containers toward the projector curtain. Through it I could just see Bonnie step into the vicinity some thirty feet out from the entrance, on the other side of the slab with its low-lying hiding place that had saved my life. Stop! Neil called, but he couldn't hold Clark and I was already dodging for the projector screen. I see him, I see him. Tad came shooting through the east tunnel and slammed right into me. His neon blue suit made him look like a cartoon superhero. With strong purpose he knocked me back. Stay here. Fell with you. I found my feet and followed him out the projector curtain. Behind me I heard Clark battle with Severo and Neil, who were managing to stop him from following. I heard him shout my name, or part of it, before someone muffled his mouth. As I passed through the stealth curtain, there was somebody at my side young Carmichael, the baby marine, with his big ballistic weapon. There must be twenty things wrong with what I was doing, but I didn't take the time to analyze. I plowed out into the black drifty sculch and ran up the grade behind Tad. Carmichael was so close to me that my heels kicked the cereal-like sculch up into his face. He held his weapon in one hand and used the other hand to claw his way up the flume and keep up with me. I wanted to shout a warning should I dare? Would noise turn a stalking into an attack? During those moments between watching the monitor and gaining the crest of the flume, I almost had a coronary with panic. 
I couldn't see whether Bonnie and Pocket and the brave but wounded Edney had been hit yet and the suspense practically pulled my skin off. All I could see in my mind was Matt Cormick as he blew poor Axel's head off, along with the face hugger that had clamped onto him. The idea that Bonnie that Pocket. I ran harder, afraid that just our frantic scramble was trumpet enough to set off an attack. In my periphery I saw Tad pull a blue neon hood over his head, then all the way down over his face until he looked like a big blue posable artist's mannequin. That's when we heard the FOM crack of Edney's weapon being fired over the hill. It had started. I ran so hard that he and I crested the hill together despite his head start, with Carmichael, in the flower of almost teenage strength, right behind us. Only ten feet from us, Bonnie and Pocket were huddled against the trunk of a tree-sized pillar, while Edney fired away, round after round, tightly firing but each ballistic shot carefully and instantly considered. For facehuggers lay writhing on the ground, two of them blown in half while maybe a dozen others had appeared and seemed to know their cover was blown and were trying to rush the victims. Carmichael skidded to Edney's side and together they began volleying the energy beam. I fired my plasma gun, adding my short, popping blasts to theirs. I almost missed every other time because the face huggers were covering the distance now by jumping from pillar to pillar. Edney and Carmichael shifted back to ballistics and blasted away at the crawlers who got too close. Too close. Hell, they were all too close. Run. Tad bellowed as he tore right toward them. Because he was now in our line of fire, the three of us shooting had to pause. Get down. I ordered to him, but he kept running right for them pushing buttons on some kind of wristband on a pair of gauntlets he'd pulled on somehow between the blind and here. Head to toe, his blue suit began to glow like the sign on a cheap motel. Sparks flew from the suit. Each spark let off a second spark just as it hit its fizzle point. Tad snapped, crackled, and popped his way right into the center of the hugger phalanx. Just as he reached them, he tossed a grenade of some kind over his shoulder, which landed near us and exploded into a huge an, I mean huge ball of white stenchy smoke. There was a squeal, several squeals, which to my untrained ear sounded a whole lot more like anger than surprise. I didn't want to wait around to see how angry those things could get. Retreat. Edney called. Carmichael grabbed Bonnie and I grabbed Pocket. Bonnie tried to pull away. The ship. It's that way. No ship. Come on. Pocket gulped. Where? Don't argue. I took hold of his ponytail and cranked his head in the direction I wanted him to go, then put a knee in his butt to encourage him along. I cast a quick look behind us at the slowly dissipating cloud of stink and saw the huggers turn and flock after Tad who disappeared down a gully. The face huggers were after him now. Should I help? I shoved Pocket after Carmichael, Edney, and Bonnie, and stumbled for a moment at the edge of the stink cloud. Where had Tad gone? They were all after him, those god-awful things. Rory, let's go, man. Pocket called as Carmichael hooked his arm and pulled him away. Right. Reluctantly I turned and ran back toward the blind. Bonnie! What the devil in a bowl of spice are you doing here? Clark's voice boomed in the otherwise quiet hideout. The blind fell cold now compared to the outside, and it seemed dark to my stinging eyes. I stumbled in after Carmichael, to find Clark already confronting Bonnie. Pocket collapsed onto a box and sat there sucking air mechanically, while Bonnie, pasty pale with fear, blinked up at Clark. Neil and Zaviro made sure the projector veil was closed behind us. Tad's still out there. I gasped. He'll be okay, Neil said. He's cloaked. What cloaked? He was running. It's a distracting technique. Here, look. He led us like a gaggle of baby ducks to the wall of screens and pointed at a screen in the middle, which showed Tad in his totally blue glowing suit, 
now standing perfectly still in a grotto. He stood in the open, and around him a dozen huggers clawed and scratched at the ground, hunting and snooping, but finding nothing. Or at least, seeing nothing. Did they have eyes? Sensing nothing? Can they see? Clark asked. Somehow, they do, Neil said. It's more than just sensing, because they've been known to jump at people from behind glass, which means they see. Why aren't they seeing him? It's the suit. But he's standing right there, Clark pointed out. Somehow they can't see past the blue glow. We tested a whole bunch of spectral combinations. There are two they can't see. As long as he stands perfectly still and the projectors on the suit don't flicker, they'll lose interest. Bonnie shivered and hugged her medical pack. I can't believe he's standing so still. It takes practice, Severo said from way up there at the top of his body. Tad's talented. I fought to calm my aching lungs. What were the sparks? Those, they can see, Neil said. The sparking creates a movement, and they don't like the stink bomb, so sometimes we can get them to run in a particular direction. Sometimes? Neil wobbled his head. Yes, most of the time. Sometimes. Okay, okay, Clark began, and turned to Bonnie in pocket. Okay, I'm calm. Now, what are you doing here and why did you leave the ship against orders? Pocket glanced at Bonnie, then back to Clark. What do you mean, what are we doing here? Should I say it in Spanish? We got your message to come out, Bonnie said. A distress call. What distress call? We didn't send any. Bonnie blinked and faltered. Yes, you did. Somebody did. Theo picked it up in the scrambler. When we unscrambled it, we got a signal of distress with flash for rescue. Clark shifted his weight and hung his hands on his hips. We didn't send anything. Pocket, Bonnie, and Edney were mystified. We're not stupid, Pocket said. We got a signal. By voice? Yeah, but garbled. We couldn't tell whose voice it was. Male or female? I asked. Pocket rubbed the back of his neck. Huh. I'm gonna get to the bottom of that, Clark huffed angrily. He started to go toward the table, to ask around, but I pulled him back with a move so sharp that it drew attention. I waited a second, until that attention faded back. Don't say anything about it, I instructed. He frowned. Why in hell not? Just don't. Something's going on here and I'd like the chance to figure out what it is. Ah, there's just some screw-up and I'm gonna kill it. Does it hurt to shut up for a while? He paused, partly to calm down and partly to consider the fact that I was asking him to do something completely illogical. He trusted me and in that moment I felt gratified. I don't know, he said. Does it? Somebody's playing with us, I warned. Come on, Rory, you're looking for trouble. There's some screw-up or a malfunction. I need to make sure it doesn't happen again. Baldly sarcastic, I chided. I think we've been in some trouble so far, Clark. Those were just terrible accidents. Don't make more of it than it is. Just keep quiet. I want to hear what ma'am volunteers about it, if anything. Later you can tell me I was wrong. Deal? He drilled me with a glare, during which I think he was remembering that I'd been right about the researchers still being here and alive. He fought to control his frustration. Mmm, well, deal, for now. He shook his head and wandered away to watch Tad stand absolutely still on the bank of screens. There were now only two huggers lurching around Tad's glowing blue suit. The others had moved on their way, possibly still looking for us. You come with me, he said to Pocket. They went around the other side of the stacked containers for some kind of captain-to-crew lecture. Corporal Edney turned to Carmichael. 
let's find the colonel and make a report. Yes, ma'am, the kid said, and followed her away. Neil stayed to monitor Tad's statue imitation. Zavira lost interest and wandered somewhere. I turned to Bonnie, who looked confused and ashamed. That was pretty brave, I told her. Brave and nuts. This whole thing is nuts, she said with a sigh. I kept thinking of what might happen to you and the captain out here, how you turned right around after we were attacked and you came right back out here, what would I think of myself if I didn't do my part? I couldn't go back to Earth and report to PlanCom that I hadn't even tried to participate. When the distress call came in, I guess I thought Providence had kicked in. Like I said, pretty brave. Embarrassed by the compliment, she looked kind of cute and sweet there, with her blonde dirty hair all wild and her blue eyes rolling at her own risky behavior. There was a commotion near the table, and we discovered that my mother and several of her team had come into the chamber with Matt Cormick and the Marines, and everyone was clamoring about the episode we'd just barely survived again. Why did you rush out? Ma'am demanded as soon as she saw me. When she spoke, everybody else fell silent. I shrugged. They were in trouble. We'll handle the trouble from now on. You did it again attracting attention to the wrong area. Now Tad's having to stand pet out there to distract them. Stand pet? Petrified, she clarified. It's a skill. You don't have it. Sorry, I said, just to get it over with fast. Sure you are, my sister commented. I hadn't even seen her come in. Our mother made a mighty show of controlling herself. You must let us handle these things. This place is like a hospital. Things are done in exacting ways for good reason. First and foremost, you may not leave the blind without escort. Tad was with us, I wryly noted. Okay, so I was just being snotty. For the good of us all, she said firmly, while you live in our house, you follow our rules. All of you. She turned to make eye contact with Clark, Pocket, and the Marines. Is that clear? The Marines looked at Matt Cormick to speak for them. After a moment, he did. We'll make every effort to comply, ma'am. Ma'am looked at Clark. He nodded. Okay, my crew will comply. But I need to contact the ship to confirm that they are not to exit under any conditions. Graciela will help you do that without causing incorrect signals. Everyone, please clean your hands for dinner, using the dry cleaner which Neil will give to you. She motioned the gathering toward Neil, who waved everybody to the far end of the dinner table. Then she turned to me and Bonnie. Rory, will you introduce us, please? Bonnie was busy beaming and trying to mash down her insane hair. Oh, sure, I said. Bonnie Bardolph, this is my mother, Jocasta Malvo. Miss Bardolph. Pleasure to meet you. Oh, me too. Bonnie bubbled. I'm such an admirer. I've read your books and watched your videos and I was hooked when you addressed Congress to push the Alien Species Act through. Thank you most sincerely, my mother said milkily. You're very sweet and devoted, I can tell. A medical specialist? Yes, I'm a resident physician. Not quite there yet. I'm sure you'll be marvelous. What will you do after your residency? I'm indentured to PlanCom for 15 years. Ah. Let me know if you ever want to get out of it. I have some influence. For the first time, a shadow of something less than hero worship crossed Bonnie's face. Oh, thanks, but I'm very comfortable right now. PlanCom's been very good for me. Of course. My mother's gentle smile was as practiced as a professional model's. You'll join us for our meal. You can sit next to me. Bonnie fell for it. She bounced on her toes with excitement at meeting her idol. 
Ma'am took her by the arm and escorted her to the table, around which the mismatched gaggle of humans was beginning to form. They sat on little uneven benches made of boards and more crates. Before we joined them, Clark leaned toward me and whispered, Do you call her ma'am all the time? I nodded. I was almost eleven before I figured out it isn't exactly the same as mom. He sighed. She seems real sweet, Rory. You sure you're not just imagining this because you don't like her? Maybe you better ask why I don't like her before you write me off. He lowered his voice even more, which only gave me the idea that there wasn't surveillance inside as well as outside. Clark didn't suspect that, but I started to. You may not realize it, he said, but you have control over something huge and important for all mankind. What you say goes, as far as releasing the PPs, aren't you kind of intimidated? I know I am. It doesn't intimidate me all that much, I told him. Unless I think about it or some jerk reminds me. We joined the others and found places to sit. The so-called food sat in serving containers put on the table by Oliver, the chef. There were bowls of grains, several kinds of dried fruit, dried, rolled tortilla things stuffed with something green, and spiky vegetables, also dried. I assumed the drying was to eliminate the aroma of fresh growth. Nobody took anything. I got the idea it was the same as when Gracie and I were children, nobody touched the food till the queen was ready. Ma'am took her seat at the far end of the table, in what was obviously the place of central attention and honor. Attention, team, my dear friends, and children. Captain Sparron and my son Rory and their marine friends will be leaving soon and launching their ship off the planet. They know they've compromised months of work by coming here and we know it was an honest mistake. They've promised to leave as soon as the area can be cleared and we can deliver them back to their ship. We are sad to note the deaths of some people today who came to our planet without knowing how to live safely here, and we are crushed to lose them for no good reason. We would like to note their courage today and to mourn their loss. They did not come here to die, but to rescue us. They didn't know we don't need rescue. And to our new friends, Miss Bonnie and Mr. Pocket, and Marine Edney, we would like to note your courage as well for answering the distress call. What do you know about that call? I asked, dashing her dramatic monologue. I didn't want to let it go by, and I didn't think Clark would ask. My mother's eyes focused firmly on me and she paused long enough to make a dramatic effect. The only possibility is that your Marine tried to send one before he passed away during his battle with the primal stage. She made it sound romantic, as if Bran had passed away in his sleep during some moral quest. It was a better answer than I expected. I suppose it was the best answer. Some of my suspicions began to calm down. I was probably more on edge about her than I needed to be. When I didn't forward any arguments to her logic, my mother continued addressing the entire table. Whatever things are now, they are. When we decide, we will deliver you back to your ship and you may be on your way. We'll enjoy our meal, and then I will take my son and Captain Sparron on a tour of our most beautiful area. It will be relatively safe by then. Before we had a chance to mull over the term relatively, I poked Clark and said, Excuse me. He looked as if he'd eaten a bad olive. Yeah? Tell them, please. His head wagged a little from side to side, then huffed out a breath and seemed to accept that there was no point in continuing the misconception. Yeah, he uttered unhappily. I'm sorry, but... Mrs. Malvo. I'm afraid you got the wrong idea here. My mother sniffed through a napkin. Pardon? I knew that inflection. The one that pretended she didn't know exactly what he was going to say when really she did. I'd heard it before. Kids tune into these kinds of things with their parents, then later nobody believes them. Clark pulled a computer slide out of his pocket. He held it between his thumb and forefinger to show the official seal. This planet has been declared a dying planet with a fatal disease. 
The aliens are classified Biohazard 1, a plague that will destroy the planet's biosystem by wrecking the food chain. They'll consume every animal over 20 pounds, and the food chain will collapse. My mother counted off a dramatic pause before speaking. How do you dare to say this? Where do you get such information? From you, I spoke up. It's all your own research, deep spaced back to Earth for analysis. You're using our own reports against us? Not against you, Mrs. Malvo, Clark said. For your own good. For the good of this planet. Accustomed to arguing her point before committees, companies, boards of directors, and Congress, she kept her cool but spoke with a very firm and decisive method. This is not our good at all. We will not be leaving our work behind before we barely get started. Clark avoided the eyes of everybody else on the team and just tried to face down my mother. Our ship is loaded with robotic hunter killers filled with coated poison to neutralize these aliens. We call them PPs. Poison packers. We have orders to sterilize the planet of all non-native DNA. But we have non-native DNA. Gracie argued. He looked at her. It's not aimed at you. Everybody in this outpost will have to be evacuated back to Earth until the poison packers have completely scoured the planet, which we figure might take a year. It's aimed at the alien species you're here to study. But we're not finished, my sister continued. It took us half this time to set up this outpost. We just mounted the last two cameras yesterday. We've barely begun the real observation. Nothing will happen to the outpost, Clark explained, faltering some. It'll still be here and usable after the planet is cleansed and we have a good planet for colonization, right in a space lace. You can return here in a year and take over right where you left off dash. Gracie slapped her hand flat on the table. After you've killed off the subjects of our research. You can't do it, our mother said. No, you can't. She remained calm, but she was starting to twitch around the eyes, brows, and lips, and her hands were pressed knuckle down onto the table. These actions are in violation of the Alien Species Act. Clark drew courage from a little glance at me, and went on with his obviously rehearsed statement. This planet's been declared an exception to the ASA. The aliens are regarded as more dangerous to other innocent forms of native life populating this planet. We have your reports of the ecosystem's population of. There is much native life here, yes. The Xenos are part of that life. They show intelligence enough that the ASA applies. There's no point to arguing points, I said as quietly as possible and still firm. This planet has to be evacuated. The aliens need to be wiped out before they wipe out everything else. You have no right to destroy them on a planetary scale, my mother said angrily. You want to exterminate a healthy species for profit. We'd hit a nerve. Knowing it would make her crazy, maybe break down her control, I leaned an elbow on the table and casually said, Everybody does everything for profit, ma'am. You courted billions so you could fund your expedition. That's not profit. Gracie exploded. This isn't just some decadent vacation. Oh, like hell it isn't. You took somebody else's money and spent it the way you wanted it spent. What do you think profiting is? You can profit for your purposes, but somebody else who spends the money on his own family is decadent. What makes your choices more moral than anybody else's? We don't spend our money on eccentricities. Then what are you doing here? Advancing science. What V you learned? How they breed? How they kill? We already know that. I hate you. They have a right to be here, our mother said, breaking into our argument as she had so many times in our lives. No more than we do, Clark took over again. They're as alien to this planet as humans. They'll destroy it. We won't. If you want to cherish the planet, this is the way. 
I will defend this helpless species, Captain. They're a disease, Mother, I said. According to your own reports, they sweep through an area, consuming or implanting every species that accommodates them, then they move on to the next group. If you do the math, this planet won't have any of its native species left after another year of this invasion. Gracie turned another shade of red. That's a lie. No, it's not. I read your reports. They're consuming their way through every native species big enough to host their larvae. A whole planet's health trumps one invading species. Our mother pressed her arms straight and leaned on the table. I refuse to allow you to use my own data against me to your evil purpose. Sweating visibly now, Clark stood his ground. Afraid you have no choice. Your research hasn't given us any reason to be hopeful that this species would be, like you say, subordinated in time to save the planet's food chain. The Alien Species Act makes an exception when kill or be killed is the rule. You're lying, she said with a twisted smile. This is a lie. You're simply lying. There's no such clause in the Alien Species Act. Clark shrugged in a kind of apology that wasn't really one. I'm sorry to tell you the amendment was added after you left on this mission. A lot of people were nervous that it was so inflexible, given what we know about the, ah, uh, xenomorphics. This planet will adapt. It is adapting. I'll be able to prove it. I will prove it. Can you prove it now? I dared. This species is like smallpox. It's a kill or be killed species. There's no living with them, there's no way to reason with them, and they don't respect other species' territory. I've heard you talk about things like this before, ma'am. I learned this from you. This planet has a death sentence on it. You're enamored of a disease, and you actually want the disease to win. Ask your, your virologist here how a virus works. Diego, the virologist, looked as if he'd been fingered in a lineup. He seemed terrified that ma'am would actually ask him something. That was the moment when I noticed that nobody beside ma'am and Gracie were speaking up. These people were either worshipful, or they were just plain cowed. Ask Bonnie here, I added gesturing at my uncomfortable shipmate. She's a doctor. If a bear breaks into your house, you can kill the bear. Bonnie seemed very uneasy at being asked to challenge her idol's work, but when you've got a weapon, you need to use it. I needed some leverage right now. My mother's arms quivered with effort. She drew a few long breaths to steady herself. This is not our house. They have a right to be here. They are beautiful and intelligent. We will not be leaving. So you might as well turn around and go away from here. The cold food somehow seemed even colder. Nobody had taken a single bite. Tell her, Clark, I said through my teeth. He cast me a desperate gaze. Clark, I insisted, tell her. Under the prickling glares of the entire research team, whose dreams he was about to trample, he found himself compelled by responsibility and the pressures of his title. He pulled a small leather pouch from his vest pocket and opened it, showing a legal envelope, stamped with a seal, and the corresponding computer disk with the identical information. I have a court order. The whole group of researchers gawked, gasped, and looked at each other in astonishment. Had my mother finally been subdued? They couldn't imagine it. Why do you come here with a court order, my mother demanded. Because I told him to, I admitted. I knew you'd resist. A moment of uneasy silence twisted the recycled air. This is human arrogance at work, my mother proclaimed. Mankind has gone through changing moralities. Slavery. Dictators. Kings. We have rejected them. This is the age of cutting-edge decisions. This is the age when we stop looking at other species as if they have no rights. She drew another breath to continue her soliloquy, 
but I stopped her before she got rolling and everybody ended up in tears to her favor. Rights are something specific, I said. Rights are given to human beings through the Constitution. Animals don't have rights, or we lose the definition of the word. Humans are just animals, Gracie challenged. The Xenos are intelligent. They communicate. They figure things out. They'll be the dominant species. The same thing has happened all through history. Species move in and out. And we're going to help this one move out. This planet is in the process of being overrun by these things. It's a dying planet, Clark attempted. They'll destroy everything. If my mother had ever loved me for an instant, that instant was eradicated right here and now as she glared at us. This planet is adapting. It's about to strike back and battle the xenomorphs to a level of integration. Nature is bigger than any species. It will subordinate them. The environment is changing and the planet belongs to the species that are here. Humans are here, Clark pointed out. I gave him a lot of credit for speaking up that way. He really must believe all that stuff he told me on the ship. My mother somehow seemed to get taller. I wished we could bottle that trick. She grew strangely calm in a projection of having regained control. I wondered if she hadn't lost her temper on purpose, to demonstrate her passion, and now would re-establish her authority through purposeful dignity. She's actually taken seminars on how to control situations, so I didn't think I was imagining this. Very calmly, she began again. This decision is premature. Even if we could have evacuated, now you have ensured we never can. We must stay to protect this species. They are beautiful and vibrant. They learn. They change. You can't get back to your ship without us and we will not take you until we are ready to do it under our conditions. We will not go voluntarily. Will you and your soldiers attempt to drag us through this land? With all the noise and commotion, you might get forty feet. We came an amazing distance to do the research of a thousand lifetimes, and now we will stay to protect them from you in your small universal view. As long as we remain here, you cannot release your genocidal machines. She stepped away from the table and had to move behind those of us sitting on the outer bench. As she passed behind me, I felt the knife of her mind sink into my spine. She paused and looked down at me. I'm certain you have told him that. Being the law. Coming around to the other end of the table, making it clear she had no intention now of sitting down to dinner with us. Dinner was probably over before it had even started she addressed the uneasy group once again. However, in fairness, she went on, there's only this one opportunity and I want to make sure it isn't missed. Is there anyone among you, and I'm speaking to my own children now, who would like to give up our work here and go with them? I sat still and watched them. The campers sat still too, with just their eyes shifting as they watched each other. Their chins were down and each seemed to want to draw as little attention as possible. This is your chance, ma'am went on after a pause to see if there were takers. No other ship will come here for many months. Probably years. Another few moments of silence. Somebody coughed. Nobody spoke up. Please, my mother continued. Please listen to me, my dears. This is my life's work. I will not abandon it. I would like to encourage you, each of you in your own heart, to think clearly about leaving now that there is a chance to go. I admit freely that this is a difficult environment, more unforgiving, more bleak than I ever imagined. I may have misled you. You may have imagined something better. You may be disillusioned. We have lost friends here. We have lost lovers. I have no right to ask you to stay in every passion to bless you to leave. Please, if you want to go, speak now. No one will think ill of you. Clark's eyes were big as baseballs. He stared at my mother, then, without blinking, shifted his eyes to me in helpless panic. 
Should he speak up again, or was he hoping I would? My mother beamed at her own team members. Ultimately the beam of love turned into a humble smile. I knew I had picked the best people out of all of humanity. I knew when I saw your faces in the crowd that you were each so very special, to be this dedicated, so. She broke off into an episode of fighting back tears. I'm so very honored, she murmured through her hand pressed to her mouth. Nobody jumped up to comfort her. They just looked down at their excuse for food. Um. The sound was almost a squeak. All eyes flashed to the chemist with the bowl haircut. Mamma's eyes zeroed in on him. Yes, Rusty. Rusty shifted in his seat, suddenly the center of attention. I might. Go ahead, Mam pressed. I might like to go with them. His tiny voice boomed in the silence. Well, Mam said, I don't blame you. You're young. This is no place to spend one's early youth when you should be at parties and dating young girls. We will all miss you, darling, very much. We will have your excellent work to remember you by. Everyone, we must wish Rusty the very best and be happy for his choice. Today, when I go out with the captain and my son, you'll go with me for a final walk through our adventure. It will be your swan song. Would you like that? In some kind of creepy cult thing, they all started half-heartedly applauding Rusty. He blushed and looked both relieved and something else. You see? Life will go on, my mother continued. The planet will adapt to the xenomorphs. They are becoming part of the living biosphere. I'm on the edge of proving that. I need more time. I can prove it, I know I can. I have a sense for them. They have a sense for me. She raised her perfectly appointed chin and gazed above all our heads to the dream she saw in her own mind. She stepped back from the table and, unless I was imagining it, struck a pose. Someday, she proclaimed, I will walk among them. Clark and I, Bonnie, and the Marines sat wide-eyed with the boldness of the statement. Admittedly it was so bold, so wild as to have a certain poetic shock value. She was an influential woman, the leader of a notable socio-political and scientific movement, and she was taken with her own press clippings. Maybe she had a right to be. I don't know. Her own people, my sister, and the other misfits, were transfixed with worship. She had a nice little coven going here. Or was there silence and all really disguising another emotion? I never had the chance to find out. Ma'am took four calculated steps to the projector curtain. Her eyes narrowed in a mischievous way as she held her finger to her lips. Shoo, she uttered. She put her hand to a control panel and touch, patted a code. The projector curtain beside her began to ripple, then to grow transparent once again. There, not more than a few steps away from the spot where my mother stood and backdropped by the pink glow of the afternoon sun, were two of the monstrous adult aliens. One was back several feet, casually picking at its own tail the way a cat grooms itself. The nearer alien was only steps from us, gazing upward at the glassy mountain which quaffed our hiding place. The underside of its chin was a perfect triangle, fringed with gray-white teeth and a string of drool. Everyone at the table froze in apprehension. Beside me, Matt Cormick made a slight shift of his hand toward his sidearm. I pressed my hand to his wrist and stopped him. Like frightened quail in the underbrush, we held perfectly still. Clearly, she was right, we couldn't leave the blind. Not yet. They were all around us. My mother gazed in adoration at the creature which didn't know she was so near, near enough to slaughter with a sweep of its clawed hand which hung and reposed dangerously near the curtain. It saw only a projection of the landscape around it. If it drew any nearer, its breath might ripple the curtain and give us away. Or our mother's breath could do the same from inside. She moved her hand very carefully from the control panel toward the curtain. 
she raised her fingers and moved her palm along the curtain to the level of the alien's hand. There she stood, in commune with the devil, truly in love with what she saw. Her eyes glowed and she tilted her head in admiration and love. Her lips moved, and there was only the barest of whispering. Someday. 7. How does it work? Light refraction, nanochips, electrical pulse, specialty scent masking, microvid units that assimilate the environment and replicate what's behind you, lots of things. They also stop the natural sloughing of skin cells that happens naturally to people when we just walk around. Tad, the stealth guy who had somehow returned in one piece from his close encounter with the Scorpio Huggeroids, picked and poked the suit I was wearing. I'd never worn blue in my life. And this wasn't just blue. This was blue. Electric blue. Las Vegas blue. This one was a superhero costume, all glowy and satiny, as if lit from within. It wasn't unforgivingly body-hugging, luckily, but had some room to it, but was so weightlessly constructed as to be flexible and not baggy. In the front parts of the thigh sections, the part of the body less likely to bump or be fallen on, were the computer components that ran the smart elements of the suit. When I bent my arms or legs, the suit emitted a faint crinkling noise from the millions of emitter smart fibers in the inner and outer mesh layers and signal channeling conduction foam sandwiched between them. If you stand absolutely still, Tad said, the suit masks itself from their senses. There are certain wavelengths that they have trouble sensing. They probably won't notice you. It's the probably that bothers me, I mumbled. You have to control yourself. It's hard, Tad warned. Every molecule in your body says run, but if you run, they'll see you. Like quail hiding in the brush. You have to hold your nerves. And they're the devil to outrun, so don't think you can do that. You can't just put on a suit and go walk among them. You have to stand still and hope they don't bump into you. I glanced at Clark, who was being fitted into his suit beside me. Permission to beat ass, sir. Permission denied, Clark said as the chemist Rusty taught him how to pull the hood over his face. I went diving a couple of times at Little Africa Reef off the dry Tortugas. This feels like that wet suit, only lighter. The elastomers are basically the same, Rusty said, but they're embedded with sensors and emitters. They draw information and conduct emission from all the other layers. They even have a chemical element so we can make them broadcast certain aromas. I was in on the development of the formula range. Each suit is worth about 14 million. How did you test the reaction of the xenomorphs? I asked. Tad shrugged. We hung up a suit and monitored their reaction to different emissions. Lost six suits, Rusty added. Tad flashed him a cautionary glance, which I caught. We're also working on holographics, he said quickly, and anti-xeno cages that are acid-proof and caked with countermeasures and cloaking chips. My mother came in, wearing a blue super suit that made her look like a space opera diva. She surveyed us with way too much joy. Are you ready for your tour? Yes. Ma'am, Clark said. I have to tell you, I'm nervous about this. I don't like going out without the Marines. Your Marines would create more chances for trouble. The fewer people, the more we can control any chance of mistakes. You have been given your instructions on behavior. You must strictly obey them, or we cannot go. We'll comply, I said. I didn't want her to be watching me the whole time. What about weapons? Defense? We don't use them, she said. Any energy discharge disrupts the field emitted by the suit. All you have to do is stand perfectly still. Even if you are seen moving, you can stand still and become lost in the panorama. In all likelihood, we'll not encounter any Xenos at all. How do you know? Because we know where they are. We always scan the landscape on our visuals and heat seekers before we leave the blinds. 
We might see them at a distance, but we observe them this way often. Hope I don't crap in your fancy suit, Clark admitted. I made a face. Couldn't mask that odor, could we? All right, Tad concluded. You're all on line. Put your boots on. Rusty provided us with surprisingly comfortable and supportive blue boots with calf-high stovepipe uppers. Which was where I hid my plasma pistol. Yeah, I know. The four of us ma'am, Rusty, Clark, and I moved out of the blind under the careful supervision of Tad at the entrance. This was some kind of mixed ceremony, a chance for my mother to show us things that would make her case, and Rusty's last walk before leaving the planet with the Venza. I watched Rusty and had to admit he seemed comfortable with going out on this walk, despite my nasty hopes that he would be nervous or frightened. I had it in my head that ma'am was setting us up, maybe to get rid of us, but the barometer of Rusty didn't bear that out. He had no hesitation about getting the suits and helping us with the picky donning process. Was it an honor to go out on this kind of walk? Did it show something I hadn't expected about my mother, that she wasn't holding a grudge? Or did she just want to keep her enemies close? Behind us, Matt Cormick and the other two Marines, Bonnie, and a handful of campers watched us with mixed emotions. Bonnie came to the perimeter at the last moment, and Tad pushed her back. The curtain closed over them, and all we saw after that was a near-perfect image of the canyon's cape. The hiding techniques seemed artistic and modern, yet also seemed to be veils, not forts. If the veil were ever accidentally discovered, the aliens would just walk in with nothing to stop them. Walking through the landscape of Planet Rosamond 6 was both dream and nightmare. We followed my mother on unmarked paths which she clearly knew well, through the forest of glass columns and out onto an escarpment of plant growth of the kind only an artist's imagination or nature's wild wish list could conjure up. Pink vines draped hundreds of feet, stippled with fleshy cherry-like nodules, each with a tiny black fan sticking out of it. What are these? I asked. Rusty touched one of the little fans, and it happily fluttered. That's its idea of a flower. As we walked our trail, a strange sense of calmness came over me. My mother moved with such confidence at the head of the line that her demeanor was reassuring. She walked along without her blue hood, but we all did have gloves on. I felt like a bad boy, having the plasma pistol hidden in my boot, but if I had to use it, I figured the cover would have already been blown. Can't break old habits quite this abruptly. Some people carried rabbit feet. Some people had lucky nickels. I had my plaws. Sue me. The environment had gone from stark prismy red glass and black sculch to a lush gold and blue forest, and just when I started to get alien planet overload, puffs of green fern-like growth started to line the path and declare that green was not just an earth color. In fact, it was seriously green, bright green. Green that made Envy jealous. You can see, my mother began, that there is wonderful growth here and many forms of life. There is algaic life, microbial life, insect life, flightless birds, all the way up to pre-mammals. We think we may have seen mammals, but we are still researching. You see how beautiful it is here, and we have managed to live in this environment. How many outposts do you have? I asked. She looked back at me. What? Outposts. How many? The blind back there was the main one, right? You have others? Where other researchers are working. She continued walking. After what might have been barely too long, she finally said, Yes, sometimes we have remote outposts. They're isolated for specific observations. Can we see one? This is as far as we can go today. Ma'am motioned us to her sides, and we discovered she was standing on a ridge. Behold, the Blue Valley. And it was. Below us flowed a magnificent vista that could only be compared to a god-sized single peacock's feather, 
with a dark eye at the bottom and waves radiating outward in shimmering circles of metallic blue and green, separated by rings of platinum and shot with strands of gold. The sun, now thinking about setting, shone through the red glass spires behind us and cast soft shafts of colored light into the blue valley. And there was indeed life. Herds of large grazers with some sort of quills or stiff hair. Flocks of those flightless semi-ostriches with short necks and tall feathery coronets. Clouds of glitter-winged flitters. The pastoral scene was almost quaint. It was certainly hypnotic, the kind of thing that causes people to build hilltop mansions and get Adirondack chairs and tumblers of iced tea. That might happen here, if Clark's vision came true. I looked to my right. He stood on the other side of my mother, gazing over the Blue Valley Vista, thinking of the wonders of his simple mission, of how many people would find paradise here while he retired to his Wahoo fields. I envied him his easy dreams. They were the kind that came true. And Jocasta Malvo gazed too. She was as proud of the valley as if she had painted it on a canvas and it had come to life. This was her dream too, this planet and its creatures. She knew, and so did I, and Clark and all of us, what efforts were cast by eternity to come up with a planet like this, a living and breathing world finding its way to fruitfulness in a barren galaxy. I turned my gaze to the sky, yes, there it was, the all-important moon, with its green stripes and lazy glow. Now that the sun was leaning its shoulder down, the moon opened its single petal. You see? Ma'am said. Here is a living environment, unafraid and adjusting. There is no cowering, no fear. No panic or confusion. They live their lives and the Xenos are becoming part of the beautiful quilt. They serve their purpose, hunting the weak and the slow, leaving the swift and strong to reproduce and flourish. To interfere is immoral now. They have settled in. They are the splendid dogs of Anubis, handsome adapters who will melt into this environment and become one of nature's controllers. That they are sharks, that they are cobras, that they are wolves, raptors, and all this is both relevant and irrelevant. If predators reign, we must let them. There are limits. Nature knows the limits. They cannot destroy a planet. When the easy prey for them is gone, you'll see the Xenos die back to a balance. They will be outperformed by animals that are fleeter of foot, that can fly, other strategies which will rein them in. I will remain here with my loyal few, to watch the history of the galaxy unfold, and bring the story home to humanity. Someday I will walk with them and they will accept me. Clark looked at me right over her head, he was tall enough and she was petite enough. I shook my head quickly and lowered my brows. Don't say anything. All I have to do, ma'am went on, almost as though she were talking to herself, is find out what triggers their higher senses. Whatever is necessary, I will learn to live among them and they will accept me as one of them. Clark, on the other side of ma'am, and Rusty here beside me, were either hypnotized or just freaked. I was particularly aware of Rusty. You cannot terraform a planet, she went on, which has potential intelligent life. Captain. Not legally, not morally. Primarily, there are very few of those. If this planet adapts, then you have no right. The Xenos are now indigenous. The Xenomorphs are potentially intelligent, if they are not already intelligent. They are already quick and smart, and they communicate. That overrides terraforming rights. You will not wipe out this excellent, successful species so humans can have this planet. We humans have had enough of that in our history, wiping out each other, wiping out whatever is in our way, and I will not have my own son becoming the next Stalin. I eyed Clark, and he shrugged at me in mute desperation. Did she have a point? Legally? To put humans here would ruin this paradise, she continued. Humans are the lice the wreckers, the egos. If we try to have a war with them, we will lose. You and your poison robots, the Xenos will outthink you, 
I'll wait you, out of all of you. You want to take over the planet in a few months, but they will find ways to wait a century, if they must. You say the Xenos are biohazard one? The impatience of humanity is the true plague, Captain. These things take time, much time. Some people in my field of science have actually inherited their work from their parents and grandparents. My daughter will inherit this outpost from me. The only hope for your colony, your settlement, Captain, is to let me continue my work. We can't live in spite of them. Someday, when my work is done and I have discovered the Xeno's secrets, humans will be able to live with them. Her words brushed by and were carried on a breeze that had a faint scent of perfume. Had I been wrong about her? I tried to maintain the level of cynicism I had forged about her, but today I had to admit there was a sliver of doubt. I hadn't spoken to my mother or my sister in about five years. People can change, can't they? The one thing I'd really been consistently good at in my life was not lying to myself. So now I asked myself, why was I the only person on two worlds who didn't respect Jocasta Malvo? If she was right and I was wrong, or if I bore any doubts, which at this moment I did, then we couldn't release the PPs. My friendship with Clark and the whole crew would be ruined. Everybody on Earth would be mad at me for denying them this second Earth. But if she was right and this world could adapt, could flex a muscle and bring the xenomorphs and thrall to the overarching controls of the environment, who was I to dispute a current and effective law? The Alien Species Act had been argued before Congress by people a lot smarter than I was. My mother could never have pushed such a thing through on her own. Somebody else had to consider the points. We were still on the cusp of its authority, of all this interaction with life not of Earth. The ASA was created in anticipation of alien life, not based on experience with it. It had also helped to boost exploration in space, which otherwise was a pretty hard sell. It caused dreamers to dream. This planet might actually be a researcher's heaven, on the edge of evolutionary leaps that could be witnessed in action and not just studied in fossil form. If I weren't her son, would I think of her the way I did? I should never have taken this assignment. The possibility that I might be too jaded, too close to the emotional core to see clearly over it. She was right this was a living, breathing planet, with a beautiful biosphere just minutes from where the alien stalked. We will retire now. Ma'am nodded in agreement with herself and led the way back down the same trail. Are we going in? I asked. We haven't had a chance to use our suits. You don't want that chance, Rusty said. Ma'am looked at him and said, I suppose it's good that you're leaving, then. Her tone was sweet, but her eyes were chilling. Was it just me? We fell into a single file line again and didn't speak. Silence, unless broken by Ma'am, was part of the rules. I had no problem complying, except for the occasional urge to mutter some remark to Clark. I had a lot of questions for Rusty, though. Why was he leaving? Was he lonely, tired, or afraid? And what was the core of his fear? The way I see it, anybody who wasn't afraid in this place was loopy. I don't mind adventure, but nobody in his right mind wants to live his life in the middle of a spider's web trying to avoid the spider. You'd never get anything else done. Good point, what kind of research could they possibly accomplish in an environment where most of the time they were fighting for their lives? Maybe that was why there were so many I don't knows when we asked questions. Gracie had said they were just beginning to do the research after finally setting up their camp and surveillance and other things. How long had they been here? The better part of two years? and they were just getting started. All the way back to the blind, my skin was clammy with dread under the super suit. Going into the alley was one thing, and turning around and walking out was another. I had always felt that knife between my shoulder blades, the one the thug sticks in your back after you think you've checked all the shadows. I wished we'd been able to look around safely without the tour guide. 
How could I get back out there without my mother? Seeing the projector curtain being held open by Neil, with Bonnie standing behind it and watching us approach that was a good moment. We slipped inside, and the curtain was positioned artfully after us. It was beautiful, yes? Ma'am asked. Can't deny that, Clark said. She turned and said, Rusty, if you would come with me for a moment? He nodded and followed her into one of the tunnels. The dinner table had already been taken down. The meal had been strained and quick. Nobody much wanted to talk after what they'd heard from Clark and me, and the party had broken up like a bad family reunion. If you'll come this way, Mr. Malvo, Neil said to me, I'll help you get out of the suit. We have to remove them and store them carefully so they don't get damaged. You can call me Rory. Okay, thanks. I almost took a step to go with him, then got a flash of an idea. Listen, why don't you take Clark first? Captain's privilege, and all. Clark smirked at me. Privilege? I sleep last, I eat last, I get a shower last. I clapped him on the shoulder. So this time you get to go first. Can I have this moment bronzed? This way, Captain. Neil gestured to Clark, and they went off together, leaving Bonnie and me in relative privacy. What was it like out there? Bonnie asked quietly. Breathtaking, I admitted. In a good way, I mean. Lots of native life, flora, growth, wilderness, real pretty and sort of sparkly. Do you think I could see it? Tomorrow? I shrugged. Think you'd look good in blue? She smiled in a clunky, awkward way. You do. Oh, yeah? I twirled once and modeled the contraption. I'd love to see what you saw, she went on mistily. I love the diversity of life. What life is and why things are alive, space fascinates me because it has a chance for totally new life. What do you think of the environment that created the aliens? I asked. She paused and thought about it. Well, it must be incredibly complex, with a long food chain. If you look at them evolutionarily, they're not all that different from us. What? I blurted on a laugh. You're crazy. Look at them. Right, look at them, she persisted. Relatively comparable in size to humans, within a few feet of height and not that different weight-wise, they have the heads on top and the feet on the bottom, arms with fingers, and we still have our tail bones, you know. In comparison to, say, even an elephant or a sparrow, they're much closer to us. I guess. My sister says we're just more animals. She offered another little smile, this one less convincing, but I think that was only because she was insecure about herself, while not at all about what she was saying. She shrugged, almost apologetically, and suggested, we're the only animals that care about other animals. Human life is the best thing evolution ever came up with. Humanity is what nature was heading for all along. She was an insecure person, or maybe just shy, and yet I found her so attractive right now that she represented all that was best about people. I'd grown up in a world of eco-heads, who thought people were just about the worst disease ever to strike the universe. I'd never believed it, I was the odd kid out and my mother never approved of my approval of mankind. It was like coming from a religious family and just never seeing the logic in religions. I couldn't help it. I was born that way. I always saw the underside of the plate that was put in front of me. And here was Bonnie, in this goofed-out nest of vipers and their herders, the only one with the universe completely in order. What are you looking at? She broke out in a nervous giggle. I pressed my lips together in appreciation. Know what you are. What? You're my mother if she were nice. We were interrupted when Ma'am and Gracie appeared on the other side of the stacked containers which created a maze of little semi-separate areas in this central chamber. I held my hand up to quiet Bonnie. 
I knew an opportunity to eavesdrop when I saw one. Had my stalling actually paid off? Send Rusty, ma'am said. He still has his suit on. Put this recharged power pack in. We want no trouble in that sector. Oh, I'll send him, all right, Gracie responded. I'd like to send him down some deep hole somewhere. As we have found, nothing stays the same. Better to shed the detritus than try to glue it on. He makes me sick. Send him immediately. And remember to have him code his suit to the new charge frequency. Fine. They split up, and Bonnie started to speak, but I motioned her silent, and in a few seconds Gracie reappeared with Rusty. Just get it done. Replace the third and fourth broadbands and clean the lens. Isn't it kind of late in the day for Sector 9? Rusty asked. Another hour, it'll be dark. Then I guess you had better move your useless ass, shouldn't you? Ah, Gracie. Turn around, traitor. Why? Fresh power pack. Oh, thanks. Screw you. I saw the point of her shoulder and a flick of long braid as she exited through the tunnel just opposite from where we were standing. I put a finger to my lips, signaling Bonnie to be quiet and stay here. Then I slipped out of our seclusion and caught Rusty at the projector curtain. Rusty, where are you going? He glanced around, not expecting that anyone else was still lingering around here. Huh. Oh. I have to go do some maintenance in Sector 9. It's my last official duty. I've done it before, just never alone. Is it a good idea to go alone? He seemed dejected. I, uh, no, we usually go in pairs, but I've got the suit on already, so. How about if I go with you? I suggested. I'm all dressed. Rusty pawned his round head haircut and hesitated. Doesn't sound like a good idea. I don't know, we've never had visitors. I don't know what the policy is. Maybe we should ask Jocasta first. I think I'm old enough to go out without asking my mommy. I'll behave. I'll be your rear guard. How about it? I do have some fears about my rear, he allowed. Guess it's okay. Then he paused, and a strange thing happened. His eyes brightened and he pressed his lips flat, and said, yes. Good idea. Come on. Well, that was an odd change. On the way out, I cast a glance back at Bonnie. She bit her lip and crossed her fingers in silent well-wishing. I put my finger to my lips again. Don't tell anybody. She nodded. Sector 9 was in the other direction from the way we'd gone with ma'am. Rusty and I turned left instead of right out of the blinds curtain opening, and within just a few minutes the story began to change from the rosy glory my mother had wanted me to believe. This area had no lush beauty to boast, but soon turned decidedly less attractive. And that wasn't just the landscape. Not more than seven or eight minutes out, Rusty cast me a glance at just the moment when a gassy odor struck me full in the face. I stopped walking and sniffed. Rusty paused, his eyes wide. I nodded at him. I smell it. He didn't say anything, as if wanting me to come to my own conclusion. As different as this planet is, I said, the one constant in the galaxy is the smell of death. Rusty closed his eyes for a moment of relief. He motioned me forward. Within only a short distance, Rusty was leading me through a bone yard, the telltale leavings of assault. Skeletons and desiccated remains of fairly large beasts, maybe the size of adult pigs, littered the land, so prevalent we had to zigzag through them. What's this all about? I asked. The Xenos killed them, he said. It's a whole herd, wiped out in less than four days. Hundreds of them. Even what they don't consume, they slaughter. We don't know why. They destroy just to destroy. So much for the pretty picture, I said outright. 
Jocasta just sees the pretty part, he told me. Keep your voice down. Sorry. Keep your eyes open. Any my mouth shut. Right. Yeah, mostly. The carcasses around us were grotesque, with their rib cages exploded or their heads torn off, limbs separated from bodies while still on the run, or spines pulled out from the bodies with shocking ease. They told a story of gratuitous violence that most animals didn't engage in. That was it. I'd never thought about it that way before. These aliens were violent for the sake of violence, for the joy and pleasure of it. I was sure my sister would tell me humans had been engaging in that hobby for eons, and that was probably true, but other humans policed the violence and were disgusted by it. This killing field around me spoke of a unified delight and unrestrained purpose that was species-wide. The xenomorphs had no self-restraint, no moral guardrails, and no sheriffs among them. There was no controlling factor. They just killed to kill. We moved with dispatch through the field of slaughter, and by the time we moved on to the next area, I was disgusted beyond measure. We moved into a narrow passage flanked by what appeared to be very thin trees almost like fringe. Rusty, why do you want to leave? I asked. I sensed he was afraid I'd want to know this, but also that he wasn't surprised to be asked. Just done my time here, is all. Ready for something different. Watch out for this web. Don't step in it. I sidled away from the wide complex web he pointed to, which was spread across almost the whole path. Thanks. Look, I need a break, okay? I don't have all the time in the world. Can I get a couple of straight answers? Like what? Those people in the huts, I ventured, were they locked in? Those huts were prisons, weren't they? He didn't answer right away. His hesitation stiffened my suspicions that things were darker than my mother wanted portrayed. Rusty met my eyes as we came abreast of each other and picked our way through more bodies of animals, this time a flock of the flightless birds. You won't say I told. What is this, a Boy Scout troop? Sarcasm didn't help. I chided myself with a glower and said, sorry. I won't tell. He didn't seem reassured, and even lowered his voice, as if anybody could hear us out here. They were incubation chambers. We took care of them the best we could. Jocasta said it was as kind as possible. Watch out for this crevice. Don't get your foot caught. So they were implanted with the, what do you call them, larvae. You shoved them into the hut and left the doors open to put food in? He blushed with humiliation. We didn't feed them. It would have been. He cut himself off. What? I demanded. A waste of food? Ashamed, he nodded. We came around to a pathway that was actually a ledge. With a motion he warned me of the cliff we were now standing on. Rusty stopped and pointed. Cliff, that was a crystal clear accuracy. The drop was sheer and straight. We stood on the precipice of a 2,000-foot ravine. Across the ravine, which was another 1,000 feet wide, was the floor of the Blue Valley. We were now level with the lush blue-green space, with its population of undisturbed herds and flocks, and from here I could see that the Blue Valley was actually a shelf. This ravine prevented access to it. My mother had deceived me and Clark on purpose. The Blue Valley wasn't pristine or undisturbed by the Xenos, they just hadn't reached it yet. It was protected only by the huge protective gap now open before Rusty and me. Rusty's eyes shifted to mine, and we understood each other. Postponing the inevitable didn't make it any less inevitable. He wanted me to see this. In a month, he said, they'll be over there too. He moved on, only another twenty feet to a sensor-slash-transmitter array that had been drilled into the edge of the cliff, supported on a tripod. Rusty got down on his knees to reach the array and began to service it after rolling out a small set of very surgical tools. All I could do was watch. 
Why were the hut's doors open? I pursued. To hear their screams? No, no. Even with the creatures in us, we were told we had no right to make our end swift and easy, no right to kill what was inside us. The infected people were locked in and the dude was left ajar for the young to get out. He hung his head briefly. Jocasta kept them inside so the rest of us wouldn't see the torture. Wouldn't see the young Xenos burst out of their chests or the blood, she treats us like children. She ritualizes the bad things and makes them holy. Like the Catholic Church celebrates the torture and mutilation of Christ, makes it into some kind of nice holiday with little bunnies and pictures of sunshine. If you sanitize something enough, people will embrace it. The grimness of the moment betrayed many other dark truths about this place and the way of life the scientists had discovered here. I'm sorry, Rory, Rusty quietly said. I shouldn't talk this way about your mother. I wasn't brought up that way. I knelt beside him. That's probably the best description I've ever heard, from anybody. The compliment seemed to do him some good as he went on with his work. Scanning the blue valley, way over there and seeming now like an oasis in a deadly desert, I asked, I'll bet the doors were left open because she wanted the little gargoyles to live. Right? She doesn't believe we have a right to kill them, he confirmed. I don't blame her for that. Don't you? We always knew that. She didn't hide that part. It'll be good to go home, won't it? He rolling his eyes and communicated a thousand fears and fatigues in that one moment. I had a golden opportunity here. Like those times interrogating a witness, sometimes you have to know just how far to push and when to take a leap. How many people have you lost, Rusty? I asked, careful with my tone. They're not in other outposts, alive somewhere, are they? Slowly he shook his head. His mouth worked as if he were about to throw up. Again, I prodded, how many are dead? God, I really shouldn't be telling you this. I'll find out anyway. There's no more hiding about things like that. How many of the original 52 are dead? Like a valve releasing, he said, 36. He turned to me in desperation. We can't live here. We can't research here. They found every one of the other outposts. They never give up. They understand psychological warfare. My sister said you waited them out. That it took five months for them to forget. Once again he shook his head, but not as if Gracie were wrong. It was as if Gracie knew the truth and had lied to me. They don't forget, he said. It's impossible for us to wait them out. Then what is my mother up to? I murmured, almost to myself. If she knows you're all doomed if you stay, what's she trying to prove? He flopped back, knees folded under him, and stared down into the deep ravine. She really seems to love them. He sighed a couple of times, then suddenly perked up. Let's go back to your ship. Let's go right now, okay? Why go back to the blind? We can launch tomorrow, right? Can we leave tomorrow? His desperation and excitement about the chance to leave confirmed what I had suspected. No matter what my mother said, these people needed rescuing. I reached over and pressed his arm, hoping to keep the conversation on an informative track. There was no telling when I'd get another chance for clarity. Who else wants to leave, Rusty? Who else is afraid to speak up? He parted his lips, and wasn't I surprised when the sound was a steady electrical chittering noise, fast and frantic. Rusty jumped to his feet without even using his hands to push off, and yanked his blue hood over his head and all the way down over his face. Surprised, I bolted to my own feet. What what? Stand up. Back up against the wall. Over here, over here. Stand still. Stand perfectly still. Do I have to? Do I turn it on? Panic shot through me. What do I do? It's automatic. 
Pull your hood on. He reached for the back of my neck and for a horrifying few seconds we were both tangled up in trying to get my hood over my face. When we finally got it down, I was illogically confused by the fact that the hood seemed almost clear from inside, even though I could no longer see Rusty's face through his. More one-way mirror fabric. Stand still. He shoved me backward against the wickery of spindly growth, which felt like a wicker fence. And be quiet. Oh, shit. And don't shit. How was I supposed to be still with my lungs heaving and my limbs quaking with panic? With monumental physical effort I flattened against the wicker and nearly suffocated trying not to pant or heave. I never worked so hard in my life. Rusty, because he had to tend to me, ended up having to position himself right at the edge of the ravine, between the array tripod and a jagged finger of black rock standing straight up on the cliff's lip. The rock was almost as tall as Rusty, and he pressed sideways against it to have something to brace against. With almost military poise, he came to attention and froze in place. I fixed my gaze on him in pure admiration and wished like hell I could get halfway that still. His suit began to glow softly, emitting something sound, scent, I had no idea what that would send some message or other to whatever was coming. Where were they? How close? Did we have enough time to run back the way we'd come, or was that the direction they were coming from? My mind flashed on the destruction I'd seen, on the punched-out ribcages and the acid-dissolved flesh, the impaled throats and dismembered limbs. So far I'd only witnessed the creature's power by proxy. What the hell was I doing here? This was one of those moments when every attraction for coming on this voyage suddenly dissolved and became microscopic. All I wanted to be was back home, being chased down a blind alley by some drug-crazed gang of Satan worshippers. That I could handle. That noise, there it was, the rolling, crunching slow approach. The noise was faint, purposeful. My feet turned hot and itchy. This path wasn't covered with the cereal-like sculch, but was sheer weather-shaved rock. The approaching noise was soft and hinting. In my head it turned loud, deafening, enough to set my ears to drumming. I was still panting. How could I stop? I fought to breathe evenly. Overcome by fear, I dared to whisper, am I glowing? Rusty's hand flinched. Yes. SHH. Suddenly a huge black form leaped out of the unseen area around the bend. With a lump it landed between me and Rusty, arms up in a dare, knees bent, ready to leap again, and there it hunched, looking, sensing. It had hurt us. I tipped it off. I wanted to kick myself, to run, to draw attention away from Rusty since I'd stupidly drawn it to him. The alien was huge, bigger than the one Chantal had stuffed and mounted. Its elongated head was at least two feet above mine. Inside the smoked glass skull rippled rows of cerebral sensors. The long anaconda tail drifted elegantly, held high and curled. Its outer jaws separated, drawing strings of saliva, and the creature began to sizzle in its throat. The alien's shoulders rose, its knees bent more, long feet and claws scratching at the rock slab. The second set of jaws, the small square jaws, extended on their bony stick and made one decisive snap. I knew a challenge when I saw one. Dare you. Show yourself. Know you're here. It was a scout. Its job was to tease out whatever was in the path of the others. There could be a dozen behind it, or a hundred. Did they swarm or herd? There was a difference. Rusty and I were only about seven feet apart. The alien stood almost perfectly between us. If it pivoted, that tail could hit either of us. Rusty held his ground right at the edge of the cliff. His blue suit glowed softly, emitting a pale silvery corona all around his body. He was masterful in his stillness and I envied his self-control. I wasn't managing so well. The alien hissed and threatened, turning its long tubular head as if it were listening for clues. 
All its senses were being scrambled or confused by the super suits and somehow it couldn't tell we were here. I had to give a nod of approval to my mother's research team. They'd done it, they'd found out what didn't trigger the aliens' senses. I breathed a wow. The aliens' heads snapped around to face me. I sensed it knew I was here, probably the same deep instinct that told it I was nearby. We sensed each other. Now the sheer terror helped me to freeze in place, the kind of reaction I'd spent my professional life avoiding. Rusty, a silvery man shape a few feet away, made a scrape with his toe. Very short, very deliberate. The alien snapped around. So it could hear, for sure. Its spiny back twisted at my eye level. Its tail floated past my face so close that I had to raise my chin to keep the spike from touching my noise. Rusty stood absolutely still in his silvery corona. The alien hunched its spiny back, its snorkels fanning outward as it moved in small serpentine motions, never quite still, not quite moving. The huge head came down as if to run its teeth along the glow of Rusty's arm. If it pushed, nudged, it would find him. Could I scrape my toe and distract it the way he had done for me? But he was the expert here, the one who knew how to move among the grizzlies. If I took him into the crime district of a major metropolitan area, I'd expect him to let me make the moves. My upper arms twitched, aching. My thighs trembled. The alien's tail whipped past my face again. I had no doubt that Spike could take off my head. Then, just when I felt as if my legs were breaking from tension, the alien relaxed its shoulders and turned its face away from Rusty. The second set of jaws, on their cartilaginous extension rod, drew back into the elongated main teeth, and those teeth closed into their relaxed position. The tail fell lower and stopped whipping, instead moving in gentle balancing motions to the shifting of the body. The creature took on a poised grace, that cobra beauty my mother saw when she looked at them. At this moment of near death, I saw it too. She was right, they were the dogs of Anubis. The supersuits were working. We had a chance to live. Our trust in technology was fulfilled. Turning its body again to the path, the alien changed its posture, bringing its snorkels parallel with each other again and it began to move past us. I saw flicker across the path. Heard something too. A crackle of electric surge. The silver corona around Rusty's suit began to sizzle and change color from silver to a sick yellow. Rusty's head moved, as if to look down at himself. In that deep place in a human mind that recognizes another human's body language after a lifetime of practice, I knew from that small change that he was in trouble. From the other side of the path, I watched with the terrible realization that his suit was malfunctioning. 8. The alien's bullet-shaped face snapped around toward Rusty. Its lips peeled back on a warning hiss. Again the shoulders came up, the knees bent to spring and the tail whipped. Rusty's hands twitched as he tried to decide whether to grab for his power pack or the controls in the thighs of the suit. With each movement he destroyed the finely constructed field of disguise. What the alien saw, I don't know ripples, flickers but it saw something and it crouched into a threat position. My mind raced. What should I do? Distract it? Make myself the target? There was no jumping on it. That was suicide. Rusty shifted in burgeoning panic. His suit chattered and failed entirely with a weak final SCZZ. He ripped back the hood, and in that second the terror in his face was heartbreaking. I don't know why he pulled the hood off something about looking death in the face. Oh, my dear lord, he murmured at the creature, as if it understood. The alien responded with a punctuated roar that separated its main set of teeth into a wide-open spiked weapon. This time the second set of teeth stayed in, but made a sharp snap at Rusty. It leaped at him. Rusty let out a single yelp as the animal sprang. Its long limbs made quick work of the few steps between them. 
As Rusty yanked backward, the alien's teeth clapped shut on the flopping blue hood instead of his head, but its long fingers and claws cupped his head and sank into his shoulder. His arms came up in defense and the two bent into a wicked embrace. A bird in the claws of a young cat, Rusty bellowed in agony and terror. Even in the middle of his desperation, he found the empathy to shout, Run! Run, Rory! And he began to scream that bone-breaking high-pitched scream that can't be faked. Moving was almost a relief. But I didn't run. I pushed off the wall and grabbed the alien by the tail. My hands, in the blue gauntlets, fitted into the spine-like segments and I put all my weight into pulling backward. The animal had Rusty by the hood with its mouth, and its hands had him by the ribs. When I dropped backward, almost dipping my butt to the ground, it parted its teeth, dropped the blue hood, and growled at me. And I almost crapped my trousers. That was some sight. The dead one and the blind had been hideous enough, and now this. I tucked the animal's tail under my left arm and clamped my arm down so I could use my right arm to go after my plasma pistol. I drew on it and fired instinctively. The plasma blast blew a hole in the alien's brain case a little forward of the middle, splattering acid on Rusty, who threw his arms up to shield his face. Acid droplets began to eat away at his sleeves, causing streams of green smoke to rise from the fabric. He made an awful gasping noise and writhed back toward the cliff's edge, and one foot went over the side. He toppled over like a bottle knocked off a table. His weight took the alien with him. I would have fired again, except the first shot caused my supersuit to fritz and spark. Damn. The energy flush must be disrupted by the plasma bolt. A jolt of shame struck as I realized there really had been good reasons for telling us not to take weapons along. As the alien's tail whipped powerfully in my arms, coiling around the back of me, I dropped the plasma pistol. It fell between me and the cliff's edge. Now bearing the weight of Rusty and half of the alien's body, I fell to the ground and used my heels to dig in. That wasn't going to last the physics weren't there. Over the cliff, Rusty gasped and cried out in panic, still in the grip of the alien, and the damn thing wasn't dead yet. As their weight dragged me to the edge, I braced my left foot on the embedded housing for the video unit, clamped my left arm down as tightly as possible, and grabbed outward for my plasma pistol with my right hand, and caught it. I brought it up shooting. Three bolts flew wild, arching down into the ravine 2,000 feet below us in what would have been a real pretty display if only somebody had been around to appreciate it. Rusty and I, we were busy. Just as my legs started to inch over the cliff's edge, I gritted my teeth and aimed, and fired. This bolt went right into the back of the alien's long head and powered through to the front, then took out its entire excuse for a face. The skull case broke in half the long way and fell to the sides in two unevenly cut pieces. In a final convulsion it dropped Rusty. With one long pitiful howl, Rusty tumbled into the ravine, his arms flapping and legs pumping. I dropped the animal's big tail, and it went over too. Together they spun into the depths. I twisted around and looked over in time to lose them both in the toupee of overgrowth below. Another second, and Rusty's cry abruptly stopped. Not only had I lost a good man, I'd now lost the only other person who knew this was no paradise about to be born. Would anyone else believe me? And then, I heard the crunching sound. The rolling sound. The advanced scout was dead, but his roars had been heard. I got up and ran. Somehow I still had my plasma pistol in my right hand but my left gauntlet was missing, probably over the cliff, caught in the alien's tail. My suit stopped fritzing because I wasn't shooting. I ran down the grade, hearing the clicks and hisses of aliens, no idea how many, behind me all the way. I tried to tell myself it was my imagination, that I was just spooked, overwrought, scared, but, no, they were there, coming for me. At the bottom of the grade I skidded to a halt and, lungs heaving,
tried to stand pet again, to stand perfectly still and let the suit reboot itself and begin the masking technique it was developed for. If it fooled one of them, it could fool several. A whole herd. Right? I tried to stand still. Maybe I didn't do it right. The suit began to glow and make that faint hum, only to fritz and crackle just when it got going. I'd wrecked it. I'd ruined the effect by shooting my plos. The electromagnetic pulse had completely fried my only hope. I had to live through this hour. I had to save these people. If there were more like Rusty, but afraid to speak up, and I had to save Clark and Bonnie, so close to falling under my mother's spell. The message of the slaughter fields had to be delivered. At the top of the grade, in the last vestige of the setting sunlight, I saw them. They were black silhouettes against the crest of the hill and the evening horizon, a solid line of undulating heads and tails, hands and snorkels, as if dozens of aliens were being melted into a black stew. The suit fritzed again, as if to say, Go! I fired twice over my shoulder as I ran. Shrieks rewarded my shots, but also howls of anger. The suit crackled one final time, overwhelmed by the energy flush from the pistol. It was all done. I rounded a bend, went through the stick-like field, jumped and dodged the seemingly endless carpet of corpses in all their many stages of decay, racing the best I could in the fading light through the killing field that would soon describe the whole planet, if these creatures had their way. If I survived, what could I say to the others? Were there more like Rusty, but afraid to speak up? His suit had failed, that was no coincidence. Fresh power pack, sure. It didn't take a forensic team to add that up, did it? This was what my mother meant by a last walk. They were on me the whole way back. I didn't know whether they could outrun me or whether they had the inclination to and wasn't interested in clocking them but I'll bet I set a record or two that I could wave under the noses of a few high school acquaintances. I traveled down two slides on my ass, which shaved off seconds and put a whole new definition to thinking with my legs, like Clark said. When I hit familiar territory I was rewarded with a surge of victory, like maybe I'd actually get out of this alive. Only then, when I caught sight of the patch of landscape which I knew was the projector drapery, did I skid to an insane halt and catch myself on a glassy stump? I couldn't go in there. I couldn't blow everybody else's cover. If just one alien saw me run through the opening, every person inside was doomed. With a sinking stomach I veered away from the hiding place. I hoped I'd turned in the direction of the ship, like possibly I could make it back there and hope somebody would open the ramp for me, hope they were on their toes because I had no idea how to make the ramp open from the outside. Nobody had ever taught me that, who'd have thought I'd need to know it? Before I even made it up the flume, while still in sight of the projector curtain, they rounded the bend and closed on me. They swept past the hiding place and up the flume toward me. I fired again with my plasma pistol, repeating the shots, hoping to discourage them. My plas was beginning to weaken, almost out of power. It was never meant to be an assault weapon, fired more than eight or ten times. It was just for self-defense. Self-defense, what a joke. The rank of Xenos were behind me, and now two of them appeared in front of me. They'd headed me off. Skidding to a halt, with nowhere to run, flanked by glass columns and trapped on every side. I shouted wildly in that last moment when all I could do to save my life was shout, even knowing it wouldn't work. And they were on me. One of them came out of the circle as they closed on me, possibly a leader or just the one that got to me first. I threw my drain plaza at its head. The gun made a silly pock on the creature's skull and bounced to the skulch. The animal looked down at the gun, and at that moment I leaned back on a broken glass stump and brought my foot around in the best kick of my life. I knocked out some of its teeth. Good for points, but it had no effect except to make the creature mad at me. Come on! I screamed. Come on! It tilted its head at me and hissed. 
the jaws parted and the second set made a quick series of snaps at me. The other aliens closed around us, making an unbreachable fortress for my demise. My pounding heart slowed and I could suddenly breathe again as I accepted my fate. Make it fast, I said. The creature stiffened before me, hunkering into a threat position. Its claws clicked inches from my face. A soft, long noise began on a finger of wind. It came from over the rocks, through the glass spires, from far away, like thunder. No, not thunder, this sound was like the low hum of a brass instrument, a baritone or a trombone, or two together making a chord. I thought at first it was the sound of my blood running cold. Then I knew it was real sound and I was really hearing it. The alien before me raised its head and turned the great long skull as if trying to hear the location of the trombone call. Its companions did the same, each turning its head in the same direction. Was I still alive? For a few seconds, I honestly wasn't sure. The long moaning call grew in intensity over the land. The aliens around me straightened to their full heights and extended their tails horizontal with the ground. Inside the smoke glass tops of their skulls, the flesh of their brains, or whatever that was, began to ripple and buzz in answer. The buzz increased and became the same low, moaning, brassy call. The alien in front of me stepped back. It lowered its hands and tail, shoulders, and snorkels. I recognized the passive stance. For creatures I hadn't wanted to be anywhere near, never thought I would get to know. I recognized a lot all of a sudden. Through the long moaning call, I had the shouts of human voices. At the crest of the flume, Colonel Matt Cormick appeared with Clark, flanked by Carmichael, Edney, Pocket, Bonnie, and Tad, and in the middle of them, oddly out of place, appeared my mother. She was yanking Matt Cormick's arm just as he raised his weapon, and Edney had to kick at Tad to get him to leave her alone with her weapon raised. I got the idea they'd charged out of the blind against her orders, and she and Tad had been sucked out with them, trying to stop them. Carmichael and Edney raised theirs also and prepared for Matt Cormick's order to volley. I raised my hand in a signal to them. Stop! Matt Cormick, ever alert, caught the motion and held fire. The other Marines, well drilled, did the same. The fluttering inside the aliens' brain cases became softer, all at once. It was as if they were all singing in a choir, being directed by some conductor in the sky. They lowered their heads and drew up their tails, let their arms down and became sordidly calm, reminding me of black storm clouds. I motioned again to the others to stand still, not break the sorcery. What were we seeing? The alien right in front of me the one who had been about to take my head off, relaxed suddenly. The deep sound of horns tapered off and echoed into nothing. The land was once again still in the last vestige of sunset. The last ray of the sun lay on the head of this alien. I pushed myself up off the stump and braced my legs, standing before the animal in a truly eerie quality. This was like being haunted. Armored by the heady drug of having accepted my death, I was emboldened to reach out. I slapped the animal in the head. Its head tipped sideways, then came back straight. It made no moves to retaliate. It didn't want the fight I was trying to pick. Didn't want or wasn't allowed. I didn't know which. I took off my right gauntlet and slammed the creature right in the mouth. It shook that great head almost the way a horse shakes its withers but it wouldn't attack me. Well, dang, I grumped. I wanted, strangely enough, to ask my mother what she thought of this. Maybe she knew. As if called by a mental signal, Ma'am moved forward from the others, leaving Matt Cormick and the Marines, Bonnie, Clark, Pocket, and Tad stood poised to run, shocked by the stillness. My mother came closer, daring to step between two aliens who simply turned their eyeless faces toward her and stepped back to let her pass. What's happening? I choked. What, what is this? 
mammoth's petite body, in khakis and still build like the ballet dancer she had been in her youth, turned in a delicate pirouette of study. I'll tell you what's happening, she murmured. This is a giant leap forward. As my chest ached with plain old terror, she came to the center of the circle of aliens. She raised her wrist to her lips and touched the communication link strapped to it. All of you, come out. It's safe to come out. Graciela, bring everyone out. This is history. You must see this. In mere moments, the other researchers, led by my astonished sister, appeared in the line of humans at the crest of the flume. My sister stared, poised for something she couldn't predict, and with her came Diego, Severo, Chantal, Dixie, Neil, Oliver, and the others. Amazing, really. They had all actually come out at my mother's call, without the slightest question. Were they more afraid of her than of the aliens? Could that actually be true? And there she was, arms raised in honor of the creatures standing here in the small area with us. You must see this, she had said. What she really meant was, you must see me. Come, she said to the audience. Come, witness all of you, and you who are ready to exterminate them, you, who can now go home. Witness this evolutionary leap. I told you it would happen. Nature is controlling them. A necromancer performing her dance macabre, she raised her graceful hands. We can walk among them. I don't believe in my life or any time in history I've heard of a more fulfilled human being than my mother at this arcane moment of transcendence. For her, this was a religious experience. The gods had opened the doors and invited her in. She was allowing us to see, to be her witnesses, not exactly to walk in with her. We all stood stupefied, waiting for the spell to be broken and chaos to erupt. For a while it didn't. Then, it did. Just as we were beginning to believe that we might be safe through some bizarre favor of providence, a chittering noise broke the enchantment. I heard Bonnie gasp. She clapped her hands to her mouth. Matt Cormick spun to his right, then left. Carmichael and Edney brandished their weapons. Suddenly, leaping from glass pillar to glass pillar, came a squall line of face huggers on the attack. Pocket grabbed Bonnie and shoved her toward me, toward the middle of the circle of Xenos. Tad and Gracie came together into what might very well be a final embrace. The huggers moved with breathtaking speed, sensing that several of them could fulfill their genetic goal today to impregnate a creature with their seeds of doom down some poor sap's throat. And here we were, sitting ducks. Oh, God, Gracie croaked. A trap. Our mother twirled again, looking now at the horrid position we were all in. Thanks to her, we were all in it together. She brought everyone out to witness the wonder. Matt Cormick shouldered his weapon in a quick movement but at the same instant the parasites began to leap, all at once. No volley could get them all without also killing all of us. All he could hope to do was take ballistic shots and maybe bring down a few of them before they overwhelmed. For the third time today I prepared myself to die, and again I got a shock. The aliens flanking my mother turned and snatched the face huggers out of the air by their fingers, by their tails by the body like lobsters snatched from nets. More and more facehuggers attacked, only to be snatched out of the air by their own adult soldiers. High-pitched shrieking drove us to cover our ears and writhe toward the ground while the adult Xenos ripped into the huggers, whipping them like toys, smashing them into rocks, tearing their limbs off and casting them away to flop in desperation on the ground. Acid spurted and bones snapped as loudly as firecrackers as the butchery gained momentum. What moments ago had been an unspoiled clearing now became a slaughter zone. Facehuggers tried to leap to reach us, and I saw Bonnie, then Matt Cormick pointedly rescued at the last moment by the adult aliens. It was sheer deliberate butchery. Instead of attacking us, they were attacking their own. 9. Come on! 
Matt Cormick waved the direction back toward the blind, then snatched my mother by the wrist and dragged her out of a tornado of aliens slaughtering their own offspring. I dodged between two slashing tails and scrambled in the same direction just as a parasite was swung through the air by its tail, eight fingers scrambling, and was splattered on a glass pillar like a bug hitting a window. I dodged sideways into a jet of spittle from one of the adults as it sprinted to catch a facehugger just as the grabby little bastard would have clamped onto my head. The hugger squealed and was dragged back into the cockfight. We out-of-place humans dodged toward each other, trying to get out of the middle of the maelstrom. Matt Cormick took a few shots and blew away one or two huggers, as the other marines quickly coordinated an escape through the catfight of aliens. Pocket was there to pull me over the crest. What did you do? He yelped, his ponytail bouncing between his shoulder blades. Pissed them off somehow. Move. Tad dragged Gracie, Clark pushed Bonnie, Matt Cormick hauled Ma'am, the other Marines led the way, and we ran for our silly little lives from the deliberate extermination of seeds by the very tree that had borne them. I knew a window of opportunity when I saw it, as did we all. For the first time since leaving Earth, everybody on this planet was of one mind. We flew back the way we'd come, to the curtain entrance to the blind, and I guess we just hoped none of the aliens was watching to see where we went. Sometimes you just have to make the dive and hope for the best. I was the last one in. I pulled the delicate curtain closed, remembering only at the last moment that it was actually delicate, and took a last look over the crest of the flume. No aliens appeared to see our hideaway. Still, I could hear them. The noise of the Holocaust going on over the hill was accompanied by a smothering odor of acid and oil. Shut it, shut it. Clark panted at my side. He pushed the curtain closed. You haven't seen enough? I wish I knew what I just saw. Where's my mother? Ma'am. Yes. Here. She was lost in the crowd of taller people. Keep your voice down. With Herculean effort, I dialed down the volume as I pushed between Tad and Gracie to face her down. What did we just see? What was that all about? Gracie edged between me and our mother. Don't speak to her in that tone. Tone? What did we just witness out there? Why would the adults rip their own young to shreds? Ma'am began to pace quietly. Their priorities have shifted, obviously. We have to test this, Gracie said anxiously. Make experiments, design trials, compare dash. I growled, how about if we evacuate and worry about comparisons a long time from now? Our mother snapped her fingers at us. Be quiet, I told you. You could risk all our lives with your noise. Ah, I wouldn't want to do that. Admit that you've lost control of this situation, if you ever had it. She raised her green eyes to me. Not at all. What's going on, ma'am? I demanded. They not only didn't kill us, but they refused to fight with us. What makes consummate predators suddenly sublime? It was like a feeding frenzy, Bonnie pointed out, except with their own kind. In a frenzy, anything is fair game. They were very particular about what they killed. One of them deliberately pulled a spider thing off my leg and broke it in half. She showed the torn trouser near her ankle. I nodded and pointed at Bonnie's leg. That's right. Why did they kill their own kind? Why did they protect us? Clark, now sitting exhausted on a crate, raised his head. They did protect U.S., didn't they? Bonnie parted her lips to speak, then held back, no doubt intimidated by my mother and sister, who were such experienced scientists while Bonnie felt she was just starting. Say it, I charged her. She flinched. Oh. I. Go ahead. She floundered briefly under the scrutiny of these experts. Aggressive predators only protect three things, their young, their territory, and their prey. Oh, 
That's helpful, Gracie snarled. As informative as an after-school special. She waved her hand at me. This is the kind of experts you bring along and you have the gall to question us? Are you even going to ask about Rusty? Ma'am faced me with a bitter glare. Rusty was incautious. He took too much time. Because of you, no doubt. My mother continued her pacing, with her arms folded and one hand pressed to her lips. This is new, she admitted. Behavioral changes like this are scientific gold. There's no record of any such behavior en masse. Life is fighting back. She paused in front of Clark and faced him. You must take your ship and go. My team can't leave now. This could go on for months. Years. I can study them. Catalog unimagined volumes of information. We've stumbled upon a treasure. Everything is different. They've accepted us. Bonnie's eyes got big with recognition as the fantasy began to flag and she finally saw my mother for the obsessed phantom she was. I didn't like seeing the illusion die, but was glad to have Bonnie entirely on my side. Whatever happens, my mother went on, no one must leave the blind until the area is completely clear. We have no way to define this behavior dash. Oh, wrong, I said. If we can walk through them, then this is the perfect time to leave. This is the time to stay, ma'am countered. Nature has given us a doorway. This shift in focus could go on for months. Years. We can study them and they will even protect us. A team of synthetics can do this work. I said, matching her tone. It's time to cash in our chips and honor the people who have died here and move out. All of us should head straight for the ship and get the bejeebers out of here. Tonight. Seconded. Pocket supported. Sounds firm to me, Matt Cormick chimed. Gracie rounded on him. Great, coming from a man who led them into this mess without knowing what he was facing. Why don't you just plan the next picnic too? You can leave, our mother said, unmasking some of the bitterness she held toward me. But in the morning, when things are calmer. This area is dangerous now, you foolish boys. This is not the time to listen to my son's juvenile defiance. I thought you said they go underground where they pick up ambient something at night, so night is better for moving around. Do you know these creatures or not? I agree with Mr. Malvo, the colonel said. We're going to bug out as soon as possible and all the researchers are going to be compelled to come with us. The situation's too volatile to leave anybody here. Mana's eyes narrowed and shifted to him, but she said nothing. Behind her Gracie wrinkled her nose in contempt. Tad slipped his hand onto her shoulder, but he also said nothing. I need a chance to think this through, Clark uttered. We sure can't go out there right now. They could just as easily turn on us again. You will wait until they move on, my mother said. Decisions about your ship can be made in the morning. In a compound such as this, you learn to be patient and wait things out. She sought out the crowd of confused and spooked people. Neil dear, be sure all the video feeds are recording. We'll want to have records of this new behavior. Chantal and Ethan, be sure to process all the data as soon as possible. If there are large flocks moving, we must know the dynamics and behavioral subtleties. Paul, we will need readings of atmospheric changes, if any. Diego, Dixie, all of you, don't be so overwhelmed that we miss opportunities. Monitor your posts. Gather data. Find answers. Neil, pale and shaken, glanced around self-consciously and acted as if he couldn't believe he was being asked to do something so mundane at this monumental moment. He went off into the maze of chambers, followed by Chantal and Ethan. After a few seconds, Paul, the weather and rock guy, went off into another tunnel. Diego, the bacteria guy, lingered a little, then he too went somewhere. 
Zaviro looked uneasy, then trundled off to do something about bugs. Before long, only Bonnie, Clark, Pocket, and the Marines were left here with me, my mother, my sister, and Tad. The smaller group seemed more intimate, more manageable. I stalked away, knowing that I needed to get control and think clearly. My mother always brought out the worst in me, even when she wasn't trying. Hey Rory, Clark called. He got up and came to me, took me by the arm and turned me so he could look at the side of my leg. You're bleeding. I twisted around to look at the back of my right thigh. Yeah, ripped super suit and blood. Okay, thanks. You want attention? Bonnie asked. I have, I have my kit somewhere. I gazed down at my bloody thigh. Clark held my arm, and we paused there, each thinking about different things. During that moment of calm, a little oasis of time during which my wildly ranging thoughts began to coalesce, I suddenly fell silent and just stared at my leg. Predators, prey, territory, prey, prey. But nobody knew whether the aliens ate humans. We just knew they used humans. We might not be prey. We were something else. Not prey, not their young, not their territory, what were we to them? In the big scheme, why would they protect us? You okay? Clark asked. I blinked at him. His honest face and tousled red hair, pure concern for me in the middle of possibly losing his dream and ending up maybe dead, this was one pure and simple guy. Simple, I murmured. There has to be a simple answer. They all watched me. I felt like an egg about to hatch. Like what? Clark asked. Just as the pain finally hit me and my legs started to throb, I uttered, I don't know yet. But what if they snap out of it? The answer seemed to float just outside my reach. Graciela, my mother spoke up, and Tad, please, check the perimeters. Do a heat seek check. Secure all the openings and post watchers. I think we're safe for now. This behavior could continue indefinitely. We have a new chapter, and we must take the responsibility of careful data keeping. Nothing will happen until morning, and then we will escort these intruders back to their ship. She looked at Clark, then at me. They cannot legally terraform a planet with potentially intelligent life. The problem is over. They will leave us in peace. I wouldn't bet on that, I warned. No sense letting her fantasize anymore. After a calculated pause for Flair, she turned and led Gracie and Tad out of the chamber. We were alone. Us intruders. Sit here, Rory. Bonnie opened a folding chair that Pocket handed her. I'll bandage that. Strip out of that suit, Pocket told me. Like a gang of personal assistants, they plucked and pulled until the super suit was a lump on the floor, with its sensitive science and its torn leg. I pulled on a t-shirt and sweatpants that Pocket conjured up. Now, that was a good bosun, able to come up with merchandise in a completely foreign environment. He had a touch, for sure. Suddenly I was a lot more comfortable and for some reason felt very vulnerable. Clark stuffed me into the folding chair. I hadn't even noticed that they had chairs at all, and I hung my arm over the back and sat sideways so Bonnie to could clean up my leg. I had no idea when the injury had happened, no idea whether it was from a tail slash or a shard of red glass. Didn't care. Clark sat down nearby. Matt Cormick and his two Marines tried to get comfortable without exactly relaxing. She didn't ask, I uttered. Who didn't ask what? Pocket knelt beside Bonnie and helped her clean my wounded thigh. My mother, I said. She didn't even ask what happened to Rusty. She just said he wasn't cautious enough. She wasn't interested in what actually happened to get him killed. You think she doesn't care? I think she already knew. Matt Cormick leaned closer, suddenly interested. 
He waved back the two younger Marines, who were clearly spooked and out of their element. Clark shook his head. Don't get paranoid on us, Rory. You know they can see a lot with those installations of video feeds. She probably already knew because it was fed through on a camera. Keep your head. Keep my head? I'm trapped here with a bunch of eco-terrorist bug huggers. This is her dream? To be out there in the middle of those things? My mother actually thinks that if she learns enough, she can live among those things? This isn't an expedition. It's a cult. Bonnie, what do you think? Clark asked. You're a doctor and you know a lot about animals. Have you ever heard of something like what we saw out there? We all looked at her, which caused Bonnie to flush with self-consciousness. I'm not the expert. Mrs. Malvo might be right, but... Go ahead, I said. You're as smart as she is. She smiled in a small way. Oh, wow, thanks. Was she right? Clark prodded. Could this period of change, whatever the change is, when they leave us alone and go after each other, could it last for years? Are you asking me about precedence in nature? Whatever you think. She dabbed antiseptic on my wound, which I have to say was finally waking up and starting to hurt, and took her time formulating an answer. It might last, she finally ventured, but violent behavior within the same species doesn't usually represent a norm doesn't usually last protracted lengths of time. In other words, pocket finished, we're not all that safe. We're not safe at all, I told them. Clark, you have to stick to your original mission. Evac this planet and release the PPs to eradicate the aliens. We have to save these people. There must be more like Rusty, who want to go home but are afraid to speak up. You have to take charge. You and the colonel here. She's got this come by a thing going with these people she pretends to care about, but whenever they die, somehow it's their fault. It's never her fault or the fact that they're here, and it's certainly never the alien's fault. These laws don't fit the situation anymore. You have to make a decision, Clark, maybe one that's beyond the letter of the law. You have to be a captain and not just one of the drones. Sucks. Pocket commented. No mission, no bonuses. Oh, there'll be bonuses, Matt Cormick spoke up. For the next ship. What next ship? Bonnie asked. The one that comes after we go home, and releases the PPs that we didn't release. You don't think this is a done deal, do you? Clark twisted to look up at the colonel. That's right. Pocket exclaimed. It'll get done anyway, and nobody'll ever trust the Vinza crew for another mission. We'll be space dust. You'll retire, all right, Clark, I said, and some other guy'll come out here and do to those aliens what they do to everything in their way. Clark put his hand out to calm the storm. I'm not releasing a hundred thousand robotic hunter killers until I think this out, bonus or no bonus, retire or not. I don't want to break the law. This is bigger than the law, I said. The Alien Species Act is fiction. It was made up before any of the details were known, before anybody really knew anything. There was one rumor of one ship fifty-odd years ago, and one expedition from which I don't think anybody survived. It's based on nothing. On my mother's imagination. A rosy picture, I might add, and with money and influence she pushed it through. Let me ask you this, can you believe that, after we get back and tell this story, that the Alien Species Act won't see a lot of amendments and refinements? Clark shrugged. True. Then how can you suffer over obeying it? It's a hollow law, Clark. Yeah. He seemed to be accepting my argument. I knew his only real doubts were about himself, and not really about what I was saying. Being the captain, he wanted to make sure he wasn't being influenced by friendship. If I'd had the time, I'd have respected that. I just want the time to think for a few minutes. Well, think fast, I said, 
because somebody around here is working against us. And I don't mean spreading rumors. Clark moaned and mumbled, don't jump to conclusions. I twisted around, pulling my leg out of pocket's grip and messing up the bandaging process. Turning to face them all, I motioned Bonnie to leave my leg alone for now. Conclusions? Let me give you some meat for conclusions. What happened to Donahue and Brand? How did they get killed by aliens if they were inside the ship's protection grid? We found Donahue on the edge of the grid, Matt Cormick reminded. I can't be sure he wasn't over the line. Or maybe he was killed inside the line and dumped at the edge, so you wouldn't be sure. Clark parted his lips to argue, then paused and waited to hear me out. And when we found him, I went on, there was no acid anywhere around him. Not on his uniform, not on the ground, his hands weren't burned, the tail spike that killed him would have been full of acid if he'd blown it off the animal himself. Maybe you haven't had the tour in here. Just a few steps away is a museum of alien parts, all cleaned out and mounted. Rory. Clark murmured. Tail spikes used as weapons? Come on, who'd think of that? I just did. I wouldn't put it past a few blood relations to think of it too. Or passionate cultists. They thought of a few other creative things, like using those huts as incubation chambers. Can you imagine those poor people? Able to see out, watching each other's chests explode and the little larvae racing out, knowing what was coming to them? No wonder Diego's wife hanged herself before it happened. Bonnie shuddered and let out a gush of sorrow. Horrible. What about Brand? Matt Cormick asked. You don't think they used those? That maybe he was strangled by one of those parasites that was already dead? I said. Yeah, I might be enticed to entertain that idea, Colonel, since there were no scratches on his hands or face. I allowed a pause while they all traveled back in their minds to see that I was right about that. There are a handful of us on the planet and the first ones to die are our colonial marines? Think about military tactics. The first advantages you want to take away from your enemy are his guards. Your mother, that little woman? Clark wondered. She overwhelmed three marines? Or Tad, or somebody in her thrall. You'd better make the direct charge, Matt Cormick said, if you're going to. I need to know exactly what you're saying. With a wince at the freshening pain in my leg, I fixed my gaze on him and gave him what he wanted. Monsters do exist, I told him. But they're human. 10. Life goes on day by day in the universe, and every once in a millennium pauses for the truly surreal. All the rest of us shrank back into the blind, unable to read the situation, knowing things were changing too fast to predict. Scientists want to be able to predict everything. It's their lives' work. They were uneasy, I could tell. What made us even more uneasy was my mother's behavior. Not only was she Jocasta Malvo, but she was into being Jocasta Malvo, as if it were a title and not just an identity. She proved this to us in the most poetic illustration possible. She went out of the blind alone. We huddled inside, watching through the projector curtain as she walked out farther and farther, as far as she could and still be seen. Being seen was important. There were adult aliens all around us now, though they hadn't been tipped off to the location of the blind. Even my mother wasn't quite that enraptured yet, to give away our only hiding place. What's she doing? Clark asked as we stood side by side, with Pocket and Matt Cormick. Around us were a few researchers Paul, the microbiologist, Chantal, the vet, Neil, the camp director, and Ethan, the crowd dynamics guy. Their presence made me wonder where the others were, and why they weren't here watching the show. It was nearly dark, but the big green striped moon provided a conveniently bright glow across the landscape and we were able to make out everything. The moon was big, bigger than Earth's moon, or closer or something, so the glow was luminous and the shadows sharp. 
I motioned Clark to silence, and we watched as my mother walked out to meet the aliens. Of those which were wandering by in seeming aimlessness, not like before, when they had moved in one direction with purpose, two noticed my mother. Then, a third. They've got her, Matt Cormack announced. I think he was warning me that my mother was very likely to die right now, before my eyes, in case I wanted to look away. I didn't. In fact, I disgusted myself by wondering if that wouldn't make things a lot simpler for all of us. She was a lightning rod. Without her, the club would crumble. Would it help if the aliens took the struggle away? My own mother, what was I thinking? What had I turned into? My soul was saved by a strong desire to rush out there and drag her back. I was stopped by the fascinating sight as she raised her hands to them the way she might to beloved horses in a stable. Morbid curiosity took over as the three aliens undulated closer to her. They were snake-like in their movements, never quite still, though not quite advancing. Even standing over her, touching her with their tail tips and moving their toothy jaws along her sides and upraised arm, they continually shifted and coiled, uncoiled and flexed. One by one they lowered their snouts into her palms as if she were feeding them by hand. This was her dream, her quest, to walk among them. I knew the other researchers were somewhere in the complex, eyes fixed to monitor screens, watching the prophecy come true. This could only make things worse. These people had to be evacuated before the spell was broken. I bit my lip and shook my head. I swear she's scarier than those things. I sat by myself in the museum chamber, mostly twitching and trying to think clearly. Sudden decisions could have tragic consequences and I had to make sure we were acting with good sense and not just acting. The hardest part would be figuring out who among the campers was working with us and who was working against us, who we would have to drag, and who would happily run to the ship once they were freed from the spell of the wicked Jocasta of the West. The museum chamber seemed to be my favorite place, with its giant creature staring, or whatever it did, down at me. In here, I was able to look my enemy in the face, if not the eyes, and try to measure him up. And there wasn't usually anybody else in here, so the chance to be alone was a factor. Which was why I flinched when somebody came into the chamber. I looked up and discovered the visitor was Carmichael, the boy marine. Hello, sir. Sorry if I disturbed you. He had a slight squeak in his voice, as if puberty weren't quite finished. Private, I greeted. Resting up? Patrol, sir. Interior. Guarding something from coming in here or us from going out? Don't really know, sir. He sniffed and muttered, sure wish I did. You've been pretty quiet this whole mission. Not much to say, sir. Gonna have a lot of stories to tell, though, assuming I get back, that is. Wait till my folks hear about all this. Where are your parents? Waukesha, Wisconsin. Hey, I'm from Milwaukee. That's what I heard, sir. Have a seat. I. I don't think I should. You deserve it. I patted the folding chair next to mine. He sat down beside me, but kept his pulse rifle right against his chest. How old are you? I asked. Twenty-two, sir. You can call me Rory. I'm not much into the sir thing. What's your first name? He made a face. Mike. Mike? Yeah. Michael Carmichael? Yeah. I rewarded him with a cranky laugh. Mothers can be such turkeys. Yeah. What would you rather have had? I asked. If you could choose your own name. I. I always, my grandfather's always been great to me. He was a war veteran, like. He's why I joined the Corps. I always admired him. He's got this real strong first name. Go ahead. Ah, no. 
It's dumb. Nah, go ahead. What is it? Kensington. Shit, I shouldn't have said it. Sounds so dumb. Kensington Carmichael? No, his name is O'Keefe. His last name. Kensington O'Keefe, I tested. I like that. You're right, it's great sounding. Has a lot of character. Yeah, yeah, it sure does. Sure does. I slap my knees. Well, let's just do it. Do what? Change your name. Come on. People do it all the time. No kidding? Just like that? Yup. On your feet. He bounded to his feet and twitched with anticipation, adjusting his uniform, and finally shouldered his weapon. I stood up too and squared off in front of him. Ready? He whipped his hat off. Ready. I looked around and picked up a drinking straw left behind on a desk and tapped him on the shoulder. I, Detective Rory Theodore Malvo, Duke of Earl, do dub the Private Kensington Carmichael, Colonial Marine Corps, Esquire. Carmichael beamed and gasped, oh, man. We shook hands vigorously, enjoying the moment. Can I call you Ken? I asked. His grin could have lit up Broadway. Ken. Thanks. I offered a sort of goofy salute, and he responded. Better get on with your patrol, I said. You're a whole new man now. Yeah, thanks. When he left, I didn't sit down again. Somehow the conversation with him had relaxed my brain and given me some focus. I knew what I had to do. I went looking for my sister again. She was fanatical and devoted, but there had to be some line of communication that would work. We protected each other a lot when we were kids. She'd grown up knowing our mother wasn't exactly like the other girl's mothers, or anybody's for that matter, and I'd grown up knowing I didn't count for much. There had to be some of that lingering inside her heart and survivalist exterior. Right? What the heck? I was desperate. Clinging to delusions actually helped somehow. Or at least maybe I would eliminate some dead ends. The chambers were mostly darkened, lit only by tiny red lights that allowed us to move around without stumbling, but caused no glow or sharp shadows. Like a ship's bridge in red alert, we could function almost in the dark. I passed by several people, hunched over screens watching the delirious scene of my mother in communion with her subjects. Others muttered to each other and tried to distill the tons of new information they'd picked up. To me, it was one or two interesting episodes. To them, it was a flood of data. Scientists who looked at things in microslivers were pulling apart the fabric of our day and trying to reassemble it into something they could sift for patterns. People who devoted their entire lives to translating one page of manuscript had stumbled upon a whole library. The hideout was really an ant colony of pockets joined by tunnels. Until now, I'd only been in a few of the chambers, but now I toured quietly, by myself, deliberately not disturbing anyone else, whether they were working or trying to sleep. The darkness helped. When I heard Gracie's voice in one of the lab chambers, I stayed in the tunnel without coming out into the chamber. She was talking to someone. This wasn't the voice of the shrill sycophant nor the gruff defender of science I'd heard earlier. This was much softer, more fearful, fraught with passion and urgency. I couldn't make out the words, but the emotions were there. I'd heard enough impassioned whispering in jail cells and interrogation rooms. I peeked into the chamber, taking a chance. There they were in silhouette against a bank of working screens that showed the activities of the day, aliens and huggers, replays of my adventures and Bonnie's, speed takes of Matt Cormick and the Marines in action, like flashes of bad dreams. The pictures glowed behind the forms of my sister and the stealth guy, Tad, locked in an embrace and whispering to each other. I tried to hear what they were saying. No good. 
they were too good at being quiet and still getting their messages across. They probably lived like this all the time, sneaking kisses, murmuring in corners, no privacy, no future. What could I overhear, anyway? Lover's promises? I backed up into the tunnel, then made a big deal out of stomping my way into the chamber. When I unfolded myself and coughed to make sure they'd heard me, they were on two sides of the chamber, with Gracie seated at the monitor bank. Tad did a poorer job of disguising their tryst. Hi, I said amiably. Hope I didn't wake you. We're awake, Tad said coldly. He looked at Gracie. I'm gonna go. Okay, she agreed. You want me to stay? He looked at me, but he was talking to her. She glanced at me. No, I can handle him. He would rather have stayed, but didn't. I gave him ten seconds to get way down the corridor and watch to make sure he wasn't lurking around as I had. I tugged a bulk food crate up to the monitor bank and sat down on it. Gracie, I need your help. No fireworks, okay? Her face was patched with moving lights from the screens, and she self-consciously checked the snaps on her shirt to make sure they were closed all the way to her collar. Oh, I'll jump right up, then. I tried to calm her by using a very even tone. This isn't sibling rivalry. This is official business. I need your help getting these people off the planet. You can influence, ma'am. Think so? You have to evacuate. Everybody. All we want is for you to evacuate without a fight. That's all, she lilted sarcastically. Gosh, why didn't you say so? Until you showed up in that carnival wagon, with all your calliopes chiming, we were successfully hiding and observing a hive of xenos in their natural environment. Cut the toe dancing, I said more sharply. This isn't their natural environment. They came here as aliens, same as us. They're on a slaughter mission, same as us. Has anybody studied them? Did you do autopsies? Analyses? Did any of you try to figure out how to fight them? We don't want to fight them. We want to live with them. That only works if they agree. They're closing in. You're all doomed if you stay. That means I can't allow you to stay. We've been successfully hidden for months. They didn't know we were here until you. They knew you were here all along. They've spent those months closing the noose. Haven't you looked at Ethan's crowd control data? They don't know to close any nooses. You're making that up. She hunched her shoulders and tapped at her keyboard communicating that the work was far more important than anything I had to say. You're just uncomfortable because you're not the top of the food chain anymore. You think they're ugly because they're a different kind of parasite than humans are. If we can grow beyond our parasitic ways, who's to say another species can't grow beyond theirs? They're beautiful animals and they're here living their lives, unless we gum it all up for them. You and your genocidal robots. Why is it any animal, all the time? Why don't humans ever come first? Because they don't deserve to. They? What are you, a cornflake? You never give humanity credit for doing anything good. Oh, like what? Bless me, I actually had the answer. Like cherishing culture while embracing change. Oh, sure, we embrace a lot. She spat, rewarding me with a cold glower. What have we got to show for ourselves in the galaxy? We've wiped out entire cultures of our own kind, killed ancient languages Gaelic, Sanskrit, Assyrian. Or, I punctuated, maybe they just played themselves out and weren't needed anymore. Did you ever think of that? Maybe the unification of language is the great victory of cultural oneness you always wish for. Or you say you do. You hate when it really happens. Maybe the fading away of ancient cultures means we're finally getting together. People are always sentimental about the wrong things. Don't yell. Hold your voice down. 
you never had any self-control. She went back to poking at the keyboard and adjusting the screen, which showed several windows of data that could have been critical or could have been nonsense. No idea which. I had to admit she was right about that. If I'd had any self-control, I'd have turned down this mission in favor of an enforcement officer who could be dispassionate about my mother, my sister, and the dubious sides of their work. I came here to get as far from humanity as I could, she continued, almost musing. Humanity is the only species that wipes out other species. Gracie, that's eco-head crap. I was even quieter this time. How jaded can you get? You sound like ma'am on meth. Species have been getting wiped out for millions of years without humanity's help. It's the natural cycle. Thousands of species lived for eons and died natural deaths before humanity ever appeared. Who can say that's not a success? I can say it. And I say keeping them going artificially is a travesty. It can't be done. You can only keep that sort of thing going for so long. Remember the Chinese panda? The millions of dollars poured into the futile effort to save them? Never was there a species more determined to go extinct. They couldn't breed, they only ate one thing. Why don't you write an article or go on a concert tour? You can waste your life protecting a tree, but eventually it'll die its own death in its own time and you can't stop it. And you shouldn't. Maybe our being here, Clark with his payload, maybe we are the natural chain of events playing out. Maybe we're the hand of nature this time. Have you ever thought of that? You're not the hand of nature, Rory. You're just another passionate murderer. She twisted in her chair to face me and leaned forward to make her point. We know what you did, you know. Ma'am and I. We know how you did it. Mr. Law Enforcement, Mr. Detective, Mr. Defender of the People. When push came to shove, you abandoned the law. You cut that man's arms off and let his life bleed out. No trial, no due process, you just took the law into your hands and carried out a sentence. And wasn't it brutal, too? Wasn't it ugly and cruel? Wasn't it savage? You're the real monster. Not them. Not us. How far could I get with this barricade between us? She was bitter and angry on a deep level, deeper than the things she was saying. This fury went back to our childhoods. Determined to keep the issue in the moment, I shifted gears, a little. Okay, I'm a monster. As long as we're monster building here, maybe you can tell me what happened to Rusty's stealth suit. Her eyes narrowed and her brows came down. She paused. What about a suit? It stopped working at a critical moment. Right when the alien was standing in front of him, it stopped masking. That's interesting timing, to me. Of course it is, yeah, malfunctions never just happen in Rory Malvoa's world of order. We've had lots of them here in the real world. I hesitated. How many? She retreated from that line of questioning. Some. I watched her for a moment, trying to get something out of that odd expression. Ma'am ordered a fresh power pack just before he went out. The suit ran out of power. Take the blinders off, Gracie. She doesn't care about anybody around here. Don't you notice that with her it's always I am doing this, I will be recognized? When's the last time she used the word we or talked about our work? She doesn't even know you or these other disciples are here except to provide her with information and do the dishes. She'll go back to Earth some day and take credit for all. And she'll deserve it. The passion in my sister's expression almost knocked me off my crate. She poked me in the chest with a finger that I'm pretty sure she'd rather wear a dagger. Our mother is the Dien Fossey the Jane Goodall, the Charles Darwin of this age. You don't see it because you've always resented her. You've spent your whole life avoiding things that make demands or warrant loyalty. Loyalty is for people who think of others first. 
My voice grew rough, and I forced myself to hold it down. I had to find something that would work on her, appeal to her common sense, if she had any left. I knew she did. Gracie's common sense was always fighting with her idealism, she'd always been like that. I just had to tap it. Do you actually believe that if you just learn enough, you can actually live among them? Live real lives? Have families? Grow? Do anything other than hide or die? We fell silent for a moment, just glaring at each other. I was sorry I'd tipped my hand about Rusty's suit. I'd hoped to release that information with a little more finesse. Now I'd lost that trump card. Gracie's face was flushed and hot, shiny with perspiration in the red glow of the night lights. She looked overworked, exhausted, deeply stressed, and ready to fall apart, yet somehow was holding herself together and fighting for stability. She didn't have our mother's coolness. She's never had it. She's walking among them, my sister vowed. You were wrong and she was right. Okay, she might be right, I accepted. I don't know. I'm not a scientist. But I can tell you other things that might happen. Someday, tomorrow or fifty or a hundred years from now, some innocent ship from some innocent race will land here, not knowing what's waiting for them. The cosmic hitchhikers will take advantage of that and find their way to space again. Maybe to Earth. Maybe to some other innocent civilization. Then those things will start killing again. You want an image of genocide? Try that one. These aliens are acting differently from anything anybody seems to know about them. I think you should tell me right now the full scope of the pile we've stepped in. The bald demand disarmed her. She had no pre-recorded sarcastic response this time. I don't know which part got to her. I felt as if I'd spilled my pebbles to have told her about the suit. Had I shocked her? Then, something worse occurred to me. Because she didn't look so shocked. I flashed on Pocket's face during our last card game, which he won, as usual. No poker face at all, Malvo, my man. Hand it over and let's go again. Please leave me alone, my sister requested. She seemed weakened and wasted. Was she thinking about her own future, about possibly someday having a life? Kids, a home, maybe with Tad? Was she thinking there was no future for her? Okay, I said miserably. Should I slap the cuffs on now or later? After pushing the food crate back where I'd found it, I left her alone in her cubicle to pretend to keep working. Played out and empty, I slunk back through the tunnel, moving more slowly than necessary, trying to think. With all the weird activity outside, even Pocket couldn't run odds on whether any of us would survive. The scientists were clearly befuddled, and when experts are befuddled, the rest of us are just plain lost. I was lost. Clumsy. I'd blown my one advantage, and now didn't even know whether I was on the right track. My instincts were all clogged up. Sentiment and memories were clouding my brain. Was I ever the wrong man for this job? The next chamber was the place where Chantal had taken me to see her collection. There, I stopped. Before me, the stuffed xenomorph stood in elegant repose, positioned for the edification of human eyes, its outer teeth held open to emit the distended inner jaws. It would probably stand there forever, or until this fortress were breached. Its own kind would find it someday, perhaps soon and circle it in a confusion of wonder. Would they pick at it and feel its cables and armor, sniff and poke it the way elephants did to the bones of their own dead? Would they try to make it move and come back to life? Or would they know somehow that it was a trophy? How intelligent were they, really? It's beautiful in its way. I spun around and almost knocked into the creature. Bonnie! Bonnie sat on the foam floor with her legs folded, tucked back into a nook. She clapped her hand to her lips. Oh! I scared you. Scared me? 
my own hand was on my chest, nursing the coronary. Just a mild infarction. With a guilty smile she said, I guess this isn't the place where you should surprise anybody. What are you doing in here? Just thinking. With this thing? I gestured at the big alien. It's amazing to be able to just look at one. I sat down next to her and stretched my legs out, leaning back against the pressed plastic wall. According to my mother, you can just go outside and introduce yourself. No thanks. Despite sitting quietly and seeming in control, she picked at her fingernails. Any luck with your sister? I sighed demonstratively. Total titanium wall. The second generation is always worse than the first. She didn't seem to like the way I talked about my family. Sorry, I offered. I know this pops the Jocasta bubble for you. Every silver lining has a cloud, you know. That's not very nice to say, she scolded mildly. She is your mother. Hasn't she ever given you anything worth valuing? Like what? Life? Yeah, she gave me that. I was a mistake. Mistake? You mean she didn't want to get pregnant? Oh, yes, she wanted to. She was trying to have a girl. I was in vitro. They thought I was a girl, but somebody screwed up in the lab. Oh, Rory, that can't be true. I shrugged. It's okay, I accepted it a long time ago. She never hid it from me. Sounds like the kind of thing you'd want to hide from your child. Her empathy was charming. It can't be hidden in my family, I explained. All the wealth in my family comes down through the women. Our great-great-grandmother had one daughter, our great-grandmother had two daughters, each of those had two daughters, and my mother, quite unintentionally, had a son. She never wanted any kids, but the family fortune had to be protected. She takes her obligations seriously. When I was born, she took one look and decided to try again as soon as she could. She had to have a daughter to leave the kingdom to. The queendom, really. Bonnie's face took on all the pain I'd avoided about this issue. I didn't like making her feel so bad, when I really didn't. Are you sure you're not reading this through a jaundiced eye? She asked. You're diminishing your personhood so much. No, not really. We're more than how we're conceived. She paused and thought back over what she'd just heard. You mean, out of your mother's incredible fortune and all her investments and holdings, you don't? Right. I don't get anything. Gracie gets it all. That's why I can never get married. Why can't you marry? Because the wife gets my inheritance. Womanhood trumps everything. I would never know for sure why anybody was marrying me. Technically, she could stay married to me for a year, ditch me, and keep the fortune. There's no protection against that in our inheritance. No prenuptials, no nothing. It's some kind of bastardized protectionism for women as a species. Bonnie's eyes widened with amazement at the concept. My goodness, that sounds... Warped. I know. You'd have to know the women in my family. They're kinda sick in the head. Rory, I'm so sorry. It's okay. Right now I wish it were all that's twisted between my sister and me. You mean, that second generation thing? I nodded. Lenin was bad. Stalin was worse. Alexander the Great stood on the empire created by Philip of Macedon and really pushed too far. The French botched their own revolution and Napoleon was there to take advantage. She tipped her head into my periphery. What are you really talking about, really? I didn't want to voice my suspicions. They'd hardly had a chance to simmer. Bonnie's sensitivity prodded me gently to think out loud, and somehow it was helping. My mother's obsessions have always been out in front, I said. 
she's never thought she was wrong, so she never had to sneak around. As for Gracie, she can be heartless and single-minded. She takes seriously her role as the custodian of greatness, never believing she could ever be great herself. My mother always insisted on being the great one, and Gracie's always bought into that. Nobody's more ferocious than a child defending a parent. You mean a parent defending a child? No. I mean a child defending a parent. I've seen it before in my line of work. Horribly abused children will clam up and refuse to indict their own parents, and sometimes even defend the parents' actions. It's one of the little ways humans are different from other animals. The blindest of devotion. Gracie has it. Bonnie was a simple person, definitely a lot smarter than she let on, or than she believed. I could tell she got the message I was trying hard not to say outright. Are you telling me, she attempted, you think your sister has been doing something wrong? I nodded. I was so focused on my mother, so wrapped up in my own resentments, that I quit thinking like an investigator and just believed what I wanted to believe. I think I might be completely off track. Rusty's power pack, my mother ordered it replaced just before we went out, but it was Gracie who replaced it. My mother could never overpower Marines the way Donahue and Brand were overpowered, but I just saw Gracie and Tad romancing it up. Gracie has a man at her beck and call. A man devoted to the compound. A stealth expert. She shivered. Oh, my goodness, this is terrible, what are you going to do? Can you arrest them? I actually can. On suspicion. How about that? A bazillion miles from Earth, and I actually have jurisdiction. Can you believe it? I reached into my pocket and pulled out my shield. See? Badge and everything. My goodness, when will you make your decision? I don't know, exactly. Is she really a murderer? If so, I have to act before anybody else gets killed. Somebody's doing the killing, I know that. Some human. Usually I just bring him in and the system takes over. I have backup. You have the captain. And the marines. She smiled. And me. I looked at her. I love having you for my backup. Even if it's just to bandage your leg? Especially for that. Imagine how distracted I'd be, hobbling around with an infected leg. Again she laughed a little, nervously, in her cute schoolgirl way. I can definitely stop that from happening. I can even stop the scar. Hey, I kinda like having the scar. Makes me surly. Gorilla-like. Attractive to ladies of ill repute. She blushed and wiggled her shoulders. Tonight she seemed a lot less boyish than she always had before, despite her not particularly petite build and her goofy manners and the fact that she didn't seem to understand how smart she was. Despite the fact that she was on the fast track to becoming a doctor, a no-dummies-allowed profession, she wasn't quite aware of her own value. Actually, I found her shyness endearing. I nudged her shoulder with mine. So how's your reputation? She laughed again, brightening the dim room and my spirits. Her blushing cheeks glowed and her smile flickered in the red light. She covered her mouth coquettishly, and she was really lousy at being coquettish, but I knew she was covering because the red light made us both look as if we'd just eaten a crate of tomatoes. Not exactly dinner in candlelight. I wished I could give her that. Treat her like a girl for once. We hadn't treated her much like a girl on the ship. Maybe that was why she needed little animals around. Logging away that I owed her a nice evening out, I asked, What time is it? Almost midnight. Did my mother ever come in? She did. It was amazing, seeing her out there, with them. I couldn't look after a while, I admitted. Is anybody still scanning outside? They've been scanning all night. Here. 
I'll show you. She picked up a remote and clicked it. A bank of screens, six of them, flickered to life above the head of the stuffed alien. The creature suddenly looked as if it were appearing on stage. Wow, I didn't even see those up there, I commented. Well, the room has its distractions. Sure as hell does. We settled back to watch the pictures of the landscape. Dreamy pictures of aliens moving around, just moving, squabbling amongst themselves, stalking the universe in their way, and other scenes where other kinds of animals sniffed and lurked. I hadn't been able to pay much attention to the panoply of other life on the planet. For Bonnie's sake, I wished we could just take a walk out there, maybe get a pair of binoculars and go critter watching. I thought she would like that, and deserved it. Instead we were the animals, trapped in our hole. There had to be a way to get out, to entice the researchers to escort us back to the ship, and then to actually get on. That would be the ugly scene forcing them to comply. And dangerous too. Those moments would be crucial and leave us vulnerable. They had to be planned, with Clark, with the Marines and if possible with Theo back aboard the ship. If I'd done my job better, I'd have a clearer idea of just who would work with us when push came to shove, and who was too devoted to my mother to do anything but fight us. Gracie and Tad were definitely over there in the fight camp. How would Neil react? Diego, who'd lost his wife and unborn child. Zaviro? Couldn't exactly muscle him around, could we? I'd feel bad doing it too. What else take the time to explain to him what we were trying to accomplish? Beside me, Bonnie rubbed her arms and shivered. They keep it cold in here, don't they? Something about not expelling heat signatures. They've developed some fancy ways to hide. Most of them as combat basic, though, if I read it right. Most of hiding is what you don't do, not what you do. Keeping quiet, not moving around much, not expelling heat or gas, odor, that kind of thing. They've taken it to other levels, though, with holographics and these smart suits and all. You have to give them credit, don't you? Oh, I do. It's the motivations that worry me, not the tactics. I leaned back against a stack of drums and put my head back, closed my eyes for a moment. My exhausted brain started swimming and seeing colors in spite of my eyes being closed. You're tired, Bonnie mentioned. How about getting a nap? Is that an offer? I opened my eyes and poked her in the side. Hmm. Cinderella? She giggled. Cinderella, what's that mean? I don't know. You look different in this light. Kinda sporty. Palming her unruly blonde hair, she tried to finger it back. Every girl's dream to look sporty to a guy. I smiled and pulled a few strands back where it had been before. Don't change your hair. I like it. It's honest. Honest hair. Oh God, I'm stupid. I thumped myself in the head. You said, it's cold, and like an idiot I actually commented on why. That's not the right reaction. Huh. What a fool, what a goof. I couldn't get a message if the bottle hit me over the head. Here's the right reaction. I raised my arm and tucked her under it, pulling her close and rubbing her arm and shoulder to make her warm. See? That's the right. A movement on one of the screens caught my eye. Something about it was different from the movements of the aliens or the other creatures moving slowly in the photographable distance. On the second screen from the left, there was a picture of the area just outside this blind, the place where I'd hidden under the slab, where the aliens had lumbered past me and I first saw them in person. In that area was a broken glass pillar, with craggy remains sticking up as if a tree had been cracked by lightning and from one of those crags there now hung a flapping creature whose movements I recognized. Black leathery wings, twitchy flitting motions, finally settling down to an elongated upside-down triangle. Even on the grainy screen, 
I could make out two black eyes looking toward the camera. I shoved Bonnie aside and scrambled to my feet. Holy God! Bonnie jumped up. What? What's wrong? But I was already gone, running down the corridor toward the main chamber. Clark! I shouted, forgetting all about keeping my voice down. My shout boomed in the otherwise quiet compound. A half dozen people flinched and jumped up, shaken, including Clark, who had found a moment to doze off. Ha! Huh. What? He gasped. What's wrong? Get up. The ship's been breached. Eleven. Look! I stepped over Pocket, who was asleep on the floor, and tapped the controls on the panel which I had previously seen my mother use to turn on the projectors in the stealth curtain. As the crowd increased around me, everyone reacting to my trumpeting, the projector curtain also woke up and gave us a picture of the landscape on its other side. There, hanging on the glass spire, blinking her eyes at us, was Buttercup the fox bat. Oh! Buttercup! Bonnie blurted and stepped past me toward the curtain. Don't go out there! I seized her by the shoulders which I had hugged gently only moments ago and dragged her back. The ship. Clark pushed Pocket and me out of his way and crashed through to the main bank of monitor screens. Everybody followed him, and in this moment my mother appeared. What's this noise? she asked. The ship's been breached, I said, pointing at the screen that showed the right angle. The ramp is down. I see, she responded. More mistakes. We crowded to the monitor bank and Clark leaned close to the three screens which showed parts of the Venza, parked at its landing site. Sure enough, the ship's ramp was down. At the bottom of the ramp were four xenomorphs, dead or dying. And moving down the ramp on frighteningly proficient segmented legs were five metallic hooded shapes. The poison packers. Shit me blind. Clark gulped. Somebody activated them. What the hell? What the hell? He jumped up. I have to contact the ship. You must not, Captain, my mother said bluntly. Any disturbance in wave use could trigger another behavioral change. We simply do not know enough yet. Colonel Matt Cormick made a noise of contempt and growled, Well, that's that. Squad! I spun around to him. Are you going out? That's right. You know those robotics will target you as well as the aliens. That's why we're going out. We have to neutralize them before they find their way in here. You don't give up your only bivouac. Captain, how can we neutralize them? Do you know? Theo was the only one who could have activated them. Clark exclaimed, shaken. Him and me, we're it. He must have had a reason. I think the reason is clear. Matt Cormick pointed at the screen. The aliens got inside the grid and somehow inside the ship, and your first mate didn't know how else to fight them. How could they get inside the grid? Don't care. Yeah, but I care. I couldn't help an all-too-human glance at my sister and Tad. Tad caught the glare and returned it with a twist of his mouth. Not a good sign, as body language goes, but a helpful one. What are those helmets made of? Matt Cormick asked. Quadrifold TGX, Clark said. Matt Cormick turned to Carmichael and Edney. Grenades only. Load up. Take sidearms in case the bugs give us trouble. You want an extra hand? I offered. Was I crazy or just stupid? No, he said sharply. Everybody else stays inside. I don't want to have to worry about anybody but my own squad. This is now a military operation. Is that perfectly clear? Heads bobbed like daisies all around. While he and the other two marines loaded up with grenades and sidearms, down to two, stoic. Brave, silent, Matt Cormick turned to Clark. 
How many do you think there are, Captain? Clark was deeply disturbed, frustrated that he had to be here. A hundred to a container, five pallets, twenty to a pallet. They have to be activated in bulk, a pallet at a time, so the least you'll face is twenty. Look, it's my ship, I want to go with you. My crew. Out of the question. We'll see to your crew. Matt Cormick slung a whole belt full of grenades over his shoulder. If there are any left. Don't let them see you first, Clark warned. The darts are hypersonic. Understood. The Marines moved out, leaving the rest of us feeling as if we were baby birds left in the nest. The flurry they caused at the projector curtail startled the fox bat, and she spread her huge wings and flew off over our heads. Oh, no! Bonnie cried. Buttercup! Stay here, stay here, I ordered, holding her by the arm so tightly that she winced. Pocket, where are you? Here. He stepped between Tad and the chef, Oliver. All right, how could that have happened? How could the ship's security blaster be turned off? You mean, other than we turn it off inside? Obviously. He paused to think. Maybe a targeted frequency pulse. But that's a fancy procedure. The frequency would have to be diagnosed first, then rolled down to a tight beam. Like stealth technology? I faced Tad in full accusatory mode. Somebody did this on purpose to make sure we didn't launch tomorrow. It fits. Back off, man, Tad fumed. Clark grimaced and shook his head. I hate that it fits. You're paranoid. Gracie accused. You're trying to turn us against each other. Graciela, remain calm, our mother instructed, leading by example. From their point of view, I understand. I rubbed my face, feeling the fatigue race through my fingers into my eyes at her smooth performance. Ah, uh, cripes. All right, everybody quiet down and don't move around. Those robots are programmed to kill anything that's not native DNA to the planet, and that means us. Let the colonel do his job and don't attract any attention. Aren't you afraid we'll escape? My mother snidely said, letting out more emotion, I'm sure, than she intended. You want to escape? I spread my hands and gestured toward the outside world. Go ahead. Go on out there. Make my job a hell of a lot easier. The uneasy crowd dissipated into groups of two or three, but nobody was talking much. We now had two kinds of creatures on this planet gunning for us, and I knew that was because the Venza had come here loaded for bear. Now what? Please, Bonnie spoke up, let me go out and get Buttercup. She's so lost out there, she's all by herself. She's just out the door. Have you looked outside? I chided. There's a jungle. She'll fit right in. She was raised by humans. She's looking for us. All I have to do is put out my... Bonnie, forget it, I snapped. I think you're smart. Don't prove me wrong. But what if those things catch her? She can fly. They can't. She'll be okay. I can get her to come to me. I'll use some of that dried fruit. No. Just, no. Bonnie broke down into a spate of angry sobbing, during which I realized I was being unfair to her. I coiled my arm around her. Sorry, okay, okay. I'm sorry. Look, Bonnie, she's probably a lot better off out there than we are. There are a zillion insects, according to Zaviro, and lots of fruit or whatever she eats. She'll live. We can't just abandon her, she moaned. You'll help me, won't you? Me? Honey, I'm not going out there again for anything. Nothing and nobody. I'm done. Anybody who goes out is crazy. Oh, please. 
The only thing that'll get me outside again is to go back to the Venza and launch off this sin of planet. We'll go first thing in the morning, all of us, whether these idiots know it or not. And just leave her on this planet by herself? She's a bat. Tears broke out again. What was the big deal? It wasn't as if we were leaving a child out there. Or even an Irish setter. A bat, for pity's sake. Hey, look at this. Pocket called. He drew our attention to one of the screens, on which we could see a poison packer moving on two of its six legs down a gully ridge. We crowded around the screen, desperately wishing we could see the events unfold in person, knowing that we'd be dead if we did. The poison packers had no genetic imperatives or behavioral changes. They just hunted relentlessly any life form not native to this planet. There would be no walking among them. Look at how it walks, Pocket appreciated. They have six legs, Clark said, for any kind of terrain. If they lose one, they just use the others and keep going. You can't outrun them. All you can do is hope they don't catch you on their senses. They're programmed to examine every inch of the planet. If our first wave is successful, the plan is to deploy another 10 million of them from subsequent ships. We watched, unable to participate, as the Poison Packer's super-technical helmet glowed with special sensors and dart ports. An adult alien was approaching it with a strange innocent curiosity. The aliens didn't care about machines, didn't know about them, at least, we assumed they didn't. On sight, the Poison Packer zeroed in on the alien and fired one of its darts. We never even saw the dart, it happened so quickly. The alien jolted physically, let out a bawling howl, and clawed at its ribcage, where the dart had struck it dead center. The Poison Packer simply trundled on past the alien and went on its way, seeking the next one. The alien began to claw at its body. It wagged its huge head then tipped its head sideways and bit furiously at its right arm, tearing ligaments and cables, chewing furiously, and then the left arm. It stomped its legs, finally dropping to the ground and snapping its second set of jaws at its thighs. As the DNA-specific poison coursed through its body, the alien was helping to rip itself to shreds. The long clawed hands tore at its open wounds, opening them further, spurting acid all over itself and over the ground, creating a sizzling, smoldering puddle for the creature to die in. Within seconds, the process was finished. The alien lay twitching and sizzling in its own remains. Genocide, my mother commentated. Who thinks of such things? Drained and overwhelmed, Clark turned to her and spoke in an honest way. Mrs. Malvo, I'm just the delivery man. This picture is way bigger than any of us. Lies, she accused. You believe what you're doing is right. You shouldn't be here. You're destroying, and they're fighting back, and you and my son have the temerity to be angry about it. What's happening here is natural and we have no right to interfere. If we don't interfere, I argued, we're all dead and I'm not ready for that. This is not an endangered species. Her eyes drilled into mine. But you mean to endanger it? I nodded in annoyance. Well, you've got me there. Yes, I have you, she caustically agreed. They have a natural controlling factor. We're witnessing it. There are no evil species. Nature doesn't create destruction. Nature creates almost nothing but destruction, I disclaimed. That was when we heard the sound of more grenades, distant muffled booms rumbling along the landscape. Nobody goes out, I said. We'll wait for the Marines. I felt dangerously alone. I'd much rather have actually been alone. Instead I sat here and stewed, watching the monitors and trying to figure out how to get everybody back to the ship and fly off this rock without losing anybody else. This wasn't my best thing. Clark was theoretically the one who should be calling the shots, but he was, as he admitted, a freighter captain and not an adventurer, 
not a soldier, untrained in this kind of maneuver. Colonel Mac Cormick was probably the best one to make decisions, but I didn't want to say that kind of thing out in the open, because he could so easily become a target. Somebody was working against us, and as an investigator I was supposed to be able to tease out that identity. Most investigations took weeks, months, maybe years. I had minutes. As I sat alone, the bank of screens had turned strangely calm. The calm was worse than action, I think. My legs quaked and wouldn't settle down. I was a bag of nerves. One of the screens showed the flume between us and the camp of huts. That was a dangerous road now. It had probably seen more traffic in the past twelve hours than it had, well, ever. Parasites flicked around, full-sized aliens trod the area. Being out there was like wading a swamp in the Amazon, no telling what manner of horror would leap up and snap you down to your death. Nature could sure be creative in a bad way. I squinted my tired eyes. There, hanging on a drape of gauze between two skinny spires, was the bat. There it was, with its big soggy eyes and its chihuahua face, hanging out on the gauze. What are you doing, Buttercup? I murmured. Why don't you fly away while you can? The bat flexed one wing as if it had heard my thoughts, then coiled the wing back around itself like the cape in the old Dracula movies, and just waited there. What was it waiting for? For us to come and get it? Is that it? I asked the caped image on the screen. All the way out here in space, you know somehow which group is yours. You know you're an earthling? My head pounded with exhaustion. I leaned back and rested it on the stark black wall. No chance for sleep. The bat rearranged its feet and continued looking at me. Somehow it was even looking in the right direction, toward the camera, and thus we were eye to eye. She was. Bonnie said the bat was a girl. I wondered if there were girl aliens and boy aliens. We paused for a moment of silence as we processed the information and what we thought was a pretty good theory about the things we'd seen. During that pause I found myself looking at Chantal, the pixie-ish veterinarian, which made me think of something else. I looked around the table, then passed it to the tunnel opening. What's wrong with you? Pocket asked. I scanned the group again, just to be sure. Where's Bonnie? They glanced around, just realizing she wasn't here. Clark darkly confirmed, I haven't seen her. I reached for the control panel as I'd seen the researchers do when they wanted to speak to each other inside the blinds tunnel system. We weren't really supposed to use it, but I didn't care. Bonnie? Bonnie, where are you? Are you in the compound? Wake up and talk if you're in here. Bonnie, come in. Bonnie, Bonnie. The mellow communications system, on a constant low volume, made my voice seem soft and distant. There was no answer. Then it dawned on me why there was no answer. Oh, crap. I scratched past the table and the people on the bench and ducked into the area with the stacked video monitors and scanned them. I missed a lot the first time over, and then saw the terrible sight I knew was out there. On the bottom left screen, almost behind a stack of foam coffee cups, was Bonnie. She was lurking between two pillars, and in her hand she held two lumps of dried fruit. What the hell's she doing? Clark demanded. Trolling for bats. I burst past him. I'll get her. Everybody stay here. I ran out into the forest of glass. I hoped I was going in the direction where I'd seen the fox bat lingering. If the monitors showed a circular area around the blind, and the bat had been on the monitor to the left, I reasoned that I had to go left. Only when I got outside and discovered that looking at the land on the monitors and looking at the actual land were two completely different things. Getting my bearings took too long, and I still wasn't sure. Bonnie! I dared to yell. My own voice startled me, we tried so hard to remain quiet that speaking up was a shock. 
I ran around the rocky terrain which seemed to be the house for the caves in which my mother and her people had built their anthill. From here I could see that it wasn't a solid lump of rock with caves inside, it also had dozens of openings that clearly showed on the outside. The rock was Swiss cheese, offering only the basic of scaffolds for the blind. The walls and tunnel material of the blind were the only real separation between those inside and the outside world. The land was still pocked with shadows and the moon, now having arched almost all the way across the sky, still shone fairly brightly, enough that I could navigate. But I'd lost my way. This wasn't looking like the place where the bat had been. There was no hanging gauze here. Where was I supposed to go? Where would Bonnie have gone to reclaim her pet? Bonnie! I called again and skidded to a clumsy stop. I'd run into an open plain, almost a meadow, of black and white spiky growth no taller than ten inches, and now I stood like a single turkey at a chute. Flanking the entire northern ridge of the meadow were aliens. Hundreds of them. They turned in a single file and looked at me, heads bobbing and claws fanned. Their lips peeled back greenish lips with phosphorescent drooling liquid running in strings to the ground. Ah, thank you, Providence, I murmured. There was no hiding. They all saw me. I thought I was dead. Except that they didn't move on me. Standing out here alone in the moonlight, looking at them, them looking at me, I felt like the lone conductor of a really big orchestra. With one flick of the baton, I could destroy the perfect pause. Rory? The voice came from my right. I pivoted only enough to see Bonnie sitting in the black and white furs, as if she were sitting at a campfire. Moving in slow sidesteps, I closed the gap between us. What are you doing? I followed Buttercup, Bonnie said, trembling violently. I didn't see them till I was all the way here. Neither did I. Extending my hand, I said, stand up very slowly and get behind me. She unfolded her legs and took my hand. I pulled her to her feet. Getting behind won't matter. She raised her trembling hand and pointed over her shoulder. Behind us, less than a hundred yards away, was the other edge of the meadow. To our right and extending the width of the available space, was a squall line of aliens. They flexed and threatened, hissed, rolled, and stalked with a physical message of singular purpose. And they were moving toward us. With awful deliberation the two lines were closing on each other. Because of the angle of the land, they'd meet first in the place where we'd come from our escape route back to the blind. We're cut off, I said unhappily. Why are they divided up this way? Bonnie squeaked, her voice barely working. I drew her close against me and began to move laterally across the meadow. That's when I saw the marines. The three of them stood enraptured by the sight of the two lines of aliens closing like pincers on the body of the meadow. There was no sign of anyone but the three marines. Had they made it to the ship? Was everybody at the ship dead? Matt Cormick had his sidearm raised. As we approached the marines and they came into the meadow to meet us, I called, Matt Cormick, don't shoot. Say that again? We finally came together two-thirds of the way across the meadow. Don't antagonize them, I said. They're leaving us alone. Don't trigger any other kind of behavior. Not being an idiot, he did as I instructed and waved his two marines to hold fire. Never thought the day would come when I'd be giving tactical instructions to a colonel in the colonial marines. What happened at the ship? I asked. Is everybody dead? No, they're in the hold, locked up, the colonel said quickly. Your first mate left a comm link on the ground outside, with a code to talk directly to him in the hold. We destroyed six of the PPs with grenades to get to the link. Aliens got aboard somehow, and Theo didn't know what to do except release a pallet of PPs. He threw the comm link out the ramp, hoping we'd find it. We couldn't get in. 
there were still PPs in the cargo area. It's the somehow that bothers me, I grumbled. We hunkered together, trapped, as the astonishing tableau unrolled around us. From the south came the longer phalanx of the dogs of Anubis. They bobbed the curves of their hammer, shaped heads, holding their faces low to show the curved transparent shells of their skulls in some kind of species, specific signal. Distending their main jaws, they expelled and flexed their second sets, glistening with silvery saliva and sticky drainage. All in all, they were a disgusting display. We're cut off, I croaked. Matt Cormick crouched on the other side of Bonnie, with Carmichael and Edney huddled at my side. We could try flanking them, the colonel said. Lay down suppressing fire dash. Too many, I told him. No chance. I'm going down shooting. Corporal Edney swore and caressed her pistol, which seemed very small right now. There are other ways to fight, I told her. Like not drawing attention to yourself. He's right, Mac Cormick said. Make a circle around these civilians and hold fire. The three brave Marines, taking their roles seriously, arranged themselves flat to the ground around Bonnie and me. Then came the terrible moments of watching without being able to do anything else. The aliens moved in two concentrated waves toward each other, bundling into tighter units as they closed the gap between them. I felt as though I were watching one of those old-time biblical epic movies with waves of extras creating endless throngs to showcase the power of the pharaohs. They came up through the spillways and out of the ditches, across volcanic lakes and down flumes. Each army was a juggernaut, moving toward us as if two vault doors were closing to lock us in. The hair-raising sight made us feel tiny and tortured, about to be killed by inches. My skin came up in prickles. I coiled my arms around Bonnie and we made ourselves small. Then the doors closed. The two squall lines of aliens came together around us, leaping over us to get to each other. Then the slashing and tearing began. Duck! I dragged Bonnie down and pushed Carmichael sideways. He rolled away as two aliens landed between us, going at each other like cats. The noise was mind-blowing. The world around us erupted into an atrocious and craven battle. The aliens leaped at each other and instantly tangled up into balls of two and three, after which others would leap onto the balls and create globes of five, ten, more, all tearing and biting at each other. Tails whipped out and stabbed back into the balls, spraying acid and glowing bodily juices around each battle ball. Parts of the aliens' brittle bones splintered past us as they tore each other apart, rolling in their huge balls and leaving tire tracks of body parts and acid sizzling on the writhing bodies of the not-quite-dead who were left behind. The aliens paid no attention to those of their own who were wounded or trampled. The fallen became launch pads for others to stage their own grisly barbarism. Move! Matt Cormick shouted and led the way. We crawled on all fours, almost down to our stomachs. Carmichael couldn't stand the pressure and opened fire twice before following us. Edney shouted something unintelligible, and Carmichael responded with another round, which struck home on one of the creatures and sent a firework of acid spraying past us on our left. Come on, Ken. I called. Don't bother. Too many of them. Carmichael confirmed, and gave up trying to use his weapon. He might as well have been spitting at a tornado. Corporal Edney doubled back to avoid the twisting body of a dying Zeno, a critical mistake that put her in the path of a massive battle ball. I started to shout a warning, but never got the chance. The battle ball of ripping, thrashing aliens rolled over Edney and when it came up off the ground, she was inside it. She screamed, we heard the terrible sound of shock and defiance, and then we heard the ballistics of pistol fire inside the tumbleweed of aliens. Tail sections and an alien hand came blowing out of the ball, and we caught the sight of Edney's tan face showing between a pair of alien legs. Her mouth was open in horror, one eye nothing but a bloody socket. 
Her hand came out of the ball, still shooting wildly. Then Edney's entire arm fell free of the ball and dropped to the ground, pistol, hand, and all. Her screams drained away. The battle ball rolled on, and she was gone with it. Shit, shit, shit. Matt Cormick stopped crawling and rolled backward into me and Bonnie as we bumped up against a low-lying outcropping of silver stone. Crumpled on the ground, we looked up at the site that now completely blocked our way. Three aliens, enough to kill a suburb, scowled down at us with their grassle bodies splayed in threat. They were Hell's Dragons, so frightful that even the Marines froze and just stared. We could have shot them, but there would be three more, then thirty more after them, then three hundred. I think in those seconds we established a silent pact to let ourselves die now, be over with it. The trio of aliens stretched their arms and necks, rolled their heads back, and cried to the heavens with their glass-breaking shrieks. The uproar almost cracked our skulls. Bonnie dug her face into my shoulder, having seen enough, finally. Matt Cormick gritted his teeth and peeled back his lips in a mockery of the aliens, and Carmichael took his hat off to welcome death uncovered. A scratching sound behind us alerted me and I dropped Bonnie and cranked around. More aliens, four of them, rose over the rock I was leaning against. Matt Cormick. I warned. Get out of the way. The colonel spun around as the three dragons launched themselves at other four. He was trapped. The aliens clawed at each other and amazingly pushed Matt Cormick out of the way. It wasn't a mistake, they deliberately pushed him away. The seven aliens rolled into a weird ball, limbs and tails and heads all curved into each other, and actually rolled across the land in a nasty fighting mass. I grabbed him and pulled him into the pile of us. Get up and run. We scrambled out of the boiling pot, not even bothering to try to hide anymore. The riot went on, aliens slashing and biting at aliens by the hundreds, while we ran right through the middle of it, trying to avoid being splashed by acid or just rolled over by tumbling masses of aliens locked together in battle. Rolling around in every direction until they smashed into pillars or rocks or each other, the battle balls tumbled aimlessly as those aliens locked in them used their tails to whip outward and punch back in, spearing madly and leaving trails of dead fighters behind them like tire tracks on a demolition, derby field. The field now had a ghastly smell about it, acid, oil, saliva, a gaudy stink of flesh and befoulment. More butchery for the sad planet. Our legs pumping against the unwelcoming ground, we crested a mound of glass that was the remains of a crumbled pillar. The mound was hard to climb since we didn't dare use our hands on the crushed glass. I pulled Bonnie, and she pulled Carmichael. Behind us, Edney and Matt Cormick scrambled awkwardly up the talus spread by the rest of us. When we hit the top of the mound, I took one look at the landscape and shouted, Back! Right in front of us were two poison, packing robots, spewing hypersonic darts from their hoods, taking out aliens left, right, and around. The poison aliens forgot about each other and began biting and ripping at themselves, biting their own arms off and trying to claw out the poison spreading inside them. If a sight can be more horrible than what we had already seen, this was it. The poison made them actually help in the killing process. I fell on Bonnie, and lashed out a foot to trip Carmichael. Down, down. Keep your head down. I landed on my back and swept my arms out to hold Bonnie, then strapped Carmichael down with the leg that had tripped him. Matt Cormick dropped on his side. That's all we need. Maybe the aliens won't kill us, I said, but those robots sure will. Trapped between the two approaching poison packers. We could almost feel our DNA screaming for attention. The poison packers were proximity weapons, not predisposed to operate at a distance, but the proximity was closing fast. In seconds, if we showed ourselves, they'd pick us up just as they were picking up the aliens, and they'd start shooting those darts at us. Stay here! I shouted, and pushed Bonnie flat. Rory! 
she didn't want to leave me in the open. I dropped and rolled as if my clothing were on fire, toward the corpse of one of the dead aliens, or the half of it that was left. Expecting to be burned by the acidic remains, I reached for the mass and came up with two disembodied snorkels and the sinews that once held them onto the creature's back. With an instinctive heave, I threw the first mass like a hatchet at the nearest poison packer, then whirled and threw the second at the other pages I dropped behind a stump just as its ultrasonic darts began to fire. Darts splattered on the stump above me. Suddenly more darts came from the other direction, and then from both directions in rapid succession. Through the red glass stump, I watched the two PPs approach each other, their casings smeared with dripping alien remains. Picking up the DNA signatures or the remains, they fired madly at each other, punching darts into each other's shells until their delicate innards were sparking and shattered. The one on the right lost its imperative and tipped sideways, crashing its helmet into a spear-shaped spire. Less than a second later, the other one tipped all the way over on its head, twirled madly, and thrashed its legs in a futile effort to stay upright, an effort that failed. It landed head down in a pool of smoldering acid. Wow! Carmichael appreciated. That was smart. Your hands. Bonnie grasped my wrists. It's okay. I grabbed the outside ends. Nice going, Mac Cormick said. Follow me, people. Gladly. While the turbulence of the two alien crowds fighting continued around us, we scurried under cover of insanity back toward the blind. Mac Cormick seemed to know the way better than I did, so I was glad to let him lead. The Marines had the sense to know when weapons wouldn't do the trick and no longer tried to shoot at the aliens which seemed so effectively distracted and deliberately parted to let us pass, and if that weren't weird enough, actually seemed to protect us from each other. Just as we came around a bend in the flume, a mass of them rolled past us, but suddenly dissolved their battle ball when they almost hit us. They gawked at us briefly, and us at them, and off they went again in another direction, pointedly avoiding us. Keep going! Matt Cormick shouted. We got right up and ran harem scarum again. I could tell by the way Matt Cormick checked every turn that he was looking for PPs. As for aliens, we just dodged between them and they let us go. I wouldn't delude myself. They were still horrendously dangerous and we were walking some kind of tightrope. I didn't know what kind yet, but we certainly weren't safe among them, as my mother fantasized that we were. Bonnie said nothing like this ever lasted long in the animal world, and I believed her. Whatever the trigger was, it could be tripped any time and we'd be back in the soup. Hold! Matt Cormick spat and struck me in the chest with his arm. We fell up against a sheer wall. He peeked around the edge of the wall. Come here, he hissed, and drew me closer. He whispered, look. I ducked down and peeked around his thick body. Only twenty or so feet away were seven facehuggers sitting together on a rock, standing up on their eight fingers and quivering like bachelors in a dance line. Their tails were straight out behind them, but not flaxed or hanging on the rock. I held onto Matt Cormick's belt and we watched. Slowly, trying not to draw attention, he pulled a grenade from his belt, right near my nose. In slow motion I watched the small and powerful casing rise out of the cartridge holder between his fingers. That grenade could take out everything within fifty feet, including us. But it was also the only way we could possibly get by seven of those parasites. We could only hope that the rock which was now hiding us would also give us some kind of protection. I knew that the concussion wave would probably knock us silly for several minutes during which we'd be even more vulnerable than we were now. I didn't like the odds. I thought about stopping him. He held the grenade in both hands, judging the distance. Just as his thumb went to the detonator and was about to come down, I saw something and grasped his elbow. The facehuggers were up on their fingertips, making tent shapes of their bodies. 
The flank lobes with which they grasped the faces of their victims were up high in a gull-winged fashion instead of down in the usual position. I couldn't believe what I saw next. The huggers, all together, began to puff their bodies puff, 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 and the flank lobes began to grow into rings with membranes in the middles. The membranes spread wider and wider, thinner and thinner the way balloons open up and get thinner as they're filled with air, except these membranes were flat and getting broader with every puff. The huggers, one by one, began to fan their membranes, flapping more energetically by the second, and there was a whirring sound, almost the way a hummingbird's wings make that constant buzz. Then, in a true flocking manner, all seven face huggers crouched on their fingertips and launched themselves into the air. They stretched their tails out behind them for balance and flew right over our rock and on into the sky over the field of rolling battle balls and dead and dying aliens. As we watched, dumbfounded, the flyers were joined by other flying parasites. They flocked briefly in the sky and buzzed off into a swarm, joined by still others. The swarm whirled to the left, then the right, then found a direction they liked and flew off into the distant sky over the glass spires, toward the blue valley. We stared after them, slowly digesting the full gravity of the mess we were now in. Matt Cormick blinked, still holding the uncharged grenade in both hands. I'll be damned, they can fly. 12. Theo released a pallet of poison packers. Somehow the ramp got open, he has no idea how. He saw some aliens, a dozen or more of them, coming up the ramp and he didn't know what else to do. He shoved the crew down into the provisions hold and triggered one pallet 20 pps, hoping they'd take the aliens out and then just venture out into the landscape and go on their way. He figured we were probably dead, and even if we weren't, we'd never live if the ship were taken. Matt Cormack paced away his bottled fury at the useless death of Corporal Edney, stalking back and forth in front of the deceptively calm main stealth curtain. He paused only to drop the communicator link into Clark's hand. He said he tried to contact us, but the frequencies were all jammed. He threw this out the ramp just before triggering the PPs. I was able to contact him, and he explained what had happened. He also told me the PPs instantly fired their darts on the aliens, and the aliens went crazy from the poison. He says the dying aliens attack the PPs. Get that even though they won't attack us, they'll still attack the PPs. Can you imagine that? So the PP shot M, and then the dying aliens jumped on top of the PPs and clung there until their bodies fell apart and the acid burned through the PPs' helmets. I'll bet nobody back at Tactical ever though of that. We once again huddled in the main chamber, trying to think things through. Most of the campers were in other chambers. Only my mother, Gracie and Tad, and Neil were in here with Clark, Matt Cormick, Bonnie, Carmichael, Pocket, and me. So they're safe? Clark asked hopefully. My crew's safe in the provisions hold. Theo's okay? They're alive? Matt Cormick wiped the spittle from his mouth. I think so. If they stay down there, they're safe, Pocket reassured. Those robots aren't programmed to decode our locking system. If they come up, Matt Cormick said, the PPs will take them out if there are any robots left in the ship. The aliens took out five PPs with their acid trick. The remaining PPs probably killed off the other aliens that were in the ship and then ventured on down the ramp and are now running wild in the landscape. We took out seven of them with grenades, then Rory took out another two. That means we still have six of them wandering the landscape which we have to avoid. He fitfully kicked a crate and sent it crashing across the chamber. Full of silverware and dishes, it crashed so loudly that it left us all shaking. I didn't want to say what I was thinking, that the aliens had figured out the PPs already and maybe the assumption that we could save this planet at all was mistaken. This would be a real war, with humanity sending more and more PPs in waves, then synthetics, then entire armies. The story was just beginning. I'm sorry about your young lady Marine, 
my mother told him. They didn't mean to kill her. She just got in the way. And that's supposed to make me feel better? Matt Cormick spat. I turned to her. It's never their fault, is it, ma'am? I turned to Gracie and Tad. How did the ramp get opened? Tad closed his eyes in misery. Gracie just stared at me. They stared at me. It was like a party, only without the cheer. I guess that would be a funeral. Your mechanical troubles are your own problems, my mother said. What's happening to them? I demanded. Why are they fighting each other? Gracie, standing halfway between my mother and me, seemed truly in the middle. They've stopped foraging and we think the queen has stopped producing. They're putting all their energy into defense. That wasn't defense, I corrected. What is it, then? Clark asked. It was more than defense. They're not hunkering down. They're going out to meet an enemy and fight. This isn't a castle under siege. It's a battlefield. They're not interested in us because they're putting all their energy into fighting each other. Still wanting some kind of direction, I persisted, but why would they fight each other? Gracie thought about the question, and her answer wasn't what I expected. Because the one thing ants never tolerate is other ants. Are you saying they're not fighting each other? They're fighting a whole other hive? Another colony? Yes, they're different. Bonnie spoke up. When I was out there, at first I just thought it was the light shining through the glass, but it wasn't. The one hive, our hive, they're all black. The other hive, they've got some green and blue on them. I thought I was imagining it. Green where and blue where? Gracie asked. Blue between the ribs. Green inside the mouth and under the arms. Pocket made a low whistle and said, that's subtle. But it bears up the theory of two hives, Clark said. How can there be two hives? Didn't they all start with one hitchhiker or just a few? This could be their evolutionary strategy, Gracie supplied. They diversify into several hives, develop new queens, and when they come upon each other they pause in their imperatives and fight in elimination rounds, working down to the mightiest hive. They can potentially evolve faster on the timeline of evolution. Very much faster. In this flying part? Clark asked. It's temporary? Gracie half nodded, half shrugged. Like carpenter ants. They fly, they take over an area, they kill everything, and start a new colony. Then they don't fly anymore for a while. No bets on how long, right? Pocket commented. I waved him away from his compulsion. Then when they expand enough and bump into each other, they stop everything and engage in this bug war. And the winners get the spoils. The spoils? Bonnie wondered. I forced myself to look at Gracie and Tad, Pocket and Clark. It's not just a bug war, I told them. This is a war to see whose genetics get to spread all over the planet. We're not being protected. We're being stored for the winners to use. It's a DNA war. This is it, I announced. I've made my decision. I want to save this planet. I want to save the Blue Valley. We're getting out. Clark, you were right from the start. These things need to be wiped out. There's no more discussion of the ASA. These things are a plague and we're going to smallpox M. With these animals here, this planet doesn't represent any kind of life. I turn to face my sister again. Get everybody together. We're all leaving, if we have to stun every last one of you and carry you. Tad hung his hand on Gracie's shoulder as my sister stood there, arms crossed tight to her body, glaring at me. When her eyes shifted to my mother, I saw the first play of doubt. Ma'am nodded. If that is the verdict, she said, gather everyone. Gracie, fighting tears, didn't obey. 
she turned to me. Is this the only way that works for you? I fixed my eyes on hers. For you, too. We're releasing the payload. Anybody who stays will be hunted down and killed by the robots. That means Tad, too. And it means you. If the ship leaves without you, that's the end of your chance for a future together with him, with children, a future as somebody other than Jocasta Malvoa's daughter. If you care about him and yourself and these people, you'll bring them here right now. Because we're all leaving. Fighting her own emotions, she nodded. She tried to speak, but couldn't. With a soulful look at Tad, she led him out of the tunnel. My mother watched them go. Her self-control was admirable, I have to say. So you have one, she said quietly to me. You've taken my daughter away from me. All eyes were on me as my mother slipped away. Ken, I said to Carmichael, go with them and make sure they don't pull any fast ones. Carmichael pushed off toward the tunnel. Yes, sir. Matt Cormick forced himself to think clearly. If we can avoid the PPs, we can get everybody back. If the PPs Theo released on the ship have rolled down the ramp and are out of there, then the ship should be clear. We can scan with infrareds, Clark said. The PPs show up on those scanners. We'll have to keep our heads low, the colonel went on. If the PPs pick up our DNA signatures, we can't avoid those goddamn darts. Humans were never supposed to be on the planet with those robots. This is a complete screw-over. If Theo only released one pallet and there are only six left to avoid, Clark computed, then we have a fair dash. They're gone. They're gone. Mr. Malvo. Rory. Private Carmichael came barreling out of the tunnel, all worked up. They're gone, he gasped again. Who's gone, son? Clark asked. I caught Carmichael's arm. You were watching them. He shook his head. They were right in front of me, and then somehow they just weren't there anymore. Turned out I was following holographs. I can't find any of them. Pocket pushed through to the monitor bank and did his bosun thing at the keyboard. Dozens of pictures popped up of the interior of various chambers and the exterior of the compound. No longer were there any people milling around, sleeping or working or eating. The chambers were completely unpopulated, except for the one museum chamber and its stuffed trophy. Oh, glory, we'll never find them, Clark groaned. We'll never find them in a thousand years. They're too good at this. We'll flush them out. Matt Cormick swore. God damn it, I'll grenade the whole mountain if I have to. Listen. Bonnie's urgent warning came from the projector curtain, where she stood watching the picture of the dim glass forest. Listen. A low moan began in the distance and grew more intense, deeper, until the whole landscape and the cave and all the sky was humming. With its underlying vibrato, the trombone call set the ground beneath us to quivering. Clark stared out at the projected land. Pocket's face swiveled as he twitched in fear. The marines were still intense. The hooing noise rolled through the valleys and grottos, down the flumes and up the grades, traveling farther and farther across the land. It lasted ten, twelve, fifteen seconds. Maybe more. When it began finally to draw back and fade away, we were all as spooked as anybody ever had been in history. Bonnie turned to look at me. It's over. 13. The DNA war was over. One side had won. They'd be coming for us, to present us to their parasites for impregnation. We were back on the losing side. The period of grace had ended. With one confrontation comes all of them. I shook my head, sighed, and let my anger lead the way. Mother! I shouted. Where are you? Matt Cormick made a noise of disgust. Who are you kidding? Rory. 
Clark began at the same time, steeped in doubt. Oh, she can hear us, I told him contemptively. You don't think she lets anybody do anything in here without her knowing about it, do you? She thinks she's a god. Gods are always watching. Over the blinds muffled sound system came my mother's voice, velvety and superior. We are in hiding. You will never find us. So you might as well leave. You are here without invitation and you have worn out your welcome. Go on your way and leave us in peace. Go home. I'll be damned, Clark murmured. Fine. Pocket snarled, pushing to his feet. If that's the way they want it. To hell with them. Let's get out and save our own skins. They want to be stupid? Fine. I'm all for suicide, as long as it's somebody else's. Let's get out and leave these morons to their own fate. Here, here, Matt Cormick chimed. Fine, I said, except for one thing. What thing? Clark asked. What one more thing can possibly matter anymore? I turned to him. How many of them feel the way Rusty did? How many really want to leave, but they're so duty-bound to my mother that they're afraid to defy her? We can't just walk out on them. I can, Pocket said. Well, I can't. I shouted, and kept going, shouting at the air. I'm out for humans, mother. We have a right to exist. We're in our own DNA war with these things. This is the next big evolutionary test for humanity. The stronger should prevail. We're the stronger. For a few seconds, silence fell. My words actually echoed. Maybe it was just in my head. Then my mother's voice came again, somehow even more calm than before. If you are so strong, my son, and your friends are so strong, then you can live or die on your own. I withdraw my protection from you. For a moment we didn't know what that meant. Then things started to shut down. The bank of monitors was first, falling dark all at once with a single bright flash before the power died. Immediately after, the projector curtain faded to black, then unhitched itself from its delicate conduit-loaded rod, and dropped to the ground in a glittery puff. Before us spread the outside world, bathed in a dangerous dawn. The fabric of the tunnel suddenly began to snap and repeal, collapsing on themselves and returning to their original super-thin, folded form. Light from holes in the rock above began to punch through the darkened anthill, as if giants were shining flashlights in at us from dozens of portals. The full dynamic of the stealth technology hiding us revealed itself as it died. The fabric walls of the main chamber now fell around us, collapsing into thin rolls, leaving us standing in a bright rocky hole, open to the world outside. We blinked in freakish morning light. With no place left to hide, we were being forced out. Matt Cormick seized his pulse rifle, but the expression on his face was near panic. Knowing that two marines with rifles could never protect all of us from the multiple terrors out there, he handed me Baru's pulse rifle, then handed Clark and Pocket each a pistol. We've got to run, Matt Cormick ordered. Stay quiet and keep your heads down. I'll take the lead. Carmichael, take up a position in the middle and watch our flanks. I pushed Clark and Pocket toward the wide-open flume, looked to make sure Bonnie was behind me, and caressed the pulse rifle. All right, mother, we're leaving, I announced. Hell of a way to win. I hope I never see you again, she said over the sound system, which now had a hollow quality in the open air. Yeah, I muttered, but I think you're the one who's weak. I raised my voice, just in case any of the others could still hear me. They deserve to know. Did you tell these people the truth before you brought them here? There was a pause. Not the good kind. I thought she might speak, but she didn't. By now, Clark and Bonnie, Pocket, Matt Cormick, and Carmichael were all waiting for her to speak. Instead, I was the one who spoke. 
Were you strong enough to be honest? I demanded. Did you tell them they were coming here to die glorious deaths in your holy service? Did you tell them you brought them here to be martyrs? That you never intended for them to leave this outpost alive? Did you tell them what their lives mean to you? I pushed a fresh cartridge into the pulse rifle and slapped it into place. I know I forced your hand, I finished. Now you be sure to tell those people that you're taking sides with the aliens. With that, standing out in virtually the open, I signaled to Mac Cormick. No reason to stay, Colonel. Single file, he ordered, and jogged toward the flume. The rest of us went out behind him, never to return to this man-made haven which had fallen away under us. We broke out into the open and ran, but not too fast, not so fast that we became clumsy, that somebody fell or got hurt. Mac Cormick paced us from the front of the line. Even though it was trying to be morning, much of the land was still skirted in darkness. We could barely see the path in front of us to keep good footing. As I ran, I thought about the Blue Valley, probably the only remaining pristine area on this continent. Who knew how far flung the infestation was? Was it worldwide? Was the damage already done and could it ever be reversed? Was this planet doomed, extermination efforts or not? That was for smarter people to decide. I had one thing on my mind, and that was launching off this cursed red mirror. The huts. There they were, we were almost to the abandoned camp. Matt Cormick slowed us down before entering the camp, leading with his pulse rifle like an urban special forces leader. I recognized the stance and took it myself not knowing what we were looking for, afraid of what we'd find. Looks clear, the colonel called. Carmichael? Clear right, sir, the boy called from a few paces behind and to the right of me. Suddenly the sound of ripping paper escorted a flap of wings from over the top of a hut, just that fast, a skitter of knuckles, the whip of a tail, and Colonel Mac Cormick was struck in the face. Oh, God! Bonnie shrieked and ducked back. Mac Cormick went down hard, clawing at the thing on his face. The parasite's tail lashed around his throat and tied itself tight. I turned the muzzle of my rifle on Mac Cormick's head, but that wouldn't work. I threw my rifle to Clark and tore into the animal on Mac Cormick's face with my bare hands. The strength of the eight elongated fingers was unbelievable. I couldn't budge so much as one claw. No! I cried wildly, and dug my fingernails into its pulpy flesh. Its wings began to shrink, returning to that rounded state in which they were a set of clamps on the victim's cheeks. I dug my nails into one of the wings, popped through the membrane, and ripped the wing off. I felt the sting of acid burns on my hands, but rage drove me to ignore it. I swore at the creature something unintelligible, and went after the other wing. Matt Cormick struggled briefly, then went limp. His hands released the creature on his face and he fell into my arms with the malignancy locked onto his head, settling down to its wicked, pitiless work. I let him fall to the ground and rearranged myself on my knees beside him and pulled his service knife from his belt. Damn it, I'd sliced the noxious thing off layer by layer. There was a loud boom next to my ear. My hands and the knife turned red, wet, and hot. Matt Cormick lay at my knees, now a body without a head, missing its left shoulder too. The remains of his head and the face hugger were soaking into the skulch a foot away from me. I looked up. Private Carmichael gazed down in that awful moment after. His face was a plate of misery and resolution. I knew he had followed orders, but his expression betrayed more. He shook himself and turned his weapon on the tops of the huts, in case any more huggers were flitting around on the wing. Clark pulled me to my feet. Come on, Rory. He kept the pulse rifle, but handed me the plasma pistol he'd been carrying. Shaken, startled, numb, and hardly knowing he was talking to me, I let him pull me along. Poor Matt Cormick, all he'd wanted to do was just the best thing at every step. 
Keep moving. Pocket called from the far end of the camp. He was almost through. It's clear. Don't lag. That was when something jumped out at him. Emotionally exhausted, I just paused and watched, ready for anything. Okay, anything but this. Rusty. I yanked free of Clark's grip and rushed toward Pocket, who was helping to his feet the last person I expected ever to see again on this planet. Rusty was a bruised and cut up mess, his hair all natty and his blue suit in rags, but he was here, alive. Nodding my fists into his collar, I dragged him all the way to his feet. You're alive. I'm alive. I lived. How? He pounded my shoulder in victory and said, Survive the fall somehow. I woke up on the floor of the ravine next to that Zeno you killed. I've been climbing for hours. I was so scared you'd leave without me. Can I still go with you? Can you? Can you? I threw my arms around him and hooped with joy. Finally, something to go right. I don't want to stay here with Jocasta anymore, he babbled, looking at me and Clark with pleading eyes. She doesn't care about us. She only cares about those things. I'm so sorry I didn't fess up right when you first landed. Those people in the huts he pointed at the makeshift tombs around us. She set them up. They were the ones who didn't like it here, who wanted to call Earth and have a ship sent for us. One by one, she arranged for them to get caught by the huggers or for their stealth tech to break down. I was the only one who knew about it, because I pretended to agree with her. Jesus, it feels good to spill the beans. He huffed out a breath and looked around. Where is everybody? All my friends, are they all going with you? Are they already at the ship? How could I tell him he was the only one who would be freed of this planet? No, we're right here, a voice said from nowhere. It was my sister's voice. Between two of the huts the fabric of the air began to ripple. Forms appeared, then solidified, two by two, into the missing researchers. They were hiding right here all along, in a clutch of personal blinds probably among the first developed before they moved into the big blind. My sister walked toward me, her face red and plastered with tears. Behind her, Tad came up close. It was Jocasta all along, Tad said. I've been trying to get Gracie to leave here for months. Gracie's been protecting me from your mother. She knew Jocasta would kill anybody who betrayed her. I reached out to shake his hand. You're not betraying her by wanting your own life. My sister blinked at me, holding back sobs, but I could tell that for the first time in years, she was with me. And I was with her. I touched her face and gave her a little smile. Right here in the middle of hell. Come on, I said. Let's go home. Private Carmichael, Ken, Esquire took charge in a manner that would have made Matt Cormick proud. He led the way as the gaggle of us fell in behind him. In tight formation we struck out through the glass forest that separated us from the landing area. Finally seemed like years we saw the ship. The Vinza was as we had left it, but now the magnetic field propulsion units were on, whirring and hot from the plasma being directed through its reaction chambers. Theo had fired the ship up, anticipating that we were coming. Good! As we approached, the loading ramp began to lower in true mechanical fashion. Clark dashed aboard first, brewing with purpose, and was instantly yelling orders inside. Couplers on Max. Prepare for launch and deploy. Theo. Barry. Where's Gaylord? He kept shouting, but I didn't care. I stepped aside and Carmichael went to the other side of the ramp, and together we funneled the remaining researchers into the ship, every one of them more than glad to pile in. Rusty put his foot on the ramp and turned to me, clasping my hand again. I don't know what to say. You came just in time. I grinned at him and clapped my hand to his arm in gratification. That's my job. To come in the nick of time. 
I heard this horrible noise, like a factory whistle that just went on and on and I kept running. I thought it might be your ship trying to take off without me, so I ran right through a whole swarm of Xenos. They just looked at me and left me alone. I figured it was a miracle. Yeah, I agreed. You say you ran through them after you heard the noise? I really ran as fast as I could. My legs hurt. My chest hurts. I can't believe I made it. If I'd ever been sick to my stomach in my life, this was the worst. No matter how I added it up. Rusty. Yeah? I drew my pistol upward and aimed it at his chest. I'm sorry. I'm so sorry. I don't think I can let you get on the ship. Huh. He reacted, then laughed. Oh funny. That's when the convulsion started. Rusty coughed, gagged, and pressed a hand to his chest. Oh, no I choked. Goddamn squalid bastards. Horror erupted in Rusty's eyes. He grabbed my shirt and dropped to his knees, shuddering and heaving, then pitched over backward onto the ramp. A mound appeared under his blue suit as if a bony fist were trying to punch through from inside. Rusty pulled me down with him and snatched at the pistol. His eyes beseeched the worst favor of me. As my own lips peeled back with disgust and empathy, I drew the pistol around, pushed it against the bulge in his chest, and did the only thing I could do to ease his horrific plight. Unshrinking, I pulled the trigger. Rusty died at my feet, along with his tormentor, still holding my arm. Sir, I'm so sorry. Carmichael uttered. With Rusty's blood soaking into my trouser legs, I gently rolled the body off the ramp, wishing there was time to bury him decently in this indecent place. Get aboard, I said. I looked around to make sure there was no one else still waiting to board. More than ready to leave, I put my foot on the ramp and took hold of the scissor strakes which would pull it up after I came aboard. Rory. My shoulders hunched at the sound of that voice. I turned and looked. At the base of two large red pillars, with the morning light kissing from behind and causing a faint aurora, stood my mother, holding Bonnie by the arm. Against Bonnie's throat my mother held a disembodied alien tail spike, sharp and strong enough to take Bonnie's head off with a thrust. Ma'am waited until she was sure I saw clearly what was going on. She held Bonnie by the arm with her bony white hand, and Bonnie stiffly complied, with the spike pressing against her jugular so firmly that I could see the grazed red welt rising. She belongs to me now, ma'am said. I need her now, more than you do. As long as I have her, you will not release your poison robots. She'll be safe here, Rory. I will take care of her. Launch your ship and go. Leave me and my new daughter here. They were almost beautiful there, bathed in pink light, backdropped by drapings of gray gauze. As if to punctuate the sonnet, I saw Bonnie's pet bat hanging in the gauze behind them, confused and not knowing what to do. The little earthling had followed us. And so had others. In the depths of the glass forward, I saw the haunting movements of aliens moving closer. They shifted in their craven fluid way, coming in our direction, looking like dragons moving through a medieval passion play. I stepped off the ramp and moved a few steps out into the open. I didn't dare try to shoot. Even with the pistol's fair accuracy, the refracted morning light through the pillars created a prism effect and ruined my aim. I could easily hit Bonnie. And as hard as my heart felt right now, I wasn't sure I could actually shoot my own mother. I didn't trust myself. Instead, I put the pistol down on the black gulch. When I straightened up again, I raised my arm, holding my elbow straight. Carefully, I lowered my chin once, then raised it, and lowered my arm. Once again, I raised my arm, but just slightly this time, with my fist knotted. Bonnie balled her left fist, the one my mother couldn't see. Slowly, she began to raise her arm, straight out at her side. In the background, 
Butterball the bat unfolded her raincoat-like wings, flexed one, then the other. The wide-strutted membranes took on a gothic grace. She dropped her grip on the gauze and was instantly flying in that neurotic nutcase batty way, right toward the two women. Bonnie, down. I blared. She dropped like a sack of sand. The bat veered toward the now empty spot where Bonnie's arm had been, but there was no place to land except my mother's head. The bat's enormous wings closed around Mamma's hair and folded tight around her face. She screamed inside the leather hood and beat her face with her little hands. Bonnie scrambled to her feet and ran to me. Get aboard. My voice was strangely calm as I shoved her up the ramp. Behind my mother, the ghouls drew closer. Rory. Bonnie called from the top of the ramp. Coming, I said. I stretched my arm out straight to my side and raised it high, with my fist in a ball. As my mother squealed in her panic, Buttercup disengaged her big wide wings and managed to launch from my mother's head. My mother was on her knees now, shocked and off balance. Whirling once in the air, Buttercup landed on my forearm and took an experienced purchase there. She let her giant wings go limp and hang almost to the ground, adjusted her grip on my wrist, then politely folded her wings around herself like a girl at a prom adjusting her wrap. My mother and I met gazes for a last few seconds, and for the first time in our lives I think we understood each other. She drew herself to her feet and regained her poise, just as the aliens came around the pillars to surround her. The interior of the ship was warm and buzzing with energy. Bonnie and Clark met me in the bay as the ramp whirred and clanked closed behind me. I stroked the bat hanging from my arm and took the piece of fruit Bonnie offered, and fed it to the little doggy face. Buttercup happily took the fruit in her batty hands and began to eat. With my other arm, I pulled Bonnie against me and gave her the kiss I'd been saving up for the right moment. How would you like to be a really wealthy woman? Rory, it's your call, Clark said as he had always promised. Do we deploy it or not? I looked at the cargo bay, where Pocket and Gaylord, Theo, and the deckhands stood poised beside the belly cranes and huge roller hatches that would drop the containers full of poison packers onto the planet as we safely rose into the sky, never to look back. Deploy, I told him. Nothing down there but monsters. This concludes Aliens' DNA War.